Good afternoon. It is 1.30 on Tuesday, Tuesday, May 9th, 2023, and I, we are resuming our budget workshop that was adjourned temporarily yesterday around 5.30. Uh, Rhonda, would you take a roll call, please, to establish the presence of a quorum? I will. Supervisor Arenas? Here. Supervisor Chavez? Here. Supervisor Samidian? Supervisor, uh, Vice President Lee? Present. President Ellenberg? I am here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Supervisor Samidian, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance today? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item 12 is public comment. That's the portion of the agenda set aside for members of the public wishing to address the Board of Supervisors on items not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. As has become the practice, we will begin with speakers in the chamber and then move to speakers on Zoom. For the speakers that are on Zoom, please raise your virtual hands as quickly as possible. We will close the Zoom queue when the first person begins speaking. So if you do intend to speak, now is the time to please raise your hand. And Rhonda, do we have speakers in chambers? Yes, I currently have six speaker cards from speakers in chambers. And any speakers on Zoom? Currently, I have nine. Six. My math says 15. <laughs> so we're, we're going to do uh, two minutes. Let me. It's usually, it we can, usually do one minute at yes. 15. Thank you. Let's do that. All right. Um, our in person speakers, if you want to go ahead and line up, are going to be Sarah Tapia Silva, Aiden Raj, Andrew Pham, Pa Shing, Paul Williams. Robert Brazula. You can go ahead and step forward. Thank you. Um, so hello, supervisors and everybody present. Uh, my name is Sarah Tapia, and I am a Oh, is this better? Okay. Oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> so hello, uh, my name is Sarah. I am a student from San Jose State University and I'm part of the organization Students Against Mass Incarceration. So I would like to thank you for giving us the time to speak today. Um, I am just coming to reiterate the community's opposition to the building of a new jail, especially with given, event, given events that have happened recently um, in Santa Clara County. There is a lot of distrust with uh, the way that um, things are being handled regarding incarceration. Uh, Sammy held an event last Thursday at City Hall to express his opposition and as well as to highlight the need for a new unlocked mental health facility. Um, as the Board of Supervisors mentioned over a year ago, we are facing a mental health epidemic in Santa Clara County. So investing in a new unlocked mental health facility would much, be much more beneficial to the community than another jail. Um, so, and we would also like to thank Supervisor Ellenberg. We did see your uh, comment uh, and your response promptly after our event. So we look forward to working with uh, Supervisor Ellenberg and hopefully the rest of the Board of Supervisors on this issue. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Aiden Rao. I am also part of the Students Against Mass Incarceration. Uh, I would like to, first of all, thank Supervisor Ellenberg again for her response. We appreciate being included in the conversation. I would like to restate the, and emphasize that incarceration is an ineffective and brutal means of reducing crime and that any solution that we create going forward needs to put care first, address people's mental and physical needs, and create safe spaces. We would also like to emphasize that in the event that a mental health facility is constructed, it needs to be unlocked. 
because a, it, it is, that was just a means of stripping the autonomy of our most vulnerable members of our community. Thank you. Thank you, go ahead, come forward, Andrew. Hi, my name is Andrew Pham. I'm a respiratory care practitioner, good afternoon. I'm also a uh, relief supervisor at Valley Medical Center. The county's recommended budget recommends that our hospitals delete 255 positions. Currently, our healthcare professionals are overworked, undervalued, and overwhelmed to the extent that we cannot recruit or retain skilled healthcare workers. Deleting these positions will only add to deficiencies our patients are experiencing in the level of care they would otherwise be getting if we were able to recruit and retain qualified healthcare professionals. Pediatric patients are experiencing healthcare emergencies, are waiting long periods to receive treatment. It is important to know that these hospitals are taking care of these vulnerable people in our community. Deleting these positions can't possibly achieve timely access to public health care. Supervisors, I implore you, preserve these codes so that our community and our children have a chance to live a healthy life. By not doing so, we risk providing timely, accessible health care to our community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pa Cheng. Hello, my name is Pa Chang, and I'm a supervisor at the Department of Family and Children's Services, and I am an SEIU member. I am here today because I am concerned about the county administration's overall budget proposal, which will be a disservice to our community. The county is proposing a deletion of 137 social work positions at SSA, over 250 positions at health and hospitals, 64 positions at behavioral health, and six communications dispatch positions at county comms. These positions are critical. We are often faced with immediate crisis, having to tackle complex and comprehensive issues such as mental health, child safety, substance abuse addiction, human trafficking, and generational and family trauma. Why delete these positions that directly work with our communities? How is this physically responsible? Every deletion of a position is a step back for us, and it's a missed opportunity for us to do better and to know better. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Paul Williams. I'm a public health nurse too with the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. I work at the, at the permanent supportive housing sites. I'm the only PHN in the county working with these clients. And I work at, right now I'm in seven buildings that have over 700 residents. So public health nurses, are, they're charged with ensuring equity and promoting um, just trying to break down disparities and to break these cycles of intergenerational poverty and complex trauma. And this comes at no cost to the county because the work we do pays for itself with existing funding streams and through upstream uh, savings from lower ER costs, lower burden on the judicial system, um, earlier detection and prevention, and it equips children with what they need to succeed as adults because we, we represent all of the underserved people in the community. So cutting these five codes that, you're, that are being proposed, it's gonna overburden the remaining PHNs who are already burned out due to the current staffing crisis. It's gonna undermine our collective goal of ensuring equity for all, and it will leave us unprepared for our next pandemic. So please don't do this just to make your numbers look good for now because it's gonna hurt residents, and it would be an initial step in the wrong direction. Thank you. Go ahead, Robert. Um, good afternoon, my name is, is, does this thing work? Yeah, Hi. there's also a speaker built into the, right there. Um, good afternoon, my name is Robert Brazil, and I'm one of the social workers with in-home supportive services. Um, I was asked to come here by some peers and coworkers and some members in the community. We continue to have a staffing crisis in all departments, as you're aware. The bigger concern I have is the abrupt and ongoing pattern. Every time we have budget negotiations and contracts, Mr. Smith and his advisors have no problem chopping. My question is, how many of you here have the supplies that you need, the computers, the supplies? Why don't we start here? Let's start chopping here. You need those tools to carry out your job, to serve your community. So I really implore the board to scrutinize Mr. Smith and the other leadership, empower your managers, empower your supervisors so they can make informed decisions and not last minute, hasteful um, behaviors like Mr. Smith. So please take care of business so we can take care of our community. Thank you. That concludes our in-person speakers. Thank you. And what is our queue right now? In right now we have 11 in queue. 
Okay, just give a, another second. If anyone else is on Zoom that wishes to speak during public comment, now is the time to raise your hand. We'll close the queue uh, currently at 11 when the first person begins speaking. All right, our first speaker is Paul Soto. Paul, I've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. Uh, thank you, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I would like to talk about, I really hope I don't see a repeat of the circumvention of the public comment process because what the president of this uh, supervisory board has been doing is lumping issues together so that public comment is not given on every single item. And every single item has in itself its own specific issue to deal with. It was done with racial equity when that had come up, and then it was done with respect to the jails last week. Stop doing that. I see what you're doing. Other people see what you're doing. And what you're doing is you're suppressing the democratic process. I have an absolute right to comment on every single one of those things that happened in that jail. And what you did is you stifled that. You want to silence that voice, just like you paid out that $10 million for Andrew Hogan in that $7 million to uh, Juan Nunez to shut them up. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maureen. Maureen, we've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. You should be able to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Ah, we can hear you now. Hi, good afternoon, board. My name is Marianne Waddell, and I'm a social work supervisor at the Department of Family and Children's Services, and a member of SEIU and a resident of Santa Clara County. Your staffing in healthcare, mental health, and social services hurts the most vulnerable, including children, seniors, immigrants, people of color, and others dependent on vital county services. County administration is proposing a delete of 137 positions in social services alone and reducing telework, which has shown to maintain high productivity, help with retention, lower the carbon emissions, which slows climate change, and lowers the county building and maintenance costs, which can be spent on more services and staff for our community. Please prioritize investing in services and addressing the staff's crisis. Santa Clara County can prioritize the safety of our children, seniors, combat mental health crisis, and keep. Thank you. Our next speaker is Foti Bui. Thank you, supervisors. My name is Fo Bui. I am a psychiatric social worker with the Behavioral Health Department and Chief Steward for SEIU 521. The county continues to understaff its workforce, which in turn impacts our most vulnerable populations, including immigrants, people of color, children, and the elderly. The current vacancy rate in behavioral health is 62%. And our department is proposing to delete 62 positions, of which 53 positions are frontline workers, while the department is adding over 20 management positions. I urge the board to request the county to partner with SEIU 521 to address the staffing crisis and invest in recruitment, training, and career opportunities in an effort to deliver timely and quality behavioral health services to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Delilah Polito. Delilah, we've asked you to unmute. I would like to know how is it that the unvaccinated workers are now equal in that if we work in a hospital setting or jail, we can wear the same mask as the vaccinated. If we work anywhere else, we don't have to wear a mask like the vaccinated, but we are still unequal and being discriminated against in that we have to work under a reasonable accommodation. You based your vaccine mandate on the FDA emergency authorization. It's written on your policy and your mandate. 
but the emergency ended and the FDA pulled the original vaccines that are that you are still mandating. The board and the unions are silent about this, which speaks volumes. How can you in good conscience support this? How can you allow a vaccine to be mandated that is void, that, that the FDA no longer authorizes for use in the United States? Your, your silence speaks volumes. You address other con, um, constituents concerns for um, but choose to ignore us. Please stop discriminating against us. Stop violating our rights. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is the speaker ending in 448. We've asked you to unmute. Hi, my name is David Hanley. I'm a uh, eligibility worker with uh, social services and I service cases dealing with Medi-Cal and CalFresh benefits, so food and medical services. We've been severely impacted with staffing shortages and unfortunately the proposed budget is going to eliminate long vacant codes that should have been filled um, and somehow justifying the inclusion of a few new management codes. Uh, they accomplished this by putting cases into case banks where they, they don't get assigned workers and they don't get the proper routine maintenance that's necessary to maintain compliance and proper and accurate benefits. So um, please, please consider giving adequate um, appropriations to social services so that we can give our clients the most. Thank you. Our next, next speaker is Catherine Hedges from Surge. We've asked you to unmute. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I'm not actually speaking on behalf of Surge at this moment. Um, I am a recipient of CalFresh and um, Medi-Cal, and I'm very concerned that with the new wave of uh, certification papers that everybody has to do now that the pandemic emergency is over, you're not going to have the staff capacity to process all that paperwork or to help people fill it out. I received my paperwork, and it's different than was before, and I don't understand it but I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get help for a caseworker in filling it out because I have, I'm have i self-employed. It's a lot more complicated than if I just had my IHS, sorry, my SSDI. Um, I need the, you know, we all need the county to support people who have these benefits. Um, they're a lifeline for so many people, but if they lose their benefits because we don't have enough social worker Thank you. Our next speaker is Melissa Herrera. Good evening. My name is Melissa Herrera. I'm a social worker, too, for the emergency response uh, unit with the Department of Family and Children's Services. I'm also an SCIU member. I'm here to let everyone know that understaffing hurts our most vulnerable populations, including immigrants, people of color, and most importantly, children, family, and youth. Emergency response social workers are frontline workers who respond to immediate calls of suspected child abuse and neglect. There are currently 20 vacancies in emergency response. These vacancies not only hurt families, but workers. In addition, we are in a staffing crisis and not being fully staffed is leading to workers not being able to meet timelines, fulfill requirements, and meet families in a timely manner. We are bombarded with heavy caseloads that cause burnout, uh, compassion fatigue, and secondary trauma. If we are ER workers are not at our best, how can, our, uh, how can we effectively uh, engage with workers? What are our uh, solutions? Collaborating with workers and communities to address the staffing crisis that hurt our most vulnerable population. This will retain workers. Um. Thank you. Our next speaker is Austin Wooten. Austin, we've asked you to unmute. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, I work with Andrew Pham in the respiratory care uh, department at Valley Med. Um, and I just wanted to kind of extrapolate on what he said in that we had multiple coworkers work over 500 hours of overtime last year. We currently have several employees over 300 hours of overtime during this fiscal year. So I'm really not sure that cutting positions at the hospital is exactly going to save anyone any money because the, the work needs to get done. 
So well, I'm just going to keep it short and sweet. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Teresa Linderman Libera. Teresa, we've asked you to unmute. Good afternoon. My name is Teresa Linderman Libera, and I currently work at Valley Homeless Health Care Program, and I'm a member of SEIU 521. I'm asking the board to, excuse me, to please take into consideration and prioritize the investments and services for um, all of our staff and not be deleting the positions of over 250 health and hospital employees. Currently, your current wait time for unhoused people to receive a shelter bed is six to eight weeks on a Monday through Friday, eight to five basis, and must require a telephone in order to get that bed. Um, the services being provided to our current population uh, most vulnerable population is in desperate need of more case management, more case workers, psychology. Um, cutting these services would be a great disservice not only to the community, but to all of our families and to the most vulnerable members. Um, I'm asking the board to please take into consideration um, all of our services that we provide here and not let the, the counties cut the staff. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sally Thatch. Sally, we've asked you to unmute. Hello, my name is Sally Thatch. I'm a public health nurse too in the Child Health and Disability Prevention Program. I am here to request wage parity for our public health nurses to that of our county's clinical nurses. Why is it that Santa Clara County is the only county in the Bay Area that pays their public health nurses less than their clinical nurses? 20% difference. 36% of you are including longevity. In fact, Contra Costa and San Mateo pays the public health nurses more than their clinical nurses. San Francisco too, if you include longevity. When comparing the 15 most populated counties in California, they all pay their public health nurses and clinical nurses about the same, with a combined average for the non-Bay Area counties about 8% higher for the public health nurses. We are currently in the middle of a classification study initiated by Dr. Jeff Smith back in 2020, and the county current offer for us is nowhere even close to parity. Please take action and give us parity. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janice Miller. Janice, we've asked you to unmute. Uh, Janice has disappeared. Our next speaker is Ah. Ah, we've asked you to unmute. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name's Andrew. I'm a nurse at Valley Medical Center Emergency Department. I'm just calling in today to continue to ask for your support and advocate um, for ending this mass mandate that Jeff Smith has made into an administrative policy. The WHO has uh, called an end to the pandemic, uh, the federal level, the state level, the county level, and it's causing a real low morale here in the emergency department. It's causing a lot of confusion. We have all the pre-hospital fire departments, uh, EMS, police departments coming in unmasked. We're having to, it's, 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 it's quite a mess. So please continue to advocate and let's align with the state and the county and, and this mass mandate and have it be a choice. We're all grateful to take care of this community of people and serve here. And we're asking for your continued support and help. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ben. Ben, we've asked you to unmute. Yes, hello. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Ben, and I believe that all children should be protected from sexual abuse. And our district attorney, Jeff Rosen, is helping to conceal the child molestation of my kids. And I believe that we should, it should be reflected in the budget that Jeff Rosen's salary should be decreased until he decides to fulfill his legal mandate to be district attorney. He's not district attorney just for some kids in Santa Clara County. He's district attorney for every single child in Santa Clara County. And so far, Mr. Rosen is failing at this. And I've addressed this with the Board of Supervisors on multiple occasions. And you guys refuse to even lift a finger and I believe that right now in the budget, you have the ability to make a change if you're not going to do anything else. Thank you very much.
Um, Supervisor, it, I did have Janice back. It looked like she may have. Of course. Oh, she disappeared again, I'm sorry to say. And that concludes our public speakers. All right, thank you, Rhonda, and uh, welcome back, everyone, to day two of the budget workshops for fiscal 2023-2024. Uh, and I thank my colleagues, everyone on the dais, and all of the department heads that answered our questions uh, for good, robust discussion yesterday. As was the case yesterday, as we move through the numbered agenda items, I'll ask my colleagues which departments they'd like to hear at the beginning of each term. We can hear presentations or go right to discussion, uh, depending on your preference, and then take public comment. Uh, for the CFSC section under item 13, uh, my request is item C. And I will look for lights to see if we'd like A and B as well. Not seeing that, let's go to item C, the recommended budget for social services agency. Okay. Greg will take you through this. All right, good afternoon, Greg. Okay, good afternoon, can we get the PowerPoint up? Can't quite hear you. Okay, I'm asking if we can get the PowerPoint up. Well, hang on just one second. So um, did other colleagues want to hear item C or go right to questions? Nods to hear it. I would recommend hearing it. Excellent, yes. let's do that. Okay. Go right ahead, Greg. Okay. I'm hoping we get the PowerPoint up here in a second. Okay, thank you. And before you is the recommended budget for the Department of Child Support Services. The recommended budget is a total appropriation of 32.2 million. And the recommended uh, actions contained are minor adjustments to. Greg, I think they only wanted to hear social services. Oh, social services, I'm sorry. Then we can, we can skip, to, then we can move ahead to that. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And the recommended budget for the Social Services Agency is a total recommendation of $908.7 million. And it includes recommended actions to uh, add resources to increase the benefit division uh, over time for medical renewals and other uh, processing, as well as increasing resources for the Employment Services Division over time for operational needs. Enhance the CalFresh Employment Training Program and enhance the quality improvement efforts in the Prevention Bureau. Next slide, please. It also adds resources for the Family First Prevention Services, the Welcoming uh, Center, uh, support for the Assessment and Stabilization Bureaus, for services for racial equity, for the in-play contract services, the Summer Camp Enrichment Program, and the Reach Your Destiny, Desti Destination Easily program. Next slide, please. It, it also adds resources to maintain the Office of Immigrant Relations Services, the Domestic Violence Services, the Rape Crisis Services, and the Adult Services Pilot Program. And it deletes vacant positions to address the structural deficit. Next slide, please. And at this point, we're available for questions, and I see the department uh, has their uh, leadership here as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I, I first, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, I think that there were some people here that were talking about the um, deletions. And I thought you might just want to take a minute to talk about the board action that we took yesterday relative to deleted positions throughout the budget and the request that you made. Um, in terms of what comes back to the board. And I, I only mention that because some of you are here that have asked about it, and that might be informative. We made the request that administration provide a report to the board that gives us much more detail about the strategy that they're proposing. We want to know, I'm sorry I didn't know you were asking this question, Supervisor Chavez, so I don't have the motion in front of me. 
but we want to know uh, the classifications of the positions. We want to know impact on service, how long they have been uh, unfilled. And, and then communicating some, also with the department heads because the, the, these were these were done post the um, discussion. But I, I just wanted to make sure. And it, by the way, the, the motion had 42 parts to it. So Susan did a good job of keeping it high level. But the, I just want you to know that that we recognized that yesterday as a work product before the budget comes back to us in June. Thank you thank very you. much. Uh, and then for that, but go ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, on this. On this uh, item, so first of all, I wanted to say how much I appreciate that you attach the packet pages to the um, to the presentation. Um, I, I did have one question, and I apologize if if uh, if I'm getting my letters mixed up in advance, uh, President. But um, the increase that's necessary for the the welcoming center, could you just take a minute to highlight the 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 what is needed there? Hi, good afternoon, Supervisor Daniel Little, the Social Service Agency Director. Um, on the welcoming center items, there were several positions added um, to help with the scope to bring the uh, current operations back underneath the umbrella of the county. So there were specific positions needed to do for licensing. So there was some management positions and there was some clerical positions required for the reporting to the state with the ultimate uh, purpose to keep the on-site services provided by the contractor, but the actual oversight to the management of the welcoming center would be under the county's operations. And is that um, that new arrangement, and maybe just the, that new arrangement, just so I can say this out loud, is that um, we're not bringing it in-house again. We're bringing more oversight to it? Correct, Supervisor. We would have oversight and control of the actual license of the facility and the and the license of the program. So we would be the direct the direct conduit with the state um, to to provide updates, to provide licensing updates. But the actual care of the children would still be provided by uh, by the current provider. And when was that um, that new strategy decided upon? Uh, Supervisor, I have to go double check. It was presented to you through a couple uh, items to CSFC, I believe. So I'd have to go double check and I can Would report Would you back. mind, and it, given that the paperwork did come to us already, just resending that to the entire board? Correct. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and colleagues, one of the reasons I'm raising that is that we had been working with our um, our social workers to bring the program back under the entire program back under the county. And um, and I would want to better understand one other piece, which is if it's not in the documents, would be helpful to know, which is the extension of the contract length, um, because I would understand that still to be a contracted service. Correct, Supervisor. We can make sure that information is included in the report. Thank back. you. Um, and then one other uh, thing I, I wanted to make sure I understood as it relates to the the staffing issues relative to. Um, cow saws, could you explain that a little bit? Um, because what I, I, I didn't really understand the difference between that. I mean, I, I'm, I apologize. I'm looking at the um, I'm looking at the actual budget on page 380 about the the cow saws implementation. What it's saying is that we need overtime relative to cow saws. And what I'm, I'm just trying to understand is that we anticipate this to be a bump and not a long-term uh, impact. Is that accurate? So the request um, on the table here is for overtime for Kelsall's conversion cleanup. So um, with the implementation, there was cases that were converted from Calwin to Kelsall's. So with that, there um, essentially is things that discrepancies in how the data was converted. So the um, overtime request there is anticipating that, well, not anticipating, we do need to clean up cases to ensure that we can, um, the benefits will go out um, accurately. So over the course of the year, how that happens is as cases are renewed, um, we clean up the case at the renewal point, or if the client has a change in circumstance and has to um, report that change, at that time we would clean up the case. Is this connected to the presentation that you did a couple of days ago for the board? Um, yes, so the cleanest way to clean up the case is when they do the renewal. That's when we touch most cases. But if a client did, say, um, added a baby, 
um, change their address, then that's when we would, if we touch them before the renewal, that's when we do the cleanup. Understand. I, I think um, what I was just trying to make sure I understood is that the, the, the duration of this we anticipate where there would be a significant bump is over what period of time? Um, over the course of the year. So the idea. So it's time a 12-month peak. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Supervisor Arenas, then Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. I was. I'm asking about um, DFCS's current staffing levels, and I know that we. Um, just repeated what we did yesterday in terms of asking for additional information from the deleted position. So uh, not all that information is available, but if you uh, would have this offhand, do you know how many deleted positions will be in uh, DFCS? Supervisor, I don't have it in front of me, the, the position by department. That's something we could provide back. Thank you. Um, one of the areas that I was looking at um, that concerns me is the differential response services. Um, and on um, the stats that are uh, were presented to the Child Abuse Prevention Counselor, uh, Council earlier this year, there was um, about 163 referrals that were uh, 63 referrals that were referred to differential response services, and out of those, there was um, 29 that completed a case plan, and 44 were still open for services. And so, I'm wondering, w what is the target in terms of? And I know this is very specific to families and their circumstances, and what is at the center of of, um, of a case plan. But on average, um, how are we encouraging families to complete those case plans? What do we, how do we define success for those families? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. And actually, before I answer that, somebody did provide, we had 44 positions out of that uh, 137 that were DFCS specific. Regarding the differential response, um, the, the first caveat is being a voluntary, um, you know, it is around engagement. Um, so we do want to make sure that as many of the families that we engage with differential response can go through, can engage with the provider, um, and ultimately complete that, that case plan, which is going to be typically around kind of supportive services. Um, it could be tangible hard goods. Um, our differential response program has been growing over the years, and it's something we're doing a program evaluation on, um, really to get to that point of your question, Supervisor, which is what strategies are working currently for engagement? Where do we see gaps? Um, and how can we work with those service providers to ensure that we have more robust engagement, that we see um, that engagement rate continue to in increase um, for all of our providers, for all of our families? And when, when is that program evaluation uh, going to be completed? I'd, I'd have to go back and check with the, uh, the research folks, but I think it's been ongoing. It's been ongoing? Yeah. Is that what you said? I would love to have an off-agenda report um, to summarize what you've learned about uh, deferential response and how um, our families um, are getting connected to our CBOs because that's mainly who they're connecting to, right? And when it's outside of our system, uh, sometimes we don't have control over what their staffing looks like or their referral process or their assignment. All of the things that we don't have control over, but we expect folks, um, contractors and our CBO partners to, uh, to abide by. Um, I would be interested in having that reflected in, in an off-agenda report. Uh, so we can learn more about how to how to better support um, our CBOs. I'm sure that that's probably within your evaluation um, efforts that are taking place currently. So it, I think it would probably fall in line. Is that something that you're able to provide? Absolutely. And, and to clarify too, the the current contracts for the differential response providers have specific language in around um, requirements for staff, requirements for the types of um, assessments and evaluations they're doing, and we can make sure to include that in the off agenda. Um, and those numbers get reviewed at the end of a fiscal year? I'm sorry? What do uh, those outcomes, 
um, those deliverables, how often do they get reviewed? It's, it's continual. We have a number of different run response coordinators within uh, DFCS who have monthly meetings with all of the uh, providers together to review kind of where they're at with their outcomes. So that is something that they review on a monthly basis. One of the concerns that I have around um, around this is, is, is not because I don't trust our, our, our partners. It's just that our partners have been having a really difficult time you know, standing on, uh, standing up their own programs and, and retaining their own staff. And uh, of course, you know all, all of these issues. Um, and so when we rely on folks whose systems may not be as um, uh, developed or sophisticated as ours, there may be things that can go wrong, right? Um, and so I would be interested in learning what is it that our, how can we better support our CBOs that can do their jobs and, um, and what's that feedback loop from CBOs to our system so that we in, in, in real time can catch um, and learn lessons and, and shift? Um, because I think that's important uh, for us to do for, for our families and for mainly for our children. So I'm, I don't know if there's a motion on the floor. No, so I will make that, uh, I will, um, my motion will be to, uh, um, is it to approve? No, receive a report. And also uh, for an off agenda report on uh, the items that I just uh, discussed uh, around differential response. Let's pause and get a second for you. Thank you, go ahead. Thank you. Um, the other question that I have is around our um, Gilroy Family Resource Center. Uh, I know that that um, a lot of folks miss it, and so I'm hoping that we can um, continue to engage some of our partners and um, in this second go around make it a lot more productive. Um, I see that you're adding um, one FTE program manager for, um, that will support the four voluntary family maintenance units in San Jose, including uh, Gilroy, which I'm really grateful for. Um, thank you for, for doing that. Just one thing that I'd, I'd like to um, recommend is for um, some of those communities, um, there's a lot of hope that the county resources will um, support them in a way that will be fruitful and that will allow their families and their children to thrive. And so I'm hoping that you can engage those community leaders and members that have seen um, how this resource center um, kind of dissipated midway um, so that we can continue to grow hope within that community and, and of course bring in our partners, which offer a lot of, and our community members and leaders that offer a lot of uh, support and resources and validation in our, in our communities, especially there's a, a growing um, network of promotoras in South County that I'm really happy about um, and, and, and proud of um, because I think they've been holding our community together for quite some time. And so um, I'm really glad that you have this program manager and just wanted to mention that. Um, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see other lights. I have a oh, thought you changed your mind. Supervisor Lee, go right ahead. Sure. Just turned off my light earlier for. Um, so, first thing first is uh, I want to double check to make sure I know that we're talking about Social Service Agency. I believe uh, VSO Veteran Services Offices now is full on the SSA. I just want to ask a question regarding the VSO office first before I launch into the other questions. So when reviewing the SSA budget proposals, I do notice that the, <clears throat> the Veteran Services Office, the VSO, uh, had made a request for two alternatively staffed Veterans Service Representatives, or we call them VSRs 1 and 2s, uh, but that was not included in the county executive recommended budget. Um, so I, I just want to hear from you maybe before I have my recommendation on the reason why we do not uh, include those. Yeah, Supervisor, I know that that was one of the, uh, or two of the positions that were in the discussion for the overall uh, vacant, vacancy reduction. 
Um, I wouldn't be able to provide a specific response to those two, but and, and you are correct, the VSO is under social service agency. Okay, good, thank you. So my, my point is, being a 28-year retired Navy veteran myself, you know, with so many veterans in our community that are in need, I certainly want our fellow uh, veterans in our county to be able to get the additional support I know they desperately need. Um, so I would really like to request the administration to reconsider the VSO's request to add the two FTEs for alternatively alternately staffed veteran service representatives. Um, the, this augmentation would certainly help increase their capacity to serve our fellow veterans in our county, and the veterans who receive support from our VSO actually would bring more money to our county through these benefits, including the disability benefits that are authorized after following the very convoluted claim process and those medical evaluations, which often takes many one-on-one -on -one hours in order to get those answers filled out. Not only are these dollars coming in monthly, but also the VSRs and the VSO help get the retroactive money for benefits that should have been received in the past, sometimes in the tens of thousands of dollars for each veteran, money back coming back to our county. So there's certainly a potential for a lot more funds to be brought back to our county because of our VSOs has not yet reached even a small portion of our 64,000 veterans who reside in our county. Um, and, and currently, as we know, each VSR has a caseload of well over 200 veterans, so we really need more VSRs to truly be able to reach our veterans directly. So I would like to add that to a uh, um, friendly amendment to the motion. Consideration of adding back those, Consider, yes, those sure. positions. Is that all right with the maker yes, and I'll the seconder? Thank you. Thank you. Um, second one I have is regarding the um, on SSA. Um, during last Tuesday's board, uh, uh, discussion regarding the Medi-Cal redeterminations, we talked about the 14% uh, of the Medi-Cal population that might be dis disenrolled. Um, we know that once people lose the benefit, obviously it's very difficult for them to come back. And the community clinics are certainly our trusted messengers and partners. In many of these cases, people don't want to work with government agencies and government workers due to various mistrust issues, and they will be a bit more likely to work with CBOs who are much closer to the communities. Um, I was made aware through the Community Health Partnership that they have submitted a proposal to support Medicare redetermination, Medicare expansions, and the PCAPS expansion to 650% of the federal poverty level. So my question is whether the administration is currently working with uh, CHP, Community Health Partnership, on the plan to support this work among our community clinics. I can <coughs> address that. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, we've uh, worked with them, and uh, because we weren't able to um, cost out and figure out the entire plan before uh, the May 1st budget was done, we intend to have it show up on, Jan on June 1st as part of a revised budget. Okay, we'll see this back in June 1st, so that's, that's certainly exciting. Um, I, if we're looking at that, I don't see this, there's no point of doing an off-agenda report about this request, but something that will be addressed back in June 1st, so thank you. Um, on the 137 positions... Apologies, just to be explicit, we're rolling back that requested exactly, amendment. Correct. Thank you. Right, correct, yes. Now, on the uh, 137 positions uh, um, as proposed to be deleted uh, for SSA for an ongoing savings of the $6.3 million, um, could you tell me, Dr. Smith, that any of these positions um, could actually be not deleted or could be saved <coughs> due to the fact that they are going to be you know, revenue generating, actually? Um, we can look at it again, but the basic problem is um, it does save money and actually there remains a large number of positions of the same classification left, which we will give you uh, the numbers on when we report back. So um, it's a matter of timing. We know that we won't be able to fill all those positions in the year. Um, and that means that that money would be tied up doing nothing except preventing us from spending it on other issues. So it was a matter of timing and making sure that we did, did not leave funded unfilled positions uh, that couldn't be filled within the year. 
So the issue really in this case um, is the fact that through recruitment problems or ESA or whatnot, you don't believe that these positions would even be possibly filled in the next year, entire year? Yes. Yeah, that's disconcerting because of the fact that obviously the, the issue is, do we have people applying for these jobs uh, or there's just no um, possible way through our procedure uh, because of the amount of, I don't know, red tapes or whatnot that's that's causing this so but I think I would assume it's the former right there's just not enough people that we know in the pool to apply for these positions is that right. correct right okay so that certainly that's extremely disconcerting um another question I have is talking about the um the nonprofit partners many of those have contracts with SSA um the county has provided a cost of doing business increase on an annual basis previously. Uh, last year, I believe there was a baseline 4% increase to uh, most nonprofits contracting with the county, um, and that was brought to the board separately from the budget process. Um, do you plan on having some type of a cost of living type of an increase to these nonprofit partners in the next fiscal year as well? Um, let me try to explain a little bit. We have well over 300 contracts with CBOs in numerous departments. A lot of them are in social services. There are a lot in health services, behavioral health services, um, probation, and then a spattering of others all over. What we've done is we've asked the uh, departments to work with the CBOs and look at the funding sources because some of those Contracts are exclusively funded through the general fund. Others are matched with other money. Some of them don't affect the general fund at all. So we've asked the departments to work with their contractors to see what it is that they need to continue business as usual or to expand. Some of that will mean increasing a general fund contribution. Some of it will mean increasing the MFO and the contracts will all come back to the board individually with appropriate adjustments. So you do expect there'll be some type of increase, but there will be um, by different departments. It's not okay, across the board. Yeah, department by department and contract by contract. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Supervisor Simidian. Uh I just wanted to indicate, I, I had some of the same question slash concerns that Supervisor Lee referenced in connection with the veterans uh, staffing. Um, I had a somewhat different approach. Uh, Dr. Smith, you may or may not recall, you and I discussed this uh, previously and I'd indicated I would be coming in August with a referral to address this topic. Um, <clears throat> which you were fine with, but that may be because you're gonna be gone by then, I don't know. Uh, um, yeah, and you do uh, after June is fine by me. But um, <laughs> I think what I would say is I'll just, I'll just put it out there. It had been my intention to reach out to Supervisor Lee to ask if he would like to co-author that referral with me. So I think you know, what I would say is sort of whatever happens in this conversation, um, uh, I think the topic is, uh, necessitates um, some additional discussion and hopefully some action as well. And I'm, I'm sort of in the same place Supervisor Lee is. The path by which we get there is um, to be determined, but I, I, I'm in pretty much the same place. Thank you. Thank you. On item 13, we have a motion uh, by Arenas for an off-agenda report, second by Chavez. Do we have public speakers on this item? There we go. We currently have two online public speakers for this item. Do we have any speakers in chambers? None at this time. All right, I'll remind folks on Zoom if you're intending to speak on item 13, uh, that's 13 A, B, or C, now is the time to uh, raise your virtual hand. When the first speaker begins mm -hmm. speaking, we will close the queue for purposes of meeting management. So we'll give you a second or two. 
And we'll do two minutes for each of the still two speakers. Um, it looks like we are up to four speakers. Okay, if it's still going up, we can hold off for a second. We're now up to five. All right, five speakers it is. Our first speaker is Kathleen King. Kathleen, we've asked you to unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. Hi, this is Kathleen King from Healthier Kids Foundation. And I just want to confirm that this group has been reaching out to all of us on our outreach efforts pertaining to redetermination. And even the funding we are getting from the state to work on this. So I'm really pleased about the work of Daniel and Angela on this. And I think they're even taking it to the approach that this is similar to what we needed to do around vaccinations, where we all had to work together to make sure that re-enrollment does happen just like vaccinations did. So I'm very pleased about that. For Supervisor Reynes, for our applicate or our grants with this organization, they are checked monthly, but I also will say they're an excellent partner on discussing what's going right and what's going wrong. So just want to add my compliments today, and I'll give you the minute back. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Paul, we've asked you to unmute. I'll get it to you in a second. Uh, can right, you hear me? Uh, is, uh, Hello. We can hear you. Thank you. I just I, I say that because I need to affirm that you are in fact hearing me. Thank you, um, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I want to remind that there are going to be uh, reductions in uh, CalFresh, and you know we we keep kicking this ball down the you know down the line, and we need to institutionalize the fact that we are going to have the need for food increase as we move along because a lot of the policies that have been passed have been racially motivated and have deprived certain communities of the ability to sustain themselves in this current economy okay i'm not saying anybody is at fault for doing it now you decide that for yourself but this is a fact that the racial inequities that have happened over the generations, and I, I pinpointed as 1939 and the redlining map, is that it's created a lot of deficits in certain communities. And we all know what those communities are. The Rose Garden and the Willow Glen have been, been the beneficiaries of racial inequity. And it's been the Chicano and the Mexicano community that has borne the brunt. So I'm saying that to say this is that you don't have a racial equity definition that is legally binding. You know, and James Williams, being a lawyer, he's going to be the county executive. So what he's going to do is keep trying to protect, using legal language, protect the county from institutionalizing racial equity. He's going to prevent it. Why? Because he knows that it's going to mean that we start receiving the just resources that we rightfully deserve. So you need a legally binding definition of what racial equity is, and then we can all move on. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catalyze SV. We've asked you to unmute. Hello, this is Rocio Molina, Community Engagement Manager with Catalyze SV. Thank you so much, board and staff, for the presentation today. I also want to highlight the um, increase in contract services for racial equity, which was listed as a resource that will ideally be increased um, through the social services agency. We want to commend the agency for identifying that as a need. I'm sure you have all heard throughout the year how various communities need more support in order to access resources through our healthcare services and housing services. And we look forward to seeing how that will be shaped out. Um, we definitely recommend that a component of community engagement helps identify the programs and values that will most, you know, most expand this program and really address the needs of the community in a way that is effective and informed by their experience. 
And we look forward to hearing more about this um, as we move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nicole Stewart. Nicole, we've asked you to unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you. My name is Nicole Stewart, and I'm a School Link Services Coordinator and School Social Worker with Milpitas Unified School District. And I just want to lend my voice in support of this budget. Um, as a School Link Services Coordinator, we use utilize a lot of these services often in crisis situations. Um, so having wait time or having um, not enough staffing certainly hurts the students most. Um, and I also just want to share um, my gratefulness and my gratitude um, to all those who have been doing this work over the last three years, both in public education, public health, and public housing services. Um, it is not lost on us the amazing work that has been done. Um, and I think supporting this budget will m send that message to all these workers who have been overextended um, and doing the work that our families and our communities need. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our final speaker on this item will be the phone number ending in 860. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Tui Chong. I'm a psychiatric social worker and a member of SEIU. I would like to share with the board supervisor the impact of lack of staffing at the behavioral health department. Lack of staffing impact our quality of work and services and affecting patient and community we serve. There has been evidence of increased completed suicide homicide within the county. Increasing CPS involvement, jail, EPS, admission and hospitalization. Overcrowding in jail due to lack of services leading to increased COVID and life outbreaks. New Consumers have to wait for every two to six months to be seen by a provider. And we have more lawsuits from clients and families for poor services. So therefore, I urge the board supervisor to have behavioral health department to work with ESA and the union to improve adding more funding and hire more staff and retain senior staff. Thank you so much. That concludes our speakers. Thank you. Let's take a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move to item 14 for the Health and Hospital Committee. And thank you very much to all the CFC, CFSC committees for join, uh, departments for joining us today. Before we get to individual reports and discussion, I want to take just a, a quick moment to recognize our health system departments, their leaders, and their employees. Yesterday and today, we've recognized the difficult work of staff to develop this budget really every year, and we certainly have excellent employees across all of our departments. But as I've reviewed the budget and the recommended changes, it strikes me just again, what a really challenging period this has been for all our health system departments and how fortunate we are to have skilled, effective, and compassionate leaders in each of the public health, custody health, the hospital system, EMS, and behavioral health departments, um, particularly in the last several years, dealing with challenges ranging from pandemics and hospital mergers to critical workforce shortages and consent decrees, uh, as well as the, the regular demands that you have every day. The departments, these departments have seen the most change over my four years as tenure as a supervisor, particularly in one of the best ways is in how you're all working better and better together to address community and, and board priority issues uh, like substance use disorders and mental illness. So I just wanted to begin with a thank you for dedication and service to our residents. Uh, item 14 have, includes A through something, F. A through F. Um, so I will, I will do the same thing in terms of sections, but I want to just give a, a heads up about what comes afterward because it's a little bit related. We'll hear items 15 through 17 as a special behavioral health session. 
Item 15 includes a presentation on behavioral health system strategies that cut across multiple departments, including the office of the CEO, the, ho health and ho the hospital system, the office of supportive housing, and fleet and facilities, in addition to behavioral health services. If my colleagues have questions or comments about a budget item in the behavioral health services department, that's A through F, please raise those questions um, during item, item 14. If your questions or comments are more broadly about the system or the continuum of care that the county provides regarding behavioral health and substance use disorder services, for example, expansion of treatment capacity, we'll have those discussions under item 15. So with that, I will look to my colleagues to see which items you would like to hear, beginning with Supervisor Lee. Point of personal privilege, Madam Chair. Please. I wonder if you could repeat what you want to hear under item 15, please. Item 15 is the cross-system conversation about our behavioral health as it intersects with other departments and is a much broader, bigger picture than strictly the budget items for each of, each of the departments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. 14A. 14D and 14F, please. A, B, and F. D is in dog. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm sorry. A, A, D, and F. Supervisor Smidian. That covers my requests. All right. Supervisor Chavez. Um, I'm interested in B, B, uh, those, and also B and C. I'm sorry. Yeah, B and C. Okay. Supervisor Arenas. Let's throw in E. <laughs> Okay, we are going to hear all of the departments in the Health and Hospital Committee. Um, and okay. just if I could get quick nods or shakes of the head, would you like uh, reports from each of those departments or would you like to go directly to your questions and discussion? I would like reports. Reports. Yeah. That's and, what we'll And do. I would just add that, um, colleagues, that one of the issues that I had raised um, during a previous board meeting when we ha had the business plan was really having the presentation aligned to the business plan. And I, and I, and and this is really the same way we've always received the budget. And I, I want to raise that because, you know, as we're trying to make important decisions, um, both relative to the budget and strategies, um, it's, it's limiting for us to to see the budget this way. And I, I know that we were pretty far along, but I would have loved if someone had just then said, no, we can't do it now, um, because I, I think it it's just an important, um, it's an important opportunity for us to think very strategically about all of this work. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I think the fact that we are aligned in wanting to hear reports on all of the items and get into discussions on all is a further indication, just in case any was anywhere needed, um, that this really is a priority area for the entire board. So with that, do I turn first to Greg or to Renee? To Greg. All righty. All right, thank you. Uh, President Ellenberg, members of the board, Greg Utria, County Budget Director. And before you is the recommended budget for Valley Health Plan. It is a recommended appropriation of 854.6 million. And the only action recommended at this time is to uh, reduce the general fund transfer for the primary access program based on actual cost trends. There isn't quite a, 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 as, as much general fund a contribution towards the program as we initially thought and otherwise is to maintain current services and, and resources. And that's, that's it for the presentation. Thank you, Greg. And, and as a reminder to my colleagues and to the public, we'll hear each of the lettered um, items, uh, each of the sub items under item 14. I'll turn for questions and conversation after each letter. We will then have public comment at the end of item 14F that will apply to items for all of the all of the sections under item 14 and then we'll come back for a vote on any measures. So are there questions on or comments on item A, 14A which is the Valley Health Plan. Supervisor Lee and then Supervisor Chavez and then Smidian. Thank you. 
Um, so when we are reviewing the VHP budget proposal for the uh, during the April uh, HHC meeting, uh, we noticed that the VHP fiscal year 2024 contained no changes to the revenue expense from the recently completed mid-year budget process. But the total net appropriations will increase by 12.5% from this fiscal year to um, from 760 million, 760 to 855 million dollars. That delta is about a 95 million dollar increase um, from the, the, the fiscal year budget. So we'd like to really understand a little bit better why that huge jump, because from understanding the number of FTEs being increased, it doesn't seem like the increase of FTE would correspond to that type of a jump. So if you could help explain, I appreciate it, Trini. I don't know if we have anyone from Valley Health Plan here. The, the, yes, the, and uh, just to begin, we have uh, Laura Rosas here, the CEO. Uh, but the the most the adjustments is related to the revenue. Uh, as as you probably uh, recall, there's been extension of the public health emergency, which allows for more increased federal participation in some of the revenue streams, uh, particularly related to Medi-Cal. And, and of course, uh, Laura Rosas is here to give you some of those details, as well as obviously the number of lives and uh, other kinds of things. Thank you so much, supervisors. I'm also here with Justin Keller, who is our Assistant Director of Managed Care for Finance. Um, so the question is, the increase to of 95 million, is that my, my understanding? Right, from 760 to 855, right? Uh -huh. Thank you. So uh, a majority of the increase in revenue <clears throat> is being driven by claims expense that we've seen increase year over year, primarily driven around utilization and some cost per unit increase as we've uh, been able to contract new providers that are uh, scarce within the region. Um, I think that you're kind of referring to the discrepancy between the 12.5% increase in expenditure versus the revenue increase. Uh, part of the increase that isn't tied to revenue is about $18 million to fund the Silver Creek construction and also another about um, $6 million related to the implementation of the EPIC uh, core system. Um, I think there was a reference to the FTE increase and in the file that we saw that was presented, it looked like the budget for 2022 wasn't included or the 23 fiscal year budget wasn't included. Um, so the difference between the 23 and fiscal year 24 budgets is an 8 FTE increase or about a $3.3 million increase. Um, so um, if you exclude the Silver Creek and Epic, which are kind of incremental increases, the total increase um, is about 8.9%, which aligns to about the 9.1%, I think, in revenue that we saw. And if I could just add a little bit more, um, so what we've seen nationally as well as in California is an increase in utilization post-pandemic. And so we're, as, as other health plans are, are equally impacted. We're also working very hard to increase the behavioral health capacity. And so that's adding expense as well. Great, thank you very much. And uh, that's the question I have on this. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm on packet page, I'm not packet page, on the, in the budget on page 398, and I'm looking at the Valley Health Plan um, uh, out measures of success. And what I'm wondering is if, if you could talk just a little bit about these measurements, and what I'm really wondering about is how, we're, how we are measuring customer satisfaction with VHP? That's a great question. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. So the customer satisfaction comes from our CAP survey. And that is a survey that we're actually working, we have to do that every year. And we're actually working on uh, trying to broaden the reach on that. There are some issues around language ability, um, and it's the way that survey is developed and required, it's regulatory, and so it doesn't allow us to do the kind of outreach we would want to across our many diverse languages, but we're working on that. The CAP survey really does capture how um, members feel that they're 
able to access services and reach the providers that they want to. So I, what my, um, I, I have a concern actually about the the opportunities that that we may be missing, and I I serve on um, one board that stopped using VHP and moved to a different product um, altogether, and I, you know it, it was another public sector entity, and I think there are some questions about how, as from a customer perspective, we're thinking about who else we want as a customer and how how we're attracting them for VHP overall. And what I'm curious is, I, I see you have a business development team, and I'm wondering, do, is that team focused on trying to get contracts from other employers to use VHP or no? So we're not licensed to be broader than, and for the employer group to move beyond the, Santa Clara County. Oh, I, I mean, you mean just our county workforce? And so we were able to be in VTA because they were formerly a county employee organization? I am not sure about VTA. I would have to, t I would have to look into that. I, I am not familiar that they are actually. No, they like, aren't anymore. Yeah, they right. left us. Right. They thought um, we so were too expensive. We don't have a license to go beyond Santa Clara County for the employer group and IHSS. Interesting. We would have to have a. We would have to broaden that license. So we're as big as we can get. For so we have Cover California, which is in three counties. Right. Yes. There's a commercial product which is Santa Clara County, and Santa Clara, which includes the the employees, including the court system, and IHSS. So then, for business development purposes. Yes. Can I jump in? Yeah. Who's left? Sure. Um, we're not as big as we can get because we don't cover the entire Medi-Cal population. Family health plan um, only um, delegates less than half of the Medi-Cal lives to us. So we could be significantly larger if we got a larger delegation, which is pretty much up to them. Um, but it so would I be a big difference for the county as a whole, not the county government, but the county as a whole would bring down additional funding from state and the feds if we had a larger delegation of lives. So understanding that, what I think that caught, what caught my attention was um, as part of the budget that there was a line that I will find that had a, it had a, a business development team. And so what I was trying to understand was what is the goal of the business development team? And I apologize for asking the question so inartfully. I went to the end because I was trying to understand what are the areas that we're competing in. Sure. So um, the business, I mean, we have explored expanding that license, and that is obviously a separate conversation. Uh, the, the business development office has a number of things. So uh, one area is Covered California where um, we anticipate, we, are, we really have to build that network both in San Benito and Monterey counties as well as here in Santa Clara County. Um, that includes working with brokers. That is how most people are enrolled in Covered California is actually through a broker who can then sit down with them face to face. And we have contracts with these brokers and those brokers work with potential members to determine what plan is best for that member based on their health needs. Mm -hmm. So we have a network of brokers and the business development office works with, uh, with many, many brokers across the region. That is one aspect of their work. The other aspect is marketing, um, re outreach, going to a, a, a number of events, both here and, and outside of the county, to work with people and be part of the cultural events, the heritage events, uh, so that they can have that face-to-face -face time with potential members. Um, they also work with any of the organizations. They are part of many of the communications and the organizations that are working on the Medi-Cal recertification. And so they have a, a really critical role, and that's really what they, what they do. And they also maintain our website in sense of what goes on the website, all of the communications the communications on the evidence of coverage, the regulatory go back and forth and for some of that, as well as compliance, those are some of their activities. 
And also, I should point out that our membership in the county employee population is significantly lower than we would like to see it. So business development also involves trying to attract as many employees to VHP as possible. I don't know how we're doing that. So I can speak to that. This morning, I actually was on a call with open enrollment for the county employees, and we're part of a number of in-person and virtual events to talk about all the changes at VHP. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, that's this is all really helpful, and because I don't sit on this committee, it's th I appreciate the opportunity to use budget as to weigh in on this. You know, for me, um, I think one of the most important things that that we can do is really determine what gets people excited about signing up for us. And so whether it's VHP or VMC, I, I am concerned that we we under advertise and we under um, engage and and w with the broader population. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, you know, Laura, I've seen you at a number of community events. What I what I have been unable to really understand is what's the What's the plan for the, um, you know, to get to the, the maximum number that we can be at? Because, you know, something I still don't really, um, I haven't really made a decision about what I, what I think about it yet is our partnership with uh, Family Health Plan and the, you know, the way the state weighs in with whatever deal they want to cut with whoever the, the provider is they most want, and then how that trickles down to us at a local level and, and you know, being in a two-plan community. And, and I actually feel like we're in a three-plan community, really, based on the way the state's behaving. So I, I just don't understand the market position and how to look at your budget in, in that respect. And the reason I was asking about the customer satisfaction is that, um, you know, I made a choice um, to be a member as a board member so that I could understand what feedback were pe people were giving me and I, you know, and I love our health care system and all, and all of it. Um, and I want to make sure that the products that we're offering to the public are as competitive as they can be. And I just, I'm not sure I understand that solely from the budget. And I, that's a great feedback and I appreciate that, Supervisor Chavez. I think we have a very rich set of benefits, and I agree. I think we need to do a better job of communicating that out, particularly to the employee group. Um, it's I mean, we don't have any co-pays, for example. So I do think there is an opportunity there to improve. Um, we can definitely take that back and provide more information, um, generally speaking, and, and add it to a ledge file, for example, that we do every month. Well, I think that that's been a significant part of our ledge files monthly to HHC um, about all of the outreach events that we're doing and all of the, the growth that we're working on. And is there, do you have a plan that has been presented to HHC overall that just says, here's where we're at, here's where we want to be in three years, here's where we want to be in five years? Not at the moment. Um, that actually is something we're going to start doing this spring. We're actually working on developing um, a strategic plan to exactly that reason. Um, I think this year has been a real focus on implementing EPIC, which provides a really robust member portal, for example, which will allow yeah. people to get much more real-time information, as well as a better provider portal and, and many other aspects of EPIC, which will provide a lot more functionality and I think really improve both the member experience as well as um, how providers interact with us as well. And I think just the last thing I would add is that I do believe that we do have some deficiencies in terms of access to certain kinds of services. Not just us, by the way. I think it's true for, you know, psychiatry, behavioral health. I mean, there's there's some. I, I guess what I'm what I'm really at, and I'll I'll look at the ledge files because this may answer the question. But part of the reason I was so interested in the business plan is I was also curious about how we get. The, the more people to um, into our network and frankly to agree mm -hmm. to be um, covered by insurance instead of um, simply cash because so many of them think we're all too painful to deal with and frankly feel really taken advantage of not by us per se but by other health insurances so I I part of the reason I was so interested in the business plan is it would make sense to me that 
we're making these investments because year three, we're gonna be here, year five, we're gonna be here, and here's what the outreach looks like, not just on the communities to get signed up, which I'm super excited about, but also in terms of the services that we're gonna be able to provide. And then lastly, it, it would then help me understand, again, what should our expectation be about revenue and resources that go into the bigger pool, because the real benefit of of us doing this ourselves is really being able to um, reinvest resources into a system that we're trying to strengthen and develop. Absolutely, Supervisor, and, and I think that was Justin was alluding to is the increase in, in expense was related to growing that network. Um, we've really expanded on the behavioral health network, working with community providers and ensuring we have a greater number of psychiatrists, marriage and family therapists, and others in the behavioral health space to have that access for our members. And it, but there is an increased cost that comes with that. Absolutely, yeah, that makes sense. And I appreciate it. Thank you, colleagues. Supervisor Sumidian. Thank you. Uh, I am hoping I can get some assurance, not insurance, but assurance, <laughs> that um, the proposed reduction in funding for the PCAP program, the primary care access program, is not going to inhibit the access to or use of or availability of the program. And I should add to that before I let staff respond. Thank you for all the work that went into creating the program. It's unfortunately one of our best kept secrets, I'm afraid. But um, for those who are unfamiliar with the PCAP program, even as we were pursuing efforts to, in, to make sure that folks had insurance, um, we always knew there were going to be some folks out there who weren't going to access insurance, perhaps because they couldn't, perhaps they were undocumented, perhaps they just couldn't get themselves there. Maybe they were the young invincibles. So we needed a program that reflected that reality, and the PCAP program has been that uh, program. And, you know, particularly pleased that we were able to expand the eligibility uh, incomes uh, in a way that I thought was meaningful. Um, so, with all of that, patting you on the back and, you know, buttering you up, are we still going to be able to make this work with uh, five and a half million dollars less? I think I should probably answer that since this is general fund. Um, and the answer is that we adjusted the general fund contribution based on the utilization, not based on decreasing the service. So. Um, is the utilization increases, we'll come back to the board and increase the contribution. But we felt since we had challenges with the general fund balancing, we could not afford to leave uh, money in the budget that wasn't going to be utilized. I, yes. I think I can live with that as a budget strategy or for this year, but my hope, of course, is that the program, which is still relatively new, mm -hmm. um, grows over time. That will require enhanced outreach, a subject on which we have had quite a bit of conversation. And I just want to make sure that, let me reframe my earlier expression of concern. I want to also be sure not only that we can continue to do what we're doing, but that we have the ability to grow the program even within the fiscal constraints. I would hate to think that that allocation in the budget meant that we weren't going to be able to grow the program if the growth potential was there. Because I know the needs there. That's uh, I, uh, The question is whether we can help folks understand that there's a resource available. Thank you. Right. No, just, just to add uh, to Dr. Smith, uh, as you know, one of the big policy changes that happened is the expansion of Medi-Cal. And uh, there is California on a, on a path to have Medi-Cal for all, and of course, Many of the early enrollees in PCAP were people that are already suffering chronic diseases. So that means people that were between 45 and 64 before they qualify for Medicare. They have been taken over, quite frankly, by Medi-Cal, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, I, and of course, even though we had a surge in the membership with PCAP, that has been declining as more people enroll into Medi-Cal. Next fiscal year, there's another big change. There's the 19, the, the 26 to 49, which we should see probably another dip in the PCAP population, but it's not because of Dr. Smith or I or any anyone here, Laura and the team, not doing our best uh, to make sure the word is out, the enrollment happens, and of course, working with our community partners. Yeah, and I, 
forgive the when terribly articulate. Yes, and um, through the chair, I would just comment, take this opportunity to comment because I'm going to raise the issue a little bit later uh, when we get to uh, 14F. But it, it cuts across a number of these items, and I, I was thinking about this as Supervisor Chavez was speaking. The changing environment in healthcare. This is one of the reasons. This is one of the reasons I personally chose to get on the health committee as soon as I could uh, when I came back on the board, and have stayed with it. Uh, and thank you to the chair for now ten and a half years, is because <clears throat> I came on. Supervisor Chavez and I came on. Uh, in 2013, just as the Affordable Care Act was starting to make its presence felt. And we were in a, a tumultuous time. Uh, it was all the more tumultuous because of the election in 2016, which threw the uh, future of the Affordable Care Act into question. Uh, we've had numerous conversations at the committee and a significant number even at the full board level about the changing nature of health care funding and the various requirements. and. Um, it, so it's, I mean, <clears throat> I don't want to take any pressure off the staff in terms of the importance of planning. On the other hand, it's a challenging environment in which to plan. I mean, all, the entire environment in the county is a dynamic one. But, um, you know, if we, I mean, I, <clears throat> if we get two or three years where the state and federal environment is relatively stable, we think we've, you know, gone a long way with the same set of rules in place. I see Dr. Smith is waving in this direction, Madam Chair. Just wanted to expand a little bit on what you said. Um, we're trying to position, and I think quite well, the health system, both the delivery component and the um, insurance component, as well as behavioral health and public health, to be able to tolerate any threats that come our way because there's lots of changes that are talked about, but the implementation still is in the works. So the state has promised uh, that we're working towards a model of Medi-Cal for all. Um, and we've gotten started with CalAIM, which is a overhaul of Medicaid. And um, there's lots of promise that that will expand into behavioral health and um, we certainly hope that all that happens and that will be a world where all of our patients, all of our clients are insured and have equal access to services. However, that being said, a lot of the details have not been worked out yet. And particularly, you know, we note that the state's funding is decreasing remarkably and the feds are trying to decrease funding for Medi-Cal, Medicare, or Medicaid, Medicare. Um, so we're taking the stance that the board has given us that we should be ready for whatever happens. And uh, so we don't want to eliminate programs with the hopes that the state or feds will take them over, but we do want to right-size them to make sure that we spend our money as efficiently as possible. And when uh, you look at uh, the relationship with Family Health Plan Supervisor Chavez, I would also like to just point out that, you know, when we get delegated lives, we benefit from the uh, capitated rate of those lives because we take on the risk for those lives so we get paid a capitated rate. When we don't get those dedicated lives, we don't get a capitated rate, but we also oftentimes take care of those patients in our hospital for a fee-for-service rate, which is considerably less. So in terms of financial benefit for the constituents, the more capitated lives we could get delegated to VHP, the better off we are. And also, it's better off for VMC and for behavioral health. Through the chair, I, I just I'll close by uh, saying it's rare that I have occasion to quote Mike Tyson in a healthcare conversation, <laughs> <clears throat> but I am re I am recalling the quote: "Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face," and and uh, you know we we as a no I mean as a county we get metaphorically punched in the face uh, on some of these issues. I, I I mean I remember when we had a new Congress and a new president that were you know 
publicly committed to eviscerating the Affordable Care Act. And I remember sitting in this room with then Chair Ken Yeager and, uh, you know, what do you do? And we made the decision, which I thought was a wise one, to just say, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. That's a, that was not a Mike Tyson quote, by the way. And, 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 and forge ahead in the hope that, you know, we could make it work. And, you know, fortunately, we were able to make it work. But I, I do think I, it's a constant tension in, in budgeting terms. It's a constant tension between the need to plan and the reality that it's a pretty dynamic environment in which we plan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll say thank you again for the help with PCAP. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to item uh, 14B, which is the recommended uh, budget for the Public Health Department, and turn back to Greg. Okay. Thank you. The recommended budget for the Public Health Department is a total appropriation of two hundred. $20.6 million. It includes recommended actions to add resources for the advancement of tobacco prevention efforts, resources to address racial health disparities, and resources to improve the environmental health program uh, oversight, as well as the deletion of vacant positions to address the structural deficit. Next slide. At this point, we have staff available for questions. Thank you very much, Greg. I'm, I'm going to start out on this one with just really one quick point and question. Uh, the May second board at the May second meeting, the board unanimously approved a motion to add the one million, the requested one million dollars for implementation of the gun violence prevention work plan into the revised June budget. I, it's clear that it's a high priority for at least several members of this board. And what I was thinking, Dr. Smith. Um, is given the increased balance in the EMS trust fund, is that fund a possible source for consideration tied really directly to reducing uh, trauma calls? I'm trying to not ask for general fund movement. <laughs> I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, <laughs> sir. Um, when we did the assessment of the department, we um, identified funding that could get the job done without additional funding. However, um, in our revised budget, we will find another million dollars. And the trust fund is a good idea. We'll look into it and see if we can do that. Excellent, thank you. Uh, going down the line, Supervisor Lee, then Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. So uh, the quote you said, the damned of torpedo, full speed head being the Navy guy, is by Admiral Dave Farragut uh, during the War of 1812. Just to get the record clear. Thank you. And that, that's not, that's not uh, Mike Tyson. Um, <laughs> um, so the question I have is regarding um, our social media. Uh, as we have uh, experienced now in public health, with the proliferation, and I'm not talking about just inaccurate information, I'm talking about conspiracy theories being empowered and supercharged by social media and AI bots. With made up facts or studies, the erosion of trust of public health and our government as a whole is now at an all time high. Does this public health budget really contain the resources necessary to do the following? A, fact check these conspiracy claims. B, provide rapid response to counter these dangerous social media videos or messages. Example, those we have all heard, a friend of a friend of mine did something and third, C, producing accurate videos and messaging to counter these fake news that disparage the safety of our healthcare system. And D, getting these messages out in multilingual outreach. As we have learned, a lot of the conspiracy theories and videos are in different languages and as we know, some are even made in some Spanish-speaking countries that now have gone viral in our own Latino communities. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is uh, Sarah Redman, Deputy Thank Health Officer. I'm joined today by Michael Ballier, our Deputy Director for Operations, and virtually by Rhonda McClinton-Brown, who is our Deputy Director for Policy Strategy and uh, Planning. Um, so to respond to your question, I think fortunately, while um, the last three years have been harrowing. There have been some major wins and major improvements. One of those is that we have been able to significantly grow internally to public health. 
our own capacity to provide exactly the kinds of responses to misinformation and disinformation that you've just described. We've done so primarily by leveraging grant funds that have come from both federal and state uh, sources, um, as well as working outside of the public health department with partners like uh, the language services in the CE's office. So at this point, looking at the budget for the coming year, I do feel that we're adequately resourced to do the kinds of uh, focused work interpreting what messages are out there, flagging those of greatest concern, highlighting what needs to be shared with the public, and getting that information out in languages that our community will understand. Good, and I think this is something that should be very easily available on our website and getting it out on a constant basis. So I certainly, my afterwards, would like to chat more about how we could help promote this information to our constituencies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Smitty and your light had been on, but not for this item. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you, and um, thank you all very much for your leadership and your uh, work. I, I have a, a kind of a a broad question um, relative to public health and what role perhaps that you see uh, public health playing and in particular I want to talk about violence prevention um, and then I have, I have one that's not connected to violence prevention but it does seem like you, your department is stretched in a lot of different ways in terms of areas of expertise and I wonder if you could talk just a little bit philosophically about um, violence prevention being within your purview, and and if it weren't within your purview, where in the county family should it be? Sure, thank you. I really appreciate that question, Supervisor Chavez. Um, and I think you you highlight a tricky issue for us that when we can draw a straight line from a key issue to health outcomes, and especially disparate health outcomes across racial and other lines of disparities in our county, we do feel that there's a role for us here in public health. But it's not all things, therefore, are public health. Um, so we're fortunate in this county to have a wide network across multiple county players <coughs> of almost every type of strategy that's really key to violence prevention and gun violence prevention in particular. Many of those are law enforcement strategies, and so we defer to our law enforcement partners on those. And many that are not often center on um, two areas where public health excels. One is gathering of data, interpreting that information, and making sure that the players who need to understand what's going on and how it impacts health have the information they need. And another is convening community partners to help make sure that uh, the right players who represent the communities who are being most impacted are at the table to decide what interventions are gonna work for them and be most beneficial to the safety of their communities. And so this is where public health activities are focused right now in uh, messaging like via our We All Play a Roles campaign or in um, convening partners uh, like supporting the East San Jose Peace Partnership. I think that's actually you know what? What my my concern is that I, I I'm not sure I, I see the level of of um, effectiveness and focus that that I think is going to be required to deal with this issue. And I and and honestly, Dr. Redman, this isn't an issue relative to public health. It's more an issue relative to um, addressing addressing a, a public health challenge that is is so uh, unique and like a, as an example you know I've had an opportunity to work with the public health department for for really maybe 25 years on tobacco um, and so it does seem to me that as we get as we're dealing with vaping that it makes sense that this is within the same body you've had success and it feels like that's a body of work that makes sense to be housed within public health. And I, and I say this recognizing that my own thinking is that we're trying to prevent so many things and it's so all over, you know, we're dealing with it in gender-based violence, we're dealing with it in the Department of um, Social Justice and Equity. And, and I'm really just wondering, uh, in part based on your personal leadership and experience, if you could help the board think a little bit about how we get deeper into prevention. As a matter of fact, you know, I'll just say uh, with President Ellenberg, when I became chair of the board in 2020, what a what an opportunity! Um, 
one of the th things that I, that I was most focused on that year was making sure that we developed the, the Office of Children and Advocacy. Supervisor Ellenberg named it later. Yeah, it, it, whatever was in my original thinking stuck in my head, but I, I, I misname a couple other things that we innovated too. But, but the reason I raise this is that it, the idea here is to get us, a salud, to get so deep into um, prevention that we really are changing the circumstances and the environment that people are living in and, and um, experiencing their community. So I, I have been curious, and it may perhaps um, just, it was really just looking at your budget and how spread out, how many FTEs you have on different subjects that feel maybe like it's time to move to a new model that is much more inclusive, much deeper, and that really is anchored in different parts of the county in partnership um, with all of you. you. So anyway, that, that's what prompted the, the question. Um, then just want to. If just a moment, if oh, you yes. don't mind, Dr. Smith wants to weigh in, I think, on your current point. Yeah, I want to lobby the board for the next two to three years when I won't be here. Um, but it's always been true that the social determinants of health are really what affect the health of the community. And once we have stabilized the delivery system, which in our world is VMC in the hospitals, which I think is close to be occurring, um, I would lobby that we need to get invested in population health and basically transform the public health department into a population health department. Um, for years before I got here, it was starved um, mm -hmm. in preference for a delivery system. We've now built it back to a reasonable extent, but it will need more. So maybe just put that in the back of your mind two, three to four years from now. Start talking about population health. Yeah, I think those were excellent points, Dr. Smith, really, truly. And I, I do think that, uh, that if we want to be in, the, um, in a meaningful way really changing the trajectory of human health, we, we've got to be in the prevention business in a way that we're not now. And that, again, a number of the offices, and I would say even the, um, you know, the Office of Immigrant Affairs and some other offices of disability, all of those offices are offices that are being put into place in part so that we're getting to people as early as we can. And, um, and so I just appreciate that you've, you've become sort of the catcher of the health baseball team, which is anything that comes off the plate, you know, it's someone misses <laughs> a swing and ends up in your department. And so I, I just want to make sure that we're that we're giving you the support you need and also, frankly, giving you an opportunity to decide um, what the future should look like um, in a more aggressive way. I, I just had one other issue that I wanted to ask about, and that is that um, the under the Department of Health, or the, I'm sorry, the Department of Environmental Health, which I know now is a subset of public health, um, I wanted to ask if we are changing, uh, if we've already made the change to, to no longer be reviewing um, land use plans that come before us, you know, to be able to make sure that the environment is clean and safe for construction. Yes, uh, Michael Ballier, uh, Deputy Director for the Public Health Department. Um, in regard, I think what you're referring to is in regards to the site mitigation program, yes, uh, clean up of contaminated sites. Uh, we have uh, fully staffed that unit and um, have also been accepting uh, the cleanup um, uh, you know, plans from the different projects. And so um, I think that we're uh, doing pretty well in that regard um, and moving forward. That's really exciting. Could you, um, before the end of budget, just give us an update on what's in the pipeline and how long people have to wait for their reports actually to be considered by staff? And colleagues, the reason this is so critical this is a, a mission critical path relative to affordable housing, which is why it was so important that we be able to do this work at a local level. Because if we didn't, people have to wait in late for the uh, wait in line for the state to see their, um, you know, to review their reports, and it just takes forever. And every year that we add on to a a project, you know, we're adding 
I don't know, 15%. It's something nuts in terms of construction costs. So I would love to just get off agenda what, what's in the pipeline and how long folks are having to wait. And the other thing is, you know, if you can add in how, how we are educating local developers about the program. Sure. Thank, thank you, you, colleagues. Thank you all. Item 14C is the recommended budget for custody health services. Greg, looking to you to begin. Okay. And thank you, public health folks. For the uh, custody health services department, the recommended appropriation is 134.2 million. It includes uh, the addition of resources to expand the mixed use of nursing roles, to fund peer support workers for mental health, to create uh, tiered supervision for psychiatric social workers, and for expansions including substance abuse disorder treatment program, infection control support, ophthalmology services, and to expand the physician after hours urgent care services. And it includes the deletion of vacant positions to address the structural deficit. Next slide, please. And at this point, where we have staff available for any questions of the board. Thank you. Would someone like to begin? I will do so if there's no one. Oh, Supervisor Simidian, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Bear with me for a moment, please. I've got a chicken and egg cart before the horse problem today. I seem to be coming up with every cliche I can uh, in today's <laughs> meeting. So um, <clears throat> here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a statement, and then I'm going to ask Dr. Smith for uh, a response. And here, here it is. Uh, we are expecting at our next board meeting a report on the Nunez case. Uh, I haven't seen that report, but I am, of course, familiar with the details of the Nunez case by virtue of my role as a board member who saw the claim in closed session. Um, I don't want to draw overly large conclusions from individual cases. That said, uh, when we see that case in an open and public setting, or at least see a description and a report from OCLEM of that case in an open public setting, I think it's going to raise some obvious questions about custody health, at least as it existed prior I want to underscore that prior to your arrival, Dr. Day. So Dr. Smith, in this budget process where we have the hearing, excuse me, where we have the hearing in June, but the workshop in May, and in between the two, we have a board hearing, uh, board meeting where there will be a discussion of that particular case, which will have implications, I believe, for custody health. Can we simply ask as part of the larger motion that your final budget be presented in consideration of or with consideration of the Nunez case and whatever we discern from reviewing it at our, I believe it's May 16th meeting. We will certainly take the report into account and reassess custody help. Thank you, that's all I'm, all I'm asking for. I just wanted to make sure we didn't start down a path and then say, oh, we can't look at that, we can't talk about it. Thank you, Madam Chair, I, thank you, Bellis. I would like to just reemphasize what you said, Supervisor, that um, partially because of the Nunez case and partially because of other issues, we hired uh, Dr. Day, and she's come in and done a very excellent job uh, in a very difficult situation, um, and I just wanna thank her and her team for all the good work they do. Thank you again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, colleagues. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I too wanted to say, um, you know, I'm so pleased with the direction that we're moving in. Um, and so Dr. Day and Renee, I, I do want to just say, uh, just to thank you, we're moving in the right direction. Um, one one question that I wanted to just um, take a, di a, deep, <laughs> a deeper dive into, yikes, um, is on the, on the custody health section four, um, page 420, it looks at um, waiting times 
for new consults. And what I was wondering is, what's the actual goal that we should be trying to meet? I, I see what that number is. And one, I also just want to say how much I appreciate the transparency. But I'm just curious about goals-wise, um, what, what should that be, even if it's off of this page in 2020X, that we should be trying to get to? And does the current structure of the budget allow you to, to address those wait times wait time issues. Uh, thank you, Supervisor, for the question. And the wait times are consistent with what we should be uh, meeting under the consent decree. And so it varies uh, depending on if there is a patient who is refusing um, and or if the patient is not available. Access to care sometimes is an issue as well. Uh, what we're trying to do is right now to make sure that the patients are being seen as per um, the requirements. We do have an aging report, and that aging report basically is showing us those patients that are not being seen in a timely way, and then we're scheduling those. We put some efficiencies in place uh, to where we're um, adding on appointments to the clinic line for the <coughs> physicians, and so that we can get those patients seen quicker. And, and then I understand from the sheriff that you're also, he's also working with a new custody strategy to have folks be able to move people more quickly from their cell to, to the appointment, because I imagine some of this happens when appointments get missed because of scheduling in the jail as well. Uh, correct. We are working very closely with the sheriff's office. Uh, we do have some MSDs that we're bringing in to work primarily with the behavioral health department, but we also have access to care officers that recently have been um, scheduled uh, between the hours of 8 and 5 p.m. Uh, to at each um, facility per shift. And so those are dedicated primarily to getting patients to their appointments. Yeah, that, that sounds like a, a really good direction. And then the only, other, um, the only other issue I wanted to ask, and let me, and this has to do with the peer support workers. Um, on those peer support workers, is there a reason that we're looking at the addition of only two? And the reason I'm asking, and this may, may be a question for Dr. Smith, too. The reason I'm asking is I'm just wondering if we're seeing more, not more, but we're seeing the kind of success we want from those peer support, um, uh, the peer support assistance, and whether or not that's a direction we should be increasing or not. The uh, department actually asked for more, and we um, worked with them to suggest that we take an incremental approach so that we asked the board for two at this point. And if it's working out well, and if we have all the kinks in the process worked out, that we come back and ask for more. Complexity is, you know, the peer support workers have to uh, get backgrounded for the jail. And, <clears throat> you know, there are a number of other potential problems with actually getting it operational, which Dr. Day has in hand. So. The intent would be to give it a try with these two and then come back at a time period when hopefully we have more Improved. resources. So one request that I would make is that if you could, Dr. Day, um, in an off agenda, just explain the pilot with the two and what, what barriers need to be met, how you know that will be successful, what's the timeline, and that way the board has, you know, as we're thinking about Susan, was you're signaling me? You want no, to talk no. about that? No, I just want to add on to it when you're finished. Can oh, you tell ahead. what my signals mean? No, I, and I'm blind. <laughs> All I can finish. see is some, I, didn't, I can I see didn't some hand waving. <laughs> uh, so what I was going to ask is that if, if we could see that that plan, and the reason that would be important is both for reentry or for public safety and justice for us to be able to revisit that before we get to the next budget cycle, just so we understand what the effectiveness has been. I've seen some broad um, studies on peer support in a number of health areas, and the outcomes are really good. I haven't read anything about outcomes relative to folks who are in custody, so I, I don't have as much information about that, but would be really excited to learn more. Certainly. If thank I could you. build uh, a little bit on that. Um, thank you also, just overall. Uh, Dr. Day, also very, very impressed by the growth uh, in the work in custody health. What I would be interested in is having you report during the quarterly reports that you're already doing to PSJC 
to add those in, um, including any lessons learned um, specifically to, to meet Supervisor Chavez's goal, which is if we've got evidence that this is successful, let's start thinking about how we, how we build this up. And I, I know that there will be challenges around um, clearing people for these, these visits, and I, and I hope that we're really thoughtful in understanding that the backgrounds by definition are not going to be uh, squeaky clean, and we wanna make sure that we're not putting up barriers to the very peers that could really provide the, the most help. Certainly, we can provide that information for you. Thank you so much. Uh, Supervisor Lee then Simidian. Yes, Dr. Day. First of all, I just want to highlight and thank you for <clears throat> the good work you're doing. Um, and with this budget, we talked about increasing quite a few positions uh, in support of the AB 109 uh, that's coming down the pipeline, uh, adding mental health peer support workers, adding licensed clinical supervisor, uh, adding you know, medical social worker and rehabilitation counselors positions, which are so important these days with the opioid and substance use disorders situation we have been seeing uh, within custody. I mean, as we gave uh, the award certificates uh, last meeting, uh, a dozen cases of these uh, Narcans were used because of these issues in, in custody. So we certainly need to make sure that <clears throat> those services are very much available and they are truly life-saving. Um, I do notice uh, one of the requests that you put in was to uh, get a half FTE physician to support juvenile custody health services. I don't believe that's on the recommended budget. Uh, so I just want to double check with you to see the need and whether or not there's something that uh, will need to be added back and how you're going to accomplish if we don't have that. And uh, Supervisor, I didn't hear uh, what position? The half FTE physician to support juvenile custody health. Uh, yes, and uh, that's for our medical director, and right now she's um, she's funded at about a point six, and we are getting increased juveniles coming in under the secure track, uh, which are up to age 23, and so we're just basically increasing her hours up into a 1.0 FTE. So that's your way to meet that need without right. putting on this budget, right? Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I had just one other um, relatively small but very important question. Uh, the department proposals included a request for $45,000 to support bus transportation upon discharge from jail. I realize it's a tiny amount, but it makes a tremendous difference to the people impacted. And I'm wondering if this is perhaps somewhere else in the budget or whether we've got the potential to add resources in partnership with the sheriff or other offices that provide transportation supports. Do you want to handle that? <clears throat> I'll try that. Our th thinking during the budget preparation was uh, to try to centralize this process because obviously the custody element is very important as well as the um, custody health issues and behavioral health issues. So uh, our intent is to work with those departments to figure out a way to centralize the request and right-size it. Great, but they will, we're not, we're not there's worrying enough. that people are not going to get the transportation support no, when they're leaving. There's enough money in the uh, service and supplies to be able to do that without a... Okay, good. Thanks, I appreciate that. Susan, may but, I follow up just on that point? Of course. So I'm glad you remind me. I think, too, we had been asking re-entry a similar question relative to, you know, I think they were even doing an RFP for bus services from from the jail to re-entry. And, um, and one thing that I would like to request um, with the permission of the maker of the motion, and that is that we um, sit down, that we ask our staff to have a sit down with VTA about how to um, make it easier for people to have access to whether it's Clipper or tokens right now. And the reason is they're changing some of their programming and it's an opportunity for us to get in while that programming's changing and making uh, transportation a little more available for folks once we um, engage them. So there's the bus action, but there's also, we're asking them to take a look at how to make their services easier for people. 
Um, and this may be an opportunity for us to make sure people have trans transit um, through re-entry as they leave. So I, I would just ask if we could have staff make sure that conversation's happening since they're already doing the RFP. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. And I will accept that as part of the motion. And uh, Supervisor Travis, did you want to add to your previous off agenda? So I I'd made a, a, an off agenda request, Dr. Day, and I'll, I'm asking that that be included in the motion that looks at peer support. Uh, and I, I want to say that I like the way that you structured it in terms of the quarterly outcomes. So we'll include that. Thank you. And, yeah, and you're in the second. And did you want to add your um, the inclusion of the business plan or the consideration of the business plan for the um, for VHP? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, next is uh, 14D, which is the recommended budget for behavioral health services. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Day and team. Thank you. The recommended budget for behavioral health services is a total recommended appropriation of $737.5 million, and it includes the addition of resources to provide oversight of mental health services and substance abuse services enhancing language services, expanding individual placement services, expanding LGBTQIA mental health, improving mental health call center support services and intensive care outpatient services and assisted outpatient treatment. Next slide, please. It also adds resources to support the uh, MHSA plan to enhance the utilization management and to support provider relations quality assurance team, financial operations, the mental health contract oversight, and invest in workforce development, facilitates the NetSmart claims management, and, and also to support uh, compliance with the and payment reform. Next slide, please. Further, it adds resources to support the Blackbird Peer Respite Program, to support the Aspire, uh, Aspire Program, to maintain psychiatric uh, emergency response team, to expand the trusted response urgent support team and helps resources to help meet uh, financial compliance and, and, and to expand mental health related housing services. And it also deletes vacant positions to address the structural deficit. Next slide, please. And at this point, we've got uh, Sherry here to help with questions uh, from the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Thank you, Renee, and thank you, Sherry. I'm going to I don't know if there's a president's prerogative or not, but I'll choose to create one and start with, with this item. Um, thank you for the, for the report. While the, while the department overall shows about an 11% increase in funding from last year, there's a reduction in general fund investment in behavioral health, and that cut appears to be largely due to the 8.9% million dollar reduction tied to the 62 positions recommended uh, to be eliminated to close the structural deficit. Um, first, let me know if that's an accurate interpretation of the data, and if it is, how should the board view this reduction in general fund relative to the investment in the hospital system as we discuss the need for better parity in physical and mental health services? They look to me. Well, Thanks, I'm not guys. sure that one is you. I could start. But. Yeah. Well, let me start. Um, the positions that, well, let me start from the beginning. The, Broader than just the positions, thinking overall about right. decreases in general funds in the budget that the board has said, please prioritize, focus here. This is our crisis. This is what right. we want you to be spending time and money on. <clears throat> In order to do that, we need to back up and look at where the actual contact with the customer happens. <clears throat> In our system, just like most counties, 90% <clears throat> of the services that are provided are provided through CBOs, <clears throat> not through our own clinicians. We provide services in the inpatient setting and also we have <clears throat> relatively small clinics so the positions that you'll see that we're recommending uh, deleting are mostly administrative positions, not 
clinical positions, and the reason for that is because the clinical services that are provided by our CBOs and also our own system are paid for through specialty Medi-Cal. So the services do not need as much general fund as, as we need to expand the level of service. So we're trying to right size our budget so that we bring down as much um, state and federal funding as possible um, in order to do that. We still contribute a very large amount of general fund. With regard to drawing down funds, if we're cutting administrative positions, does that mean that we have fewer people potentially working on um, making sure that we are bringing in those revenues. I know that there, there's funding reform, we're transitioning to <clears throat> fee for service uh, rather than cost reimbursement. Do you expect that to impact our revenue and do we have enough people working on making sure that we are getting the revenue for services that are provided? Good question. Thank you. The um, <clears throat> State is changing fundamentally the way that you know we're reimbursed for behavioral health services. And it'll be more like it is for medical services where um, we um, send money to the state to as an intergovernmental transfer and then that pays, that they match that with federal money and send it back as form, in the form of um, payments for services. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at right-sizing that because what has been true in the past is that we've paid claims in a cost-based reimbursement model and we've managed contracts um, through the health, uh, behavioral health department. Now we have to fundamentally change and have the public or the behavioral health department function as an HMO, and so that's why we're asking Valley Health Plan to take over some of the management of you know, credentials and provider quality. Um, so I think the general answer to your question is, I think we have enough staff at this point, and we'll have to play it by ear and see what happens in the future. Okay, and and you, that triggered another question from me, uh, thinking about the, the CBOs and, and where they're going to be supported in our budget. The fee-for-service um, payment model, will that include travel time? So much of our CBO services as we want them to be are, are delivered in the field or at, at multiple sites, uh, which could, which means essentially seeing fewer patients than you can see per hour if you're if you're in a doctor's office. And AOT, a lot of the new community-based outpatient treatment will be in different sites. How, how do we Another build that into question. this? Another great question. It's not built into the state model of fee-for-service, mm -hmm. but um, what we've been talking with the department about is how can we monitor the service and assure that there's actually people going out into the community from CBOs? And each CBO has a different capacity to do that. Some are large CPOs, CBOs that have a panoply of services and can right size their organization appropriately. Some are smaller. Mm -hmm. So our intent is to keep track closely of their revenue and their billing and we can do that because they actually have to bill us first and then the bills, fee-for-service bills get sent to the state, come back to us. Um, and wow, if we, that's also a big delay between delivery of service and payment reimbursement. Right, and there's also anticipated to be a large number of denials. Right now our denial rate is somewhere in the region on average of about 13% and has to do with the fact that the state's really picky about fill out all the forms exactly. But because we're gonna, we've implemented a new medical record structure that should be decreased dramatically by the fee-for-service model. 
So there's, the summation is there's a lot for Sherry and her team to keep track of with the CBOs and our relationship with the CBOs is gonna be much closer than it has been in the past. Um, and Given what you described that they are implementing 90% of our services, it, it's very much in, in our interest to make sure that they can continue to yes. provide those services and, and aren't um, swallowed up by, by the, smaller, uh, the smaller payments and the longer time gaps between payments. That's pretty scary. Right, and I can tell you that the number of times that Sherry and her team has reminded me that we cannot afford to decrease our um, continuum of care at all has been many hundreds of times, and I totally agree with her, and we will not decrease the access. As a matter of fact, we need to improve the access. Go, Sherry. And, and so we, do we improve access with, is a possibility, is there a new funding stream for quality management activities that would support the expansion of some of this work? Yes. That's your answer. Yes. You guys <laughs> stuck me with the hard answers. <laughs> Thanks, I may Dr. have more for you. <laughs> yes, there is um, an opportunity to be able to um, bill back to the state for what we refer to as quality assurance and utilization review. And um, so positions that um, perform those functions within the department in our quality management area, we're able to um, bill back to the state for that, that, um, that service. Okay, thanks. I have, I have just a few more questions that I'll try to move briskly uh, through. Um, the, regarding the augmentation for language services, uh, we've, we've heard some concerns uh, from our CBO partners that a shift to a central language line translation vendor um, means that w will they have a, a harder time providing, or will we have a harder time providing online translation in residential programs, or who, who foots the cost for that? That was a very unclear question. What can you tell me about the new <laughs> vendor for translation services? How will that impact our CBOs? Sure, so um, our Behavioral Health Services Service Department um, allocated funds for um, support of telephonic interpreter services. Um, Is that the 1.2 million? That's correct. Okay, thank you, go and, ahead. And uh, providers have a, um, a provision and clause in their contract that they are um, required to provide in-person interpreter services as part of the service delivery. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, you know, we recognize that, um, you know, our providers um, need support, you know, in that area. And so um, we're, we'll continue conversations about ways to ensure that um, uh, those services are able to be provided. Okay, Th thanks. And I wanna get clarity on just a couple of other items. Um, and I'll see if I can ask the questions more artfully. Um, there's $2 million um, from ARPA funds for call center after hours, weekend and, holidays, weekend and holiday schedules. It, it's not clear to me if these will be extra help positions um, or, or other, other positions and, and how will they be sustained when the ARPA dollars run out? Sure, um, we're currently looking at um, seeking additional support from an outside vendor to help provide supplemental services to the call center. And at the conclusion of ARPA funding, uh, we would be looking for um, internal resources to continue those services. Internal, okay. And We're responsible essentially for our call center to be a 24 right. seven operation. And therefore, um, you know, it's, it's really critical that when someone calls after business hours that the phone is answered and that we're able to... Oh, I agree. That. That's why I want to make sure that we have a plan to, to fund. The ARPA dollars are a nice one-time yes. uh, bump and maybe savings of other funds. Uh, similarly, there's a million dollars proposed for workforce development, but, but a number of workforce items were bundled under one proposal on, um, on uh, packet page 440. Can you provide any more detail on how the funds will be used, what the different workforce development programs are? Um, we've continued to work uh, in collaboration with our um, contract providers. Uh, there's a workforce development work group that continues to um, develop strategies and priorities. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be working collaboratively with that group to um, determine how best to appropriate the, the funding 
uh, for those workforce development efforts. Oh, okay. And one of them is, a, is specifically a CBO retention program, right? Correct. And, and how will those funds be allocated and distributed amongst our providers? I think um, part of the conversation with the work group will really be to evaluate and assess how those funds can best be appropriated to support all agencies as they're looking to retain, um, you know, difficult to fill positions and their and their uh, clinical staff that are providing these vital services in our network. This is so hard. There, there's so much need, and and I appreciate the the work that we're doing around around workforce, um, but it's a it's a really long on ramp. Uh, last question is um, relates to the Blackbird House. There's proposed six month funding um, for them. What what supports will be available to them? Kind of. Um, relevant to my conversation a few moments ago with Dr. Smith to build their capacity to build to build Medi-Cal or access other uh, revenue streams. Yes, we've been working with Kaminar for some time. Um, there's an opportunity now statewide to be able to bill for peer related services. And so our plan is to help uh, Blackbird House become Medi-Cal certified and um, certify the peers that work in that program, um, and therefore they would be able to bill for the services that are delivered. Um, currently, um, the, the program is solely funded through cost-based reimbursement, and we right. really see this as an opportunity for long-term sustainability if we're able to certify them with Medi-Cal and sure. be able to train their peers on how to bill for those services. Is that something that can be in place by the time the six-month funding, before the six-month funding runs out? Yes, we're already in process and working with them on uh, certification, and we believe that we can accomplish that within the six-month period. Great. I'd, I'd like to add to um, Supervisor Arenas' motion that um, a report comes back to the board uh, no later than October, if that makes sense, uh, on the progress of generating revenue and any extension of funding for continuity of the, of the program that may be needed. Is, is October reasonable? Yes. Okay. Great, that's all I have. Thank you very much for your indulgence, everyone. Who would like to be next? Supervisor Ernest. My light is on. Um, thank you, and I accept that. As part of the motion, and I, my seconder. Seconder, good. Seconder's good, too. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to be part of the um, system level discussion that we have um, for item 15, um, but I'm going to bring this up uh, under this item and then, you know, colleagues, you can let me know whether I'm off or not on this. But last week I, I met with the, um, some, some of the behavioral health um, providers um, and uh, uh, the, the Contractors Association. And so one of the issues that they continue to have, and I know that our behavioral health department continues to meet with them on an ongoing basis, um, but they, uh, they want to make sure that they are made whole so that they can continue to support our community. And w one of the things that they continue to bring up is a pilot year. Um, so that their funds aren't hanging in the wind, if you will. Is that something that you've all discussed? Yes. Um, the change to fee-for-service is very scary for all mm -hmm. of the CBOs as well as being scary for us. Um, mm -hmm. And <clears throat> as I mentioned, we're going to have to keep close track of how it works out. We're starting with a uh, rate and evaluation process that was patterned after what uh, the state had suggested. And we will continue to monitor correct, carefully, make sure that nobody um, ends up losing their ability to provide service. As I mentioned before, um, some of the CBOs actually will do a lot better with the new fee-for-service model. Some will have challenges, and so the ones that have challenges will be ready to help. 
Um, and what is that rate uh, based on the, on the state? It's different rates for different services in each county. Um, <clears throat> they're called CPT rates. Um, the challenge, in, it's, it's just like what happens with reimbursement for medical care. The challenge is that um, it's a fixed rate for a particular provide, or practitioner providing a service uh, independent of you know, what it costs to provide the service. So the state's actually actively going to away from a cost-based reimbursement model. So what we're anticipating is that some of the CBOs will do well, some will have challenges. The ones that have challenges will figure out a way to help probably with MHSA funding or realignment funding. Help me unravel this because I, from what I heard them say last week was that that rate was going to be, at, I think, at a 65%. They understood that in LA, uh, I think it's closer uh, in, in the late 80s kind of uh, percentage, between 80 and 90%. Um, right, and we looked at what our <clears throat> costs are and what um, is going on in LA, and actually our denial rate, as I mentioned, is right now about 13%, and our administrative costs are somewhere in the region of eight to 10%, and then we are reserving some funding so, for helping the, the uh, what you call it, CBOs that have a challenge. So we're trying to make sure that we keep the department whole because we take the risk for the reimbursement. So if there's a denial, the county takes that risk and owes that money. If I, if I may add to that particular piece to contextualize it, uh, Supervisor Arenas, the, the federal government as part of negotiating the waiver, which is CalAIM, uh, uh, as Dr. Smith indicated, they required the state of California to standardize the methodology. Now, different counties obviously have different rates, uh, and so we tend to be on the high end in terms of our rates, uh, just because of the cost of living and the fact that we're a county that overmatches every single behavioral health program. So we do a lot more than other counties, and therefore, even though they're standardizing the methodology. Hold on, Renee, I think we're having an audio issue. Just one second. You're echoing a little bit. I don't know what's going on. Is this still continuing or it's, it's, it's better? So, so even though the state is standardizing the methodology, mm -hmm. different counties are gonna have different rates. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so we tend to be on the high end, if not the highest, quite frankly. So 68%, 70% for us, uh, it, it translates probably much higher than anybody else, even though somebody else might be at 80% or 90% because they just have lower associated rates based on the methodology. So uh, it, it's really an apple-oranges comparison. Uh, when, we, when I took a look uh, and I sat down with behavioral health and the team and, and also had a meeting with some of the providers, uh, we have very favorable rates, quite frankly. Uh, when you look at the hourly, hourly rates for psychiatrists, psychologists, licensed social workers, the whole clinical staff uh, that's part of the whole basis of standardizing this, uh, we have much higher rates than the rest of the state of California. I should probably give uh, just one example. For a psychiatrist visit, um, the state's rate is $2,000. Now, that's a huge amount of money for an hour of a psychiatrist's time. So, you know, we would pass through 65% of that to the CBO, use some of that remaining money for administrative costs, hold some in reserve for the particular possibility of denial. And can I ask you, I know this is against probably um, your practice, but why not 
set them up for success in in anticipation that we that we know that this is risky for them just as well it is it is risky for us why wait for um why put it in reserve when we can when we can provide it to these uh, folks so that they can continue to do the work that they're doing? One thing that I'm concerned about is that they're not going to be able to do evening hours or meet our families where they're at, um, either because of transportation or whatever other uh, logistical reasons. And what would make those services really accessible to families are just are, are now going to be uh, it's not just it's not going to be a possibility for a lot of a, a lot of our families um, and that's what I think we're risking up front is that they're going to have to change those models and once they change those models they're going to default back to those models that were there 15 years ago when we started changing how we provide services to families. And that is the risk that I fear. Well, I think everybody fears all of that, including us. Um, we do think that the rates that we're coming up with do set them up for success, but we also reserve the right to increase them later if we find out there's problems. You know, this puts the county's general fund at great risk too. Um, so everybody's at risk and we have a new system. We don't know how it's going to work. The state's been quiet about all the regulations. So we're trying to figure out a way to spread the risk and keep the reserve of knowing that we can fix it if there's a problem. How soon would you be able to fix it in time, in real time? Would it be six months in, four months into... Um, into this, the, the once we, we switch format? We, the state changes the billing structure as of July 1st. Mm -hmm. We've committed to have quarterly reviews formally and obviously if anybody has a earlier problem or if uh, um, Alyssa calls me up and says there's a problem, we'll look earlier, but as I mentioned, d different CBOs have different situations, so we're going to have to deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis because, as I said, some will do really well, some will have challenges. We've predicted what ch challenges will occur. We're giving them advice on how to improve their revenue. Um, We'll intervene whenever we need to. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say that I'm I'm absolutely concerned that um, there there's risk in everything that we do, right? Uh, there's risk to to the agency. There's going to be risk to their agencies, um, and like I said, the the greatest risk is to our children and families. I think as as a larger government structure those risks are less than any of the with within the, any of those CBOs they're just not as huge as we are and so I think the the risk is is less to our systems um, and I'm I'm gonna keep a really close eye on this um, because I don't want our CBOs changing the way that they provide services and the way that they progressed in providing services. I, re I remember being on the other end of this when we, you know, when folks started having home visitations and um, whether they were home visitors or therapists, but we're meeting families where they are. And I think that's really important. Um, and knowing that, um, that we've gone through a whole isolation um, as a society, that we know that they, these are the top issues. We already know, right? These are the priorities. Um, the, the other area that I was going to actually mention is, um, including this, is um, 
is the mental health peer support workers. Now, I know that there was some additions in the reentry and in the custody um, uh, department, but here we're deleting seven and a half mental health support workers. And um, I'm not sure if that's if that has to do with, with adults or if it has to do with youth, but I'd love to talk a little bit more about this. Um, and before we move on, I just, uh, I'd like to just be part of those conversations as, as you know that um, South County has some of the highest numbers in the juvenile justice system referrals. Um, that's, that's a pipeline that I would love to disrupt and the way that we disrupt it, we all know that these support services are just that important. So that's the reason that I'm, um, one of the many reasons why I want to continue to be involved in this. And the other one is that, um, you know, as a parent, I know what our children are going through because my children are just, are there. They're doing the same thing as the rest of the population. Uh, today is a funeral of the child that I mentioned that passed away. And I had to go pick up my daughter because she felt dizzy. Now I know stress manifests in different ways um, in our children, and I know that that's one of the ways that's manifesting in my child. Um, and I can be there for her, but not every parent can. And I think we all know this, left untreated, uh, stress just does so much to a child's developing brain and, and it's better to um, support now than, than much later. And I think that's the same message that I'm asking us to take on for our service providers is to support them now rather than later um, because I don't want to see them fail. Um, and, the, and like I said, the, the risk to us as a system is much less than the risk to them. So I'm going to move on to the mental health peer support worker and if you could Please let me know um, what those are related to. Sure. Um, oh, Greta, I saw your light go on. Go ahead, Sherry. I'll, I'll um, jump in with anything else after you speak. Oh, sure. Um, Supervisor Anna, thank you for the question. And just um, a comment in response to your statement. Um, you know, the county and this board um, and our behavioral health services department have been extremely um, supportive of all of the services, the development of services from prevention, early intervention, all the way through deep level intervention for children and families for as long as I've been in the county, and we will continue to do that. Um, you know, our, a big portion of our Mental Health Services Act continues to be dedicated to children and families, and I realize that's an important commitment that, that we make from the department and the county. and through many of the board members here um, has been a continued um, interest. And so, um, you know, we will continue to do that, continue to look at ways to improve access um, and really, um, you know, hearing what you're saying about the needs of your child and others, um, that's something we're extremely committed to, to continuing through the many uh, contract providers that we have in the schools, providing services in the schools, you know, the development of wellness centers, um, we're really um, committed to continuing that. So, and you know, through the work of First Five, we've been very committed um, and actually have the highest penetration rate of services for children birth to five across the state. And that will continue to be a commitment that that we make to be able to provide those services in the, in the community. Um, tr uh, pivoting to your comment about peer support workers, uh, we have peer support workers that work across our system um, in our youth services all the way through adults and in the community and our self-help centers. Um, we value the work that they do, um, the lived experience that they bring in interacting with our consumers and others um, who really need our supports. And so while um, there may be a reduction in some of those positions, we continue to maintain, um, even with the, the proposed reductions, um, a vacancy um, o openings of 112 positions, and we will continue to prioritize those vacancies where they're most needed to be able to provide those services. So does that impact, um, can you tell me now or will, can, will you be able to tell me later if that is related to any youth services? Um, I think we'll be able to respond to that um, through a separate 
through separate information. Yeah, the, the only comment that I was gonna add to what um, Sherry's already shared is on, on some of the more clinically oriented positions that are being um, proposed for deletion in the budget. Those are examples of areas where you'll see when we come back, there are really significantly large numbers of vacancies. And so those proposed deletions are really um, leaving ample opportunity for behavioral health to continue to aggressively recruit folks into those positions to move the vacancies between programs as there's different needs in different programs that arise. Or if someone, for example, if we have a, a um, group of applicants um, for some of these positions who are more interested in filling vacancies in adult, they can shift the positions to fully capture all of the wonderfully qualified applicants who may be interested in serving adults. Conversely, same with children. So um, the the notion that we're taking some of these vacancies away, still leaving huge numbers of vacancies in those positions to continue aggressively hiring, and then to consider especially using some of the um, funds that, that are not built into some of these rates, which are also significantly gonna be directed to investments in our system, including for our CBOs, to really expand programs and access to care, which is part of the goal. I think there's um, definitely a lot of risk and challenge and fear um, that's very legitimate on the part of our service providers about this transition, but also real opportunities for them to have greater flexibility in the way that they deliver services, more um, money overall to draw down from state and federal sources to invest in the system of care. So we have to get those balances just right, um, but there's a lot of opportunity in this change and, and we're um, very committed to working with our CBO partners to figure out how we can leverage every opportunity to expand access to care in our community. I really appreciate that, Greta. Uh, thank you for, for saying that. And, and Sherry, thank you um, for um, her statement of commitment to, to behavioral health. And I don't deny that there is. I'm absolutely, um, I'm absolutely impressed with what the county can do for our, or has been doing for our community. Um, and so, you know, I'm relaying some of the messaging from our CBOs. And so this is just as of last Wednesday. So if they're not being heard, um, I want to continue to be that conduit, uh, not to say that every, every area of concern it may, may be some, may be a part of their perception rather than a reality and simply because we haven't jumped in just yet, right? We're in this anticipation. Uh, period. I did want to add, Supervisor Arenas, that we are um, uh, having individual meetings with each agency. Um, through the county, we hired Optimus, a healthcare actuary and economist firm that really helped us with the rate setting. And so um, the principal uh, through Optimus has actually been part of each individual meeting with every agency. And um, we've been able to really um, help highlight some opportunities for the agencies with respect to the, the rate schedule. Um, and, and provide some insight and, and opportunity for discussion. So that's something we will continue to do, work very closely with our um, contracted agencies and um, continue to have that open dialogue about opportunities and, and, and learn together in the upcoming months. Thank you, and I think they, uh, and, uh, there wasn't anybody in that group that had met with Optimus or, or the folks from Optimus just yet. Um, so that might also have uh, contributed to, to some of that angst. Um, so the, the other piece I'm going to ask about is the measures of success. Um, so on page 432, there's uh, three areas that we measure are, are measures of success. And I'm wondering why isn't there any additional measures of success? There's readmission rate to the psychiatric hospital service for adult mental health consumers, and then post-custody clients and treatment services. Um, and then we have um, uh, schooling services, and this is just to increase families' knowledge, but there isn't. Sure, um, so those are just a, a handful of measures that we um, highlight in the budget book that we're tracking. Um, but really the presentation that we provided um, last month on our key performance indicators for our behavioral health system will be ones that we'll be looking at for the entire system. So more broadly, um, some of the things that we highlighted, penetration rates, um, you know, services that are being provided, 
um, access, timeliness, quality, all of those measures um, for our behavioral health services department will be um, you know, KPIs that we, we track beyond just the three measures of, of success that were indicated in, in the budget book. No, thank you for that. Um, but this is connected to, to our budget, right? And so I think it would be a great um, opportunity to marry those two and to reflect it um, in, in this budget statement that we have. Um, and it would be, uh, as much as I don't want to see additional pages to this packet, but I think it would be important to figure out exactly what that means um, because it, it would allow us to recognize what that target is in relation to the funding that's connected to it um, and whether the funding is, is getting increased or not getting increased. I think um, it's difficult to bring those two items together. Um, so it would be, I think for us, if, at least for me, a feature that I'd love to see in future budgets. Um, and, and, um, and I'd love to see a measure of success linked to suicides, um, prevention. That I don't think there's very much on, it's just a list of the, um, of the crisis and inpatient services here. But, but uh, I, I appreciate it and, and, and thank you for being so patient with me. And, and I, listen, I, uh, the, I take these opportunities to um, relay some of the message, some of the, what I'm hearing, the concerns that I'm hearing from, from our CBOs. Of course, I know that this is a two-sided coin. It's never, um, it's never uh, one, one side of, of the story um, that I'm being told. And so this is an opportunity for me to actually have this conversation with all of you, um, as well as um, to remind ourselves that, that there, is, that there is actual impact in our community with all the work that we do and, and, and how much I really appreciate all of what you do to continue to keep us healthy and strong and thriving. And so um, I, I appreciate that. Um, and then just on, on a different, completely different note, I, I actually want to uh, share with um, Supervisor Simidian um, about your quotes. You, you quoted Mike Tyson. Two years ago, I quoted Lizzo on the dais, and um, this had to do with equity, and, uh, and it was one of her, uh, one of her lyrics that says, um, why can't men, wh why are men great until they, they have to be, be great. great? So. Sorry, I just need the lyric. <laughs> why are men great until they have to be great? Mm -hmm. I'm okay. Anyway. I think are, I'll be silent. You? Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's, um, Move on to Supervisor Chavez. We are still on item 4D. Thank you. Um, so I thought if I could, I, I know um, Greta that you had, uh, along with um, our, our leadership, um, have been having conversations with our service providers. And I thought you might just give us an update broadly on where those discussions are before I raise the issues that I wanted to raise in this area. Sure, and I can um, maybe just start with a, a little bit of context, you know, the, as we've talked about, um, so I'll repeat a little bit, this is a truly seismic shift in the way that services are paid for by the state and therefore the way that we are gonna be paying for services. And so um, the process of figuring out how best to make the transition to this new rate structure, what those rates should be, the work that Sherry mentioned with the consultant was incredibly complex, incredibly time consuming on the behavioral health side, um, and then requires um, really significant incorporation and analysis of, by our CBOs upon release of those rates as to how they will um, adapt their mode and approach to service delivery while continuing to make sure that in partnership with behavioral health, we're maintaining this full spectrum of services, really robust access, and also trying to figure out how best to leverage the opportunities and mitigate the risks associated with this 
transition and there's there's both there's a lot of risk and a lot of opportunity um, and as Sherry mentioned you know a, a really significant uh, uh, challenge and opportunity is that the impact of these rates on the approach to service delivery, some of the facets of the way that our CBOs have been operating um, is really different. And so I think among the most um, productive recent components of the really deep engagement that's ongoing with our CBO partners is what Sherry mentioned, which is um, our, um, our, our CBO partners really wanted and needed some of the support that Optimus is currently providing to really help support their internal assessments of how these rates will impact um, their approaches to service delivery. And as Dr. Smith mentioned, for some, the current approach and, and way that they're delivering services, the cost associated with delivering their current service array, um, really is, um, I think, gonna create significant opportunities pretty, pretty much from the get-go. For others, it will be a more significant um, source of concern or challenge. And, um, what the Behavioral Health Department is already planning for and poised to do is to be doing really in-depth and ongoing assessment and partnership as we figure out what the specific challenges are. So there's sort of a whole array of things that we know could be on the horizon that can create challenges for specific partners. We expect um, that what the specific challenges may be may vary significantly provider to provider. What kind of support they may need from behavioral health may vary as well. Um, so Greta, so I'll, then, I'll pause. <laughs> no, no, listen, what I'm, what I'm really interested in is what's the array of supports? Because I, I hear what you're mm -hmm. saying, and there, and I heard what um, Supervisor Adenas was asking, and really just concretely, the steps we're going to take to be protective of the finances of the county and the finances of our nonprofit partners are what, what, and what that we have coming down the pike. Yeah, I, I'll, I can tell you some examples of what we're expecting may be the kinds um, of things that we may do in terms of support, but I think partly what I would just say at the outset is um, a challenge we're all facing, and this is something that I'm looking at Elisa right now, because she and I talked about this um, just a few days ago, is is that we we know that there's just some, some known unknowns, to quote right. someone else that we don't want to Right. Quote, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is one of them, but, um, but we know that, for example, we, we may face some significant technical challenges. We have um, electronic health record related challenges that are more prominent or less prominent for some of our CBOs. So the support we may need to ensure that there's a good interface between their EHR and our um, system through which they're going to be making claims that we then pay will be some of the support that we're gonna need to lean in on. There's been a very significant and challenging transition related to some of the um, electronic interfaces over the last few years that we know there's still more work to do on. Others may um, uh, you know, need support and training and staff development related to kind of getting their staff up to speed on the different mode of, of billing and some support there. Others may, um, just because of the mix of services they provide, have different challenges related to covering all of the um, costs and service types that they provide. So those are examples. So um, what, I, what I would ask is if we could get, before final budget, an off-agenda report, actually before we hear your budget again, that just explains the framework and the, the approach that the staff is recommending be taken and that that be concrete. And I, I just wanna reinforce one point that you raised, Greta, which I think is, is a very fair point, which is our nonprofits are very different sizes. They're providing really different services and will have different challenges based on how deep their back of house is and a number of other issues. So I think that the array and that we're prepared to respond is really what is one big component of the concerns that people have. And I, and I think, you know, these are challenging experiences. And when we're dealing with, you know, financial health, cash flow, and it's something we're worried about too. I mean, I think Greg talked to us about our own cash flow that we wanna make sure that we're just very prepared and that the, the, um, all of our partners understand under what circumstances we're prepared to take what action is I think a big piece of it. Um, is that is that an, a comfortable request? 
I think it is. We um, will we'll also, you know, we'll do the best that we can to kind of hit all of the points, but also just speak more generally to how we're thinking about some of the things that we may not have um, expected that may arise and how we're looking at that. And I would just reiterate um, one piece, which is, you know, this, this is going to be a, a challenging time, and there is deep commitment on the part of county administration to partner with our provider community because, as Dr. Smith said, they are um, so central to the volume of services that we need to provide the community. They are the, the array of services that we provide, and so we, we do absolutely need to figure out ways to not only support their current service array, but really support expanded service, and we think that this um, change at the state level really has the capacity to do that if we get it right, but it's gonna take some and again, time. Big work in progress. I, I absolutely understand that. I think what's challenging is to not know what what are the uh, approaches that we anticipate? They're not all going to be 100% accurate. What are we preparing for in terms of risk mitigation for all parties? And making that concrete and direct is really what would be helpful. It would be helpful for me too because I think the point that um, Supervisor Adenas raised, you know, the contractors know their their ins and outs very deeply. I know. <laughs> Um, Greta, you are learning that more than maybe you, well, actually, I know you've been a, a leader in this area for much of your um, career here, so I think between you and, you know, um, you know, the leadership at Behavioral Health, that just knowing that would be helpful. Okay, so that's one. Um, two, uh, I want to just talk about one of the challenges that I did not see reflected here um, to the degree I anticipated and that is how we are working on increasing access to drug and alcohol services. And if it's on a page here and I missed it, I apologize. I, I brought my whole binder. I am ready. You just send me to the page. Uh, thanks for the uh, question, Supervisor Chavez. Um, there are uh, several ways in which we are um, representing um, in, you know, uh, support services for substance use treatment services, uh, one being through um, uh, the ARPA funds. And so there are certain specific uh, supports that we'll be providing around uh, substance use residential services. Um, uh, the access points through call center are really intended to help uh, increase access to such services um, the other um, area that we're focused in on um, is um, ensuring through uh, conversations with our providers, and we're, we're scheduled to meet with them later this week, um, to really explore opportunities, one, to um, ensure that all current occupancy is being utilized. Um, so there are um, certain you know, concerns that they've expressed related to access, things that we're going to be working out with them collectively to ensure that um, we're able to increase access to already supported services and contracts. So it's truly maximizing what we currently have and at the same time uh, building additional supports. Um, the other piece of information that we're, we're still waiting on to, um, which the board is aware of, is the RAND study, which will also provide um, recommendations related to um, needs uh, around treatment beds for, for our substance use treatment services. So um, I, I think um, what, what I'm concerned about is that the RAND study, uh, and, and I, again, I apologize if it's in here. You can absolutely point the page out. It won't, make, won't, won't offend me or anything. Uh, I, what I can't see is where we have resources set aside for the outcome of the RAND study. I'm happy to speak to that, Supervisor. Oh, thank so you. A couple, and, I, and I'll just augment a little bit of what um, Sherry said. One is, you know, one thing that doesn't show up as much budgetarily but is really significant to the expansion of access to substance use treatment is something that um, has been talked about a bit um, before, which is really making sure the maximum number of staff are trained to do both substance use treatment as well as mental health for folks who have co-occurring, which is such a huge need in our system. Um, but in terms of pre preparation for the RAND study, there's a recommendation in the CIP to set aside $12.6 million 
in capital funding to support investments in, in facility expansion, and that would include not only mental health facility expansion, but substance use treatment expansion, and actually in particular, um, knowing how significant the gap between what we perceive to be the need for substance use treatment and what is the reality of really significant lack of access, not only in our county, but across the state to the level of substance use treatment capacity that's needed. We definitely expect that that will be an area of significant investment going forward. The other thing I'll mention is um, we're also looking to really um, advocate for greater reimbursement too for certain types of substance use treatment at the state level. There's been um, the interface, and, and there's others who can speak to this with much more precision than I can, but the interface between the medical array of services handled by our medical system of care and where the behavioral health system of care interfaces um, is a really challenging point um, in terms of medical reimbursement. And so we also are looking at strategies to really advocate for increased focused investment at the state level that also facilitates greater um, provision of those um, deeper end services across the board throughout the state. The reason I'm raising this issue is that I believe that we have been um, behind the eight ball, so to speak, because we don't have enough cliches today, but um, <laughs> behind the eight ball really for years and years and years in terms of our investment in, in SUTs. I just, we haven't done it, we haven't prioritized it, and and I, I think with the board talking about behavioral health, we're at least my interpretation of that has been we want to be inclusive in terms of addressing all of these issues. And let me just make this point um, to you, uh, Sherry, is that this, this is a generational issue. This isn't a current leadership of, this, of the behavioral health department. So I, I just want to be clear that I'm, this is not me um, saying taking you to task per se. I think it's been us not being in it, and, and I will also just acknowledge that it's been complicated to fund forever. All that said, um, when the RAND study comes, there are two different products that I'd want to see. I, I really want to understand how we're strengthening um, access to SUTs in the current budget separate of the RAND study. Like, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I will weave through it and find it again, but I really want to be able to understand this is fundamentally the investments that we're going to be making, and these are what they look like, or strategies or changes, because I, I think it's just so, so, so critical. And then the second is I recognize the RAND study is going to be important, and what I hope that study demonstrates is to your really important point, Sherry, that I really hadn't, hadn't I had taken my eye off this part of the ball, which is your point about making sure that we're using the system to its maximum capacity. And a point that, that I'll just reinforce is that part of the reason I've been so interested in how long the waiting lines are to what services is because I, I'm curious about that same question, including the operational changes that we need to make. So I think you're right to kind of take the problem on from multiple um, perspectives. Um, but first thing we really need to see in this budget, separate of the RAND study, what are we doing that really is going to enhance and increase our resources and you know, that includes medical detox and social detox. I don't know how many more times we need to vote on it, but we can. We can vote again if that helps, but th those should be included already in this budget, separate of that RAND study. So I would include that in the, in the motion as a product. And then the, the second point, the second question I want to ask is this, and you may have already sent this to us, so I apologize. I, I had asked for us to get um, an off-agenda report, and I, Sherry, I really do think you sent this already, um, about what nonprofit partners were helping us with hard-to-serve clients, particularly adults, whose contracts have we enhanced, and what are the results of those enhanced contracts? Um, did you send that to us already? Supervisor, can I chime in? I actually checked on the status of that today, so I may have even more updated oh. information than Sherry. <laughs> than um, Dr. Trejo, that's um, funny. Uh, 
Brian Darrow in the county executive's office is working with Yvonne Lai and Behavioral Health to gather and organize that information. And um, the estimate that he gave me on when that would be coming back to the board, I think there have been some prior referral responses that touched it, but per your comments at a couple of recent board meetings, we wanted to make sure that we've gathered all the information that we think is responsive to your request, provide that, and then see if there were some things that are missing from that assessment or different than what you had anticipated. And he estimated that that would be coming to the board in June, so um, soon, but, but a, um, a, a further response to that request and with more detailed information. So one request that I would make is that um, if we could, even if the whole report isn't done, that should be presented concurrent with the RAND study prior to the budget vote. And the reason is that this goes back even to the discussions you're having with our service providers right now about what lines of service are they going to be able to provide given the new changes in the, um, you know, in how they're reimbursed. So I, even if it slides, we really shouldn't be voting on the budget or looking at the RAND study absent those. Because if, in fact, we haven't pursued that at the level that we need to, I don't know. Um, and if we don't have enough of our nonprofit partners that have bought in, that should absolutely be part of the negotiations we're having right now. And that's the reason I'm pressing on this is that I, I genuinely don't have any idea where we are in that process. And frankly, if we don't have a part of our system that can support those who are hard to serve, who are on the street right now, that we could walk outside and and see, um, then then we have a, a hole in the donut that we just need to say this is our hole in the donut because I think those folks are our responsibility. So that's that's why I'm pressing on this so specifically right now because we have so much moving that we should absolutely not pass up an opportunity to address this in a more concrete way. Thank you. I will check on um, the uh, RAND study um, is uh, plan to come back to the board on June 6th, and so I will see if we can align um, when we're able to come back to the board with the information you've requested here with that report. Thank you, and I'll include that also in the motion if the maker is Accepted. comfortable. Yeah. And then my last question, um, is Sherry, has to do with the screening that's happening for, for children for mental health screening. And I have learned that we are taking a, an, a, a new tack to make sure that we're screening third graders and in partnership with some of our nonprofit partners and that we are doing, uh, so l let me just say what the off agenda request I wanna make is, I'm interested in how the pilot program stacks up to the Healthier Kids Foundation program and just concretely why one path over another. And colleagues, the reason I'm raising this is that um, my understanding of the pilot is that it's a it's for <coughs> focused on third graders, that there's an opt-in kind of opt out, I'm not sure I understand that, but that it's a written a written um, Dr. Smith. That item is under number sixteen on your agenda today. Oh, is it so the I next have section? A presentation. Oh, about perfect. It. I'll stop and I'll wait for that. Thank you. We we have bled a little I'm bit um, into items fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen. But I hear your um, the distinction that I tried to make, Supervisor Chavez, was between the current budget and expanding services. But you're you're exactly right that they they do meld because we don't want to miss this opportunity. We do want to use um, whatever. Um, leverage and dollars and possibilities that we have now for this current budget. But we, we are going to talk about that um, considerably more in uh, Th Then I'll in hold 15. off. And President, okay. what I was trying to use was the, um, the, the um, budget book. And mm -hmm. it's, it just doesn't have as much information. And so I didn't know. Right. May I ask one last question? The Aspire program, is this a contract with El Camino? Yes, it is. And again, what I would say is that it's a it's a really it's a great program, but in our um, in the budget book, it's not clear that it's just it's just not clear that the um, 
that, that that's our partner. And so I didn't know if we were actually taking it on ourselves. And so, but I'm, I'm really appreciated. I think that's a, a very well regarded uh, program. And the expansion looks like it will make it available to more, um, more lower income families. Is that accurate? Yes, it was traditionally provided to commercially insured um, patients and through a referral by Supervisor Sumidi, and we were able to expand the services to be provided to Medi-Cal beneficiaries. That explains why he's vibrating. Like, he's like, yay! I could hear him, see him out of the corner of my eye. Um, and then the downtown clinic, this is the, the, um, the, a, new, a different version of what we did have with Alcove. Uh, there... Oh, I'll come back. I'll find it in my pages. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just um, kind of re reset us a little bit. We are um, still on 14D, um, which should respond directly to the recommended budget. I believe both Supervisor Lee and Supervisor Simidian are wishing to speak. We're then going to hear 14E and 14F, and we will evaluate at what time... Um, Based on the time that we reach 14F, um, we will likely take a dinner recess there and come back and do the three special session items. If, if, uh, if we have a little bit of extra time before we need to break for dinner, then what I'd like to do is um, look at items 16 and 17 and hold 15 for after the dinner break. Was that all clear as mud? Mm-hmm. All right, Supervisor Lee, then Supervisor Sumidian on this item, 14D. Thank you. Um, so a uh, couple of short questions. First is, if I look at the budget book on page 430, there's a list of the substance use treatment specific services. Uh, what I did not see is regarding the mobile so that's van that we talked about the last meeting. I guess that was such a new referral, we're not adding it yet, but assuming this actually get approved in the future, that will be one of those things that will be added here, correct? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, second one is regarding the some numbers. Um, on page 441, under the maintain um, the psych emergency response team, the, the PERT team, uh, of the $1.3 million for the allocate ongoing funding, on it, it says ongoing net savings of $1.3 million dollars. But what it really says is that really is increasing the MHSA fund transfer of the 1.3 million. Is that saying to me that initially we have budgeted general funds to pay for the 1.3 million, but now we're able to get the MHSA to pay for it? That's why it becomes a savings. Um, actually, it was initially a um, Mental Health Services Act innovation project, and so now it would be funded through a different part of MHSA, not innovation, because it's sunsetting in the mm. innovation component and would be funded through, uh, I think, either CSS or PEI and MHSA. So this is more like a left-hand transfer to right-hand, that's all this is? Correct. Right. Okay, thank you. And then my last question <clears throat> is relating to the uh, suggested deletion of the four uh, psych so, uh, social worker vacancies there. Uh, so currently, it looks like there are f nine vacancies currently, and therefore the suggestion here is delete the four positions. Uh, I mean, certainly, I think that our <clears throat> increased unhoused population dealing with psych and emotional conditions, alcohol and drug use is, is very significant, and there's no shortage of need. Uh, this seems to me more of a uh, paper drill because of the fact that we aren't hiring these positions fast enough, as earlier mentioned by Dr. Smith. So I guess my better question really should be, uh, what exactly are we doing so that we could at least get those five that's left out deletion would be hired as soon as possible? Sure, I was just gonna ask you to confirm what your understanding is of approximately the number of vacant psychiatric social worker positions you have across the department, or if not, we can get back to you. I don't, because uh, I, we'll, we'll I, I do think it's a larger number, but um, I, was, I was gonna just turn it over to you to talk about really just sort of the dearth of people with that qualification out in the community, which is one of our biggest challenges um, in addition to, to doing the aggressive efforts on hiring. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we've been sharing um, through our uh, monthly public health crisis updates um, our efforts around recruitment of psychiatric social workers. And uh, to Greta's point, um, some of the specific skills that we're seeking, um, you know, in an, a licensed experienced clinician 
um, is quite challenging for us. Um, in the most recent recruitment um, of PSWs, thinking back two months ago, uh, we received 18 applications, and of the 18, um, two were licensed. So, you know, we're continuing to face the challenges that uh, the CCPs also share um, related to being able to hire staff. Um, but we're continuing to do, you know, specialized recruitments and trying to prioritize that for our system. But I'm happy to get back to you with the specific number of vacant PSW positions that we have. It's, it's constantly moving, but I can certainly um, find that before our next session. I mean, the bottom line to me is you need to A, get those positions filled. B is if you actually get those positions filled, I absolutely want you to come back to us about getting those four or whatever number back so that we could actually get the right number to serve our community because obviously we're very under, um, uh, under uh, uh, manpower-wise in terms of that position. So please let us know. Sure. Um, you, you okay. Mike. Dr. Smith says she could, he could do it. Psychiatric social workers' uh, positions are in behavioral health and custody health, and there are currently a total of 276 vacant positions. Okay, and, and I guess it really the question is, what exactly any type of extra steps that we can do uh, potentially uh, maybe even bounty programs of uh, funding and whatnot in order to get more people to apply. I would love to find out that, uh, Dr. Smith, since it's such an uh, urgent uh, need. Um, and this is something you can get back to us uh, in the off agenda in the future, please. Yes. Thank you. And that's all I have. Supervisor Simidian on 14D. Thank you. I, I, I just cannot resist revisiting the Aspire uh, issue since it has come up. Uh, in part because my recollection, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this, but my recollection is that it was the first time in the state that the program had been made available to Medi-Cal uh, eligible uh, community members when we first initiated it. What's it been, half dozen or more years ago now? That's correct, Supervisor. Yeah, and you know, I, I think it's a good example. <clears throat> now I'll quote Jerry Brown. Uh, <laughs> Great company, Jerry Brown, Mike Tyson, and Lizzo. There you go. Um, you know who used to occasionally use a word that doesn't exist called we need. He'd say we have to tangibilitize these issues, and, and it's a very Jerry Brown word. And and on Medicist, excuse me, not on Medicist, on um, Aspire, uh, and the partnership with Medi-Cal. Um, you know, we have a lot of conversation at this dais about what it means to look at things through an equity lens. What it meant to me in that case was that we had this program that was serving young people in need, but not serving young people from families of lower income. And that there had to be a way to make that work. And colleagues, what I will tell you is, and this will not surprise any of us, I don't think, when you say, gee, let's see if we can find a way for El Camino's systems to harmonize with Santa Clara County's systems to harmonize with state systems, that is not a small challenge. But thank you again, people got there. And as a result, you know, what was a, and still is, in my understanding, a highly regarded service um, was made available to folks who previously just hadn't been eligible for the program. And that's kind of what I think you know, our conversations should translate into in terms of real tangible benefit out there in, in the community. Um, and then, you know, there was some hiccups, I gather, when they uh, got um, re-upped. Re and where we are now is to sort of an attempt to expand even further. Yes, can you sort of, I, I want to just borrow down, I don't have the same uh, binder book in front of me, I have my, other yes, binder. it's to um, essentially uh, continue the Aspire program and to ensure that um, our Medi-Cal beneficiaries, as you've stated, have access to the same program that was primarily available to those with commercial insurance. And, and it's, it's and, been a very valuable service for those that have received it, and so we want to be able to continue that service. And it's at the same level of participation then, um, or is it I would have sort to get of dependent? Is it dependent on just who applies, or I mean? Are, um, 
let me, if you don't mind, I can certainly get back to you and let you know if that's if there's an increase or if it's essentially maintaining the the same level of service. All right, thank you. If we could fold into the mega motion uh, the uh, request for uh, an off agenda report, that would be great. Thank you. Certainly. I accept. All right, thank you all. Um, with that, we will move on to 14E. Thank you very much, Sherry. You held up quite well. Uh, item E is the recommended budget for emergency medical services. And good okay. evening, Jackie. Okay, for the emergency medical services budget, the recommended budget is $8.4 and the only uh, action is to delete the vacant position, one vacant position to address the structural deficit. Next slide, please. And at this point, uh, comments Jackie's from my here. colleagues on this item, EMS. Going once, going twice. All right. Um, moving then to item. 14F, which is the recommended budget for Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Thanks, Jackie. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. The recommended budget for the Santa Clara Valley uh, Healthcare is a total uh, appropriation of $3.48 billion, and it adds resources to support the increased inpatient census. To, uh, for the quality insurance uh, program, supporting language services, expanding the rehabilit rehabilitation therapy services, augmenting pharmacy services, expanding services at O'Connor uh, Center Force Clinic, establishing the Women's Urgent Care Clinic, and proving timeliness of payments and reimbursements. Next slide, please. Uh, enhancing support for the behavior health compliance needs. It does transfer three. Uh, project manager positions to facilities fleet, that's a net zero cost. And just to note, the general fund investment would be 473 million with the recommended budget, and it deletes vacant positions to address the structural budget deficit and to minimize that uh, general fund investment. And for the Maddie uh, services, it's, you know, it's a, a small budget, 1.5 million, you know, maintains the current level budget. Next slide, please. Uh, Greg, will you okay. note for a public or anyone who doesn't know what Maddie is, please? No. Oh. Actually. I can give you that. Okay, thank you. Um, a number of years ago, the state passed a uh, bill, SB 12, which uh, required um, some funding be collected by each county uh, and the state in order to pay physicians and health systems for uninsured care. The um, process continues, however, it's much more weak than it used to be, so um, it's very basically a carryover for our budget. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And I see Renee is here to help answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you. I will Can I look, jump in? I will look to Dr. Smith. Uh, one of the questions that I've received from all board members and the public has to do with clinical nurse uh, positions that are being recommended for deletion. So I wanted to give you some numbers to let you know um, that we're not um, disabling the system at all. Um, what we started with is uh, 343 positions and 303 FTEs, so some of those are part-time positions as of April 30th. <clears throat> the recommended budget so far, and by so far I mean we're in the process of reassessing, so this probably will change by the time we get to June, but so far the recommendation is to uh, delete 60 positions from a combination of custody health and uh, the hospital system for 54.9 FTEs. That means that there remain on the books 283 positions that are funded and unfilled 
and that totals out to 248.3 FTEs. So there's plenty of positions left to be hired to. So just wanted to start that off since I know that's a concern. Thank you. I'll look down the aisle and hold my comments. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, um, thank you. And um, again, I, I just want to urge that when we have budget discussions for both um, Valley Medical Center and BHP that we, we are aligning those with whatever our business plans are in the future. Um, but on that note, um, I, I wanted to better understand the, um, the budget issue relative to the urgent care clinic for women. And um, in it, I, I'm, I'm just not sure I understand that the, the um, addition uh, and and my my complimentary question to that urgent care issue is, do, in this environment, um, given the type of services that are provided, are we also able to provide services to um, women who are experiencing uh, pre or postpartum depression as part of this urgent care clinic? And if so, how do those services um, get provided to those? those individuals. Yes, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Supervisor Chavez, uh, thank you for the question. That's the one position we're adding, if you, if you see it on your budget book, uh, that we're establishing the, uh, the urgent care clinic in, in South County to increase the emergency room capacity there. Uh, because as you duly noted in prior meetings, as well as Supervisor Arenas, uh, that's been a facility that's been heavily impacted uh, as a result of not only what's happening with Hawkins and San Benito, but also obviously the surge that we've had in terms of demand for care and services. Uh, generally speaking, we have the, the pre and postpartum care. Uh, I've, it, 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 it takes different forms depending whether they're a cover live, delegated fully to us, which means that FHP goes to VHP and then it comes to VMC and of course we're providing the primary care. So as part of the timely prenatal care, we would do the prenatal uh, assessments that includes uh, anxiety, depression, other kinds of uh, mental health conditions. Uh, that obviously it's integrated into electronic health record uh, so that it's a much better experience for the, the uh, not just the woman but any patient uh, so that the inpatient staff uh, whether it be in the ED or within the acute hospital setting, already knows what's been uh, done or provided uh, in terms of the care. And then, of course, postpartum, that in the hospital setting, we're cognizant of it. But most importantly, where the gaps exist in the healthcare industry is when they go home in the postpartum. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, this takes many different forms, uh, as, as you probably know. Uh, it, in some cases, depression, in some cases, is, is, is other kinds of uh, uh, mental health uh, conditions. So one of the things that, that we're doing is to make sure that we have the community supports uh, that happen in the community, because even though we may schedule them for the follow-up visit and care at our primary care centers and our Valley Health Centers, um, the, there's the community support that's so important in terms of their own home situation. I think that's that's the one area that we're, we identify as a greatest need and gap uh, that we have to address. In terms of the, the urgent care facility and the need for urgent care services in our ED departments, we, we're looking at not only expanding our capacities but also training staff so that in fact uh, not only it's tracked in the medical record but also it's actually part of the ongoing care that they're provided while they're waiting to be taken care of. So I, I, think, um, I think this idea around the, um, the urgent care, and I think particularly in South County, is yeah. really, really needed. Correct. One request that I would make uh, formally of our health care system is to, um, to give an assessment to the county of the program that El Camino is doing around um, postpartum and I think prepartum depression, and it, it is a—it's really an incredible uh, program, and it's one that that I, I think we we 
we may need to consider as we're looking at expanding services. And I think your point about the gap is a very, it's very meaningful and very real. Uh, but I'm, what I'm also just interested in understanding is whether or not it requires an additional set of activities at our facilities or whether or not there's a way to um, allow for patients that are with, you know, that, that are lives that are delegated to us to be able to access those other services. Um, so that, that would be, if that could be part of the um, motion, I think that would yes. be an important next step. Thank yes, you. thank you. And then another issue that I've, I um, have been curious about is when we have medical social workers that are working with patients who are, um, I know we have a program, for example, that when somebody's been shot or stabbed, right. that we have medical social workers that are, that are interfacing with them presumably right away because this is an opportunity for us to um, engage them in, in other services. I've actually never seen a report of how effective that is, how many people are working on it, um, and how, if at all, it's connected to the work um, relative to behavioral health. Mm -hmm. Could we get an off agenda that just describes, because now we've had a few years under our belt, I would just be curious about how we're connecting that to other services. I think it probably is impactful for both youth and adults. Yeah. Um, but I, I have no idea of how we're doing or what we're doing. No, absolutely. What, what we can do is we could give you an update. In fact, uh, as you duly re remember, that was one of those gang prevention, violence prevention projects. I remember, projects yes. I think it was my. Exactly. Yeah, it was and one we of were my doing reports. regular reports. We were doing regular reports. Uh, after, after a while, it just becomes institutionalized practice. Uh, and we can give you an update in terms that of would the be annual great. numbers. Yes. And part of the reason I'm interested in understanding it is just wanting to uh, um, better understand how that's connected to the other services we're providing mm -hmm. right. and whether or not um, there are partner organizations that, that we should be engaging to do longer term um, supports for those, uh, those people that we're talking about, especially as we're thinking about violence prevention because that's a really important part of the cycle of violence um, is being able to get folks out of it. And then, um, and then two additional questions. One is, um, I know that we have incredible therapeutic services for people who, um, who need them relative to rehabilitation. One issue that, I've, that has been raised for me is that when we're moving people out of our rehabilitation therapy services, that insurance doesn't necessarily cover what's required for them at their homes. Is that accurate? Yes. Uh, one of the gaps that we have, of course, we have a best-in-class acute rehab facility, and, and that's the one you support it uh, through the addition of the Sobrato uh, Pavilion and the facility, a brand-new facility, state-of-the-art. Uh, the gaps that, that happen in terms of insurance coverage is what happens when we release that individual. They may need some ongoing care that's not necessarily a skilled nursing facility type of care or a subacute care facility, but it definitely requires some home uh, follow-up. That's the gap that we identify. Generally speaking, is the insurance company's responsibility to provide that care at that home. But what we hear directly from uh, our patients uh, that, that identify that gap is that the insurance companies are not making themselves responsible for that. They say, well, our, our benefit, it only covers X number of acute rehab days, and that's what you already got. I think that's the biggest gap that we uh, understand. It's, it's happening within that population. Some of it is gonna be addressed by the subacute facility we're building at uh, Morgan Hill uh, to address specifically somebody that needs a little bit more extended care that's not mm -hmm. acute rehab necessarily, but uh, it's ongoing supportive nursing care. Uh, but there's still the other gap, which is what happens when they go home. I would be interested in, um, from both VHP, really VHP and Family Health Plan, getting their assessment of how our, our insurance products that we have do or don't cover um, needed modifications to homes or, or workplaces or transportation. Right. I think that would be important for the board to understand for two reasons. One, this may be a, a place that we need to really partner with the Valley Medical uh, Center Foundation. And if so, how do we do that? 
Um, and then the other is, as we're doing our advocating and lobbying and all that, and I'm thinking about that because um, I see uh, 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 David Campos here, that that may be something as we're continuing to uh, work with our insurers to cover, that we, re that we can quantify that need, like really do this, the research it takes to say, here are the number of uh, in, you know, folks that we have that have been um, in our care, because frankly, if, if we are, end up putting them in a higher level of care because they can't go back home, that's just kind of silly in terms of spending dollars. So I would love to get an assessment from our team so we can use it legislatively and we can use it as it relates to raising money um, with our community partners. No, absolutely. We, obviously, we heard you loud and clear about the business plan for Valley Health Plan. I think this is one of those areas where, where there's a real opportunity uh, for strengthening the partnerships. I, I think it's now Family Health Plan, FHP, under Calium, has full risk for skilled nursing facilities. So what's important, That's this great. is beginning this year. So now, of course, they're going to be incentivized to look at more cost-effective ways, whereas before it was fee-for-service and it was a state to skilled nursing facility relationship, now the local initiative, in this case FHB, is full risk for skilled nursing facility. So they're going to be incentivized, I think, to look at partners that actually can not only assume this risk but develop capacities to do it on a more cost-effective manner. We'll incorporate that as part of the updating of the business plan for Valley Health Plan, and then of course for the whole health. You know health what? System. Actually, Renee, that's incredibly good news. Yeah. Because you're right. We had, that's been such a gap for so long. That's really, really good news. Um, and then my last question on the. Uh, let me just look really quick. So. As it relates to further um, construction activity uh, that, that we're considering, is any of that construction activity tied to our anticipated changes in CalAIM outside of the skilled nursing facilities? Yes. Uh, it's a, it's a, of course, we have a lot of construction activity. As you can imagine, everything from uh, new ambulatory care centers to, to the site building as well as uh, uh, the adolescent and child and adolescent, I want to make sure I, I captured that correctly, uh, given my chair civilian's uh, insistence in terms of characterizing that correctly. I don't want to get knocked out by Tyson left hook here. Uh, I want to make sure that, that as an adolescent uh, adult facility, psychiatric, obviously that's a big gap in our community. It's a big uh, uh, issue, not only for our behavioral health system, but also for, for the general community, mostly on the commercial side. So. Some of these facilities are very much linked to expanding access and capacity, uh, which is part of CalAIM's overall goal, which is not only improving access and quality, but also making sure that we have the capacities in local counties to, to provide the care that's necessary by the population. Thank you, that's very helpful. And um, colleagues, I apologize for this last request, but I am very interested in prior to us voting on a final budget, knowing how much money you have for um, com community, uh, you know, communications. And I don't mean just the press people, I mean like how much are we spending to tell the story of Valley Medical Center? I know we've taken some votes, in fact, I think we took one during 2020 that still hasn't been implemented, and that was intended, or in 2021, it was intended to make sure that the community understood the role that Valley Medical Center and the health department and the county played relative to um, to COVID-19. And I, I mean, I even remember the exact amount, and it never moved anywhere, and we didn't use it yet. So I am interested in how much is being set aside for communications and what is the plan to spend it uh, prior to the um, final vote on the budget. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian. I want to briefly, underscore briefly, revisit the conversation from yesterday about <clears throat> what some people call the subsidy of the hospital system and what others call an investment. <clears throat> Just so you know, I've been listening. And, and um, I, I don't think we're going to untangle this pretty big tangle today. I actually don't think we're going to untangle this pretty big tangle even through the budget process in the next month or two. But I do have one 
sort of specific question, which is, you know, we're, we think we're post-pandemic and, you know, we're sort of right-sizing the organization and, you know, trying to figure out what the new normal is and now, you know, I've got a few more cliches there as well. But my, my question, my serious question is, given the proposed increase in the subsidy, um, you know, what, what will VMC be doing in the coming year to rein in costs uh, and um, to reduce our long-term liabilities? Because, you know, these are obviously annual and recurring expenditures. So I'm... Yes, and, and if I may regress for a while, uh, and I'll share a, a story that I know that Dr. Smith knows very well, because when I, he hired me in 2012, there was a public discussion about building a firewall between VMC's you know, increasing general fund obligation and, of course, crowding out other needs uh, out there in terms of general government. And at that point in time, during my first conversation after hiring, uh, I asked Dr. Smith, I said, what is your target for general fund? Because that's the way I operated in San Diego. Uh, he, he looked astonished at me, and he said, nobody has asked me that question ever before. Uh, and then I said, well, that's, that's a metric that I take seriously. It's part of our fiscal stewardship. Uh, and as you know, he indicated 10%. He's been pretty consistent all the way through uh, during his tenure here in the county of Santa Clara. Uh, of course, at that point in time, we were about 20 to 25 uh, percent, and I said, "Well, I'm going to I'm going to need some time, uh, Dr. Smith, to make sure that your investment in us is actually not only merited, uh, but we can perform under national health reform." So this is something that Paul Lorenz, the the executive and management team at VMC, are very conscious of uh, that we want to make sure that not only we increase our capacity to serve others but we do it in a fiscally sound manner. And you saw some of the numbers dropping all the way to 4% at a certain point in time. Of course, it's creeping up. A lot of the creep up that we see over the last uh, couple of years is COVID. Uh, we had a lot of expenditures that are not necessarily reimbursed by insurance companies or even FEMA at this point in time. Uh, but that was part of our response and success here in the county of Santa Clara. And then of course, uh, the well-deserved increases for the labor force. I think those are things that we're going to be looking to contain in the future. Uh, we, we, we strive to maximize every possible revenue, uh, whether it be at the federal or state level, so that, in fact, you have the opportunity to invest and spend in other areas that are just as critically important for, for the residents of the community. Let me add a little bit more to that. Um, if you look at the numbers <clears throat> statewide, <clears throat> we as a county have been maximizing our eligibility for and therefore our uh, earning of supplemental revenues to a great extent, uh, greater than I think any other county percentage-wise. Um, as you saw from the um, business plan, fundamentally there's two ways that we generate revenue in the hospital. One is in the outpatient world where we get paid per visit uh, for Medi-Cal and Medicare patients and fee-for-service for others. And one is in the hospital where we get paid a daily rate um, for Medi-Cal, Medicare, and a daily rate for private sector. In the hospital, the cost is quite high and higher than the reimbursement. In the clinics, since we're FQHC qualified, um, if we can increase the number of cases that we see, we therefore generate significant new revenue. Now, that doesn't mean rushing through, case, through visits what it means is people who are waiting to be seen out in the community who've called and are on waiting lists to get in or have been refused uh, because of um, not getting an appointment over the phone. If we can get them in to be seen, which is good quality of care and certainly population health 
driven, we can expand our revenue significantly. And um, that's why we've been talking uh, quite a bit about trying to get more vacancies in our appointments in order to be seen. <coughs> so when you ask what's the strategy, the strategy is primarily an outpatient care strategy. Thank you. I'm um, hopefully going to wrap up this item with, with just a couple of questions. And Dr. Smith, they're um, re well related to what you, you and Renee um, both noted. Um, I really appreciated, first of all, the updates in the, in the measures of success and the business plan to show the link between hospital system priorities and financing, and again, with thanks to Supervisor Chavez for making sure that we linked those. Um, and it's, it's particularly important as we grapple with significant increases in expenditures in the health system and the resulting impacts on the general fund to Supervisor Simidian's uh, point. Among the measures of success, non-acute inpatient days reaching 10% this year um, really stood out to me, and I'm, I'm interested to know the, the three things, and I'll, I'll share them all at once. The proportion of the non-acute days for psychiatric versus medical patients, um, what the impact is of non-acute days on revenue, and, and of course, what's our strategy to bring down um, those number of non-acute days? No, absolutely. Uh Madam Chair, I mean, the biggest dilemma that we have as a public hospital system is we take patients that others would not, and we take care of them in ways that others are not willing. Uh, in this particular case, obviously, if you have a mentally ill psychiatric patient with a medical condition that comes through our uh, ED, uh, that, that's Valley Medical Center particularly because it's a level one trauma hospital system, uh, and we have obligations to discharge them in the community. We won't discharge them until we can ensure that there's a stable place for them or they're well taken care of on their own. Uh, that means that insurance companies are, you know, uh, whether it be even Medi-Cal in some cases, in terms of depending on, on who's insuring them, will not pay for the extended stay within a hospital setting. So those are administrative days uh, that are actually uh, either lower reimbursement or not reimbursed mm -hmm. at all. Right. Uh, it's uncompensated care costs uh, that we take on as part of our responsibility as a safety net provider. Uh, I think that's, that's a very delicate balance, as you know, because we want to be fiscal stewards in terms of the county uh, um, uh, purse and, and uh, funds, but yet on the other hand, we're mission driven, uh, and we want to make sure that those patients are not released like you see in the scandals in Skid Row and other places uh, where they're released and they're carrying their, their bloodlines and you know their, their patient uh, uh, clothing with them. So we want to make sure that we do that well. Uh, the, the discussion with related to the federal findings on CMS that we had very extensively with both uh, Chair Sabidian and Vice Chair Otto Lee was related to those kind of patients that mm -hmm. stayed within a hospital for very long extended uh, wait, you know, longer than anybody uh, should be in uh, provided for, but yet there's no alternative in the community for us to release them, and therefore we had uh, some critical incidents around that. So it's not only a cost on the finance side, but it's also, of course, an exposure risk for our own staff, our medical teams, as well as obviously the community, and we try the best to make sure that we're providing a safe place for them and that means in some cases that we're going to have higher administrative days. I so guess we, I th think that we need to really strategize about that because that that's maybe fine that we have to have them one place or another, but an acute hospital setting is one of the most expensive settings to keep them in. And as we think about the whether it's mental health. Um, facilities and step down for psychiatric patients or respite centers or, or other alternatives, I, I'm certain that there are less expensive alternatives, which uh, certainly are not turn people out in, the, out in the street. And I think that they, as we think about the strategic planning going forward, 
being able to keep that number down with alternative placement, I think, would be very important. Dr. Smith? I was just going to add, we can give you a point in time uh, set of numbers to answer your specific question about how many. Yeah. Great. However, I can tell you definitively that the percentage, you know, we have a lower number, you know, real number of psychiatric patients in the hospital, but the percentage of non-acute is higher, significantly higher than the non-acute medical patients. And we have been embarking upon a number of strategies, including buying beds in skilled nursing facilities and uh, looking at creating our own skilled nursing facilities. And as the board knows, mm -hmm. we've converted, um, physically are in the process of converting the DePaul campus into a skilled nursing facility. But uh, you're right, you know, there's been real challenges developing a workable strategy because the reimbursement is so poor for the skilled nursing facilities. And it causes significant problems for us, but we'll get you the numbers. Thank you. So I, I would add that request uh, to the motion. Uh, my other question, I think, is is more direct and hopefully, I mean, more more narrow. Um, at CFSC and at the January 10th board meeting, direction was given to expand the Healthy Steps model to the Gilroy and Milpitas pediatric clinics, and I I think I heard some uncertainty yesterday about whether that was that expansion was included in the recommended budget. Can, can you confirm, hopefully, that we are proceeding with that expansion in this upcoming fiscal year? Well, that, that's one of the things that we're looking into. <clears throat> I, we, we had it as part of the departmental uh, proposal. I, I think, as Dr. Smith indicated, uh, given the vacancy rates, uh, we're looking at replacing and swapping those those positions uh, so that, in fact, we have the capacity to expand the universal behavioral health screening. And that's one of the areas that we're working closely with Dr. Smith to come back in the June revised budget. I, I'm not sure I understand the swap. I, I know that the new proposal is expected to utilize the new um, Medi-Cal dyadic care benefit, and it, I would think that that would help us expand care and increase Revenue. So, I, well, the, I'm, but I'm, the staffing classifications are similar. So that's uh, that's what we're going to be working with the county executive in terms of the deletion of the vacant funded positions to make sure that we have. So this these capacity. programs will go ahead. That's and that's my what you're figuring out is which positions, which positions will yes. staff them. Correct. Yeah. But they will be in the budget. Okay, excellent. Um, we need to take public comment on item 14. Is that for another speaking point? Yes, Excellent. it is. I'll make it quick. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is regarding, uh, my comments have to do with um, a, a difference um, of funding based on what I heard earlier this year in February where we said, you know, we added the 27 FTEs um, of clinical nurses at St. Louis and um, on page 467, I see under uh, revenue and appropriation for expenditures, I see under St. Louis Hospital, there is a, a recommended um, 133 roughly um, base budget and under the recommended 23-24 it's 129 so it's a little less I think around four million dollar uh, difference and I'm wondering um, where those cuts are um, are those what 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 salaries are, are being cut well I think in this particular case uh, this is one of those areas where obviously we're very supportive uh, and, and thankful to, to the county executive for, for overwhelmingly supporting our proposal uh, because, as you know, we're, we're facing uh, a surge in demand, obviously, in St. Louis. And I think uh, our, our understanding with uh, the budget office is that as we ramp up our capacities, as we bring in the revenue associated uh, with those capacities, because many of these cases, patients have insurance and we take care of them and 
and we're hiring staff as we go along incrementally, that we'll be able to come back at the, at the future uh, meeting with, with the board to, to enhance our capacities to serve even more people, which means adding more positions. I'm sorry, I was distracted. Can you ask the question? Sure, again? I see the salary and benefits. Uh, uh, there's a reduction from the base budget and the recommended um, budget of roughly, I think, uh, four million. And I'm wondering where those, where that salary reduction is um, based on, since we just committed to increasing those, uh, sal not not the, just the salaries, but the FTEs at St. Louis earlier this year. We'll have to get back to you when we come back with the position report, because I can't tell you right off the top of my head. Thank you. Uh, and the, that was my question. Thank you, I, Supervisor Lee. Yes, um, actually, Dr. Smith has answered the, the question for me early on in the beginning oh, regarding how many uh, nurses that we have vacant positions versus how many being deleted, being 60 of the over 200 or so vacant positions we have. Uh, as we know, our nurses have been very short staffed in many areas with many of existing staff doing overtime with burnout, and that's a ongoing uh, problem that we have with these vacancies. Uh, I just want to get a, a assurance from administration that uh, A, we are absolutely doing everything to hire more nurses and not rely on the extra help as much, and B is that if we actually, after you know these adjustments, if we start running out of vacancies down the road, if we're fortunate enough to be there because of the fact that we're able to hire those positions, that please should come back to us so that we could actually allocate the funding to make those positions available to hire. Yeah. Let me uh, try to explain short. Is that what you said? Okay. Be quiet. Go right ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> President tells zero. me to be quiet. I'm not trying to be quiet. I'm just asking you if possible to be brief. Yes, I'll try to be brief. Um, first of all, uh, part of the reason why we have so many vacancies is because the vacancies are managed by the managers, the nurse managers individually in each different budget unit, and they manage them differently. Some of them save up vacancies. Some of them fill all their vacancies. You know, it's the manager is the person who does the hiring. <clears throat> and some of them are in the wrong place. They're in the wrong budget unit, have been in the wrong budget unit for a while. So what we're trying to do is get the positions into the right budget unit and get them hired and get rid of our registry nursing. Um, and so that's the intent. And we will definitely come back to the board to ask for more positions once we get the ones that we have close to being filled. Is that short enough? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Rhonda, do we have uh, public speakers on this item? In yes. chambers and on Zoom? Yes, we have two in person and currently six on Zoom. Okay, we will begin with uh, commenters who are in the chambers. After we hear all of the live public comments, we will go to public commenters on Zoom. If you are on Zoom and intending to participate, right now is the time to raise your virtual hand, please. We will keep the queue open until the first speaker on Zoom begins, and then we will close the queue. So again, if you want to speak, now is the time to raise your hand. And Rhonda, let's start with the folks in the chamber, please. And give me a sense of where we are with numbers. I think you just did, but remind me. Um, currently two in person, eight online. Was that what your question was? I'm sorry. That was my question. Um, All right. I'm wanting to see if that's going to go up, but that may take a few moments. So let's begin with two minutes each. If we hit a total of 15, then we're going to have to move to one minute. So right. we're hoping that if folks want to speak, they will raise their virtual hands now. Let's start with the folks in the chamber at two minutes each. All right, we have Ken Horowitz and Elisa Kopf Ginsburg in chambers. Come on up. Thank you, Ken Horowitz, uh, resident of District 5. Um, 
comments from myself and Mike Rogers, who's a resident of District 4. It's in the public comments under number three. Uh, we, are, we are recommending that you add to the uh, county executive's recommendation a, a, a training uh, pilot program of $50,000 that would go to the health and hospital system to train um, current physicians in integrated functional medicine. Uh, as part of your advisory commission, the Health Advisory Commission, we have uh, dealt with this particular issue that you've talked about throughout the four hours or so that you've been meeting today about prevention health. And we feel that the pilot that we brought forth to the Health and Hospital Committee back in December <coughs> will address some of these issues that you've been talking about, uh, focusing on prevention health. So we're hopeful that you will recommend in your budget in June a $50,000 um, proposal for this pilot to get started uh, in the health care system. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon or almost good evening. Um, I'm Elisa Kopp Ginsburg with the Behavioral Health Contractors Association. While I'm here to talk about CalAIM, I wanna be sure to acknowledge Dr. Smith for designating ARPA funding for recruitment and retention, retention of staff to address our workforce crisis. CalAIM and payment reform requires providers in the county to navigate substantial changes and to successfully do so without disrupting services involves a tremendous coordinated effort. The in-depth focus on behavioral health that we've heard today with open discussion of risks, what it takes to mitigate them, and um, what, is, um, excuse me, what it takes to mitigate them um, is emblematic of that kind of coordinated effort and essential to maintaining and, and growing services. I, I wrote this all as I was listening, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, supervisors, thank you for your engagement and your leadership. Uh, Greta, we, I really appreciate that you acknowledge um, the known and the unknown risks and to you and the Dr. Smith in the office and Sherry and her team to, for really partnering as we go through this seismic shift. It's bringing out these issues and talking about us that will really help. Um, we've had productive conversations related to contract language, but we haven't concretely addressed the need for guardrails. We urge you to designate in the budget funding and a clearly defined process to access the funds should a provider be impacted by technical problems, delaying billing, challenges related to models, or transition period. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving now to speakers on Zoom, and how many do we have? All right, it looks like we currently have seven, and it's been holding steady. All right, then we'll continue with two minutes, and when the first speaker begins, we'll close the queue at seven. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. Catherine, we've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Hedges. I live in uh, District 2 and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice. And um, I really appreciated the discussion of uh, how to improve our community mental health services. Uh, San Jose, unfortunately, has a terrible track record for police shooting people in crisis who call 911. And that's why non police responses such as trust, um, which I'm glad to hear you're expanding and Blackbird House are so very important. I know so my neighbors need a place like Blackbird House. I'm glad to hear that it's on the path to a Medi-Cal provider for a continued funding source. 
and when we have research as well as personal testimony from users that these peer-led community-based interventions are more effective than locked inpatient facilities, as well as far cheaper, we owe it to our neighbors to provide the support they need for their mental health needs. Likewise, we need radical expansion of same-day detox. Um, I hear so much that, you know, if people went to, they wanted that. And if they have to wait for months, what's going to happen in the meantime? It's not like they're just, I don't know, waiting to get their teeth cleaned or something. Um, and I appreciate the tone of the discussion today and uh, yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Paul, we've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. First of all, I want to acknowledge Catherine Hedges. Uh, see, I really appreciate it. She's on point. She understands the issues, and she's a consistent participant in both city and county government meetings. So I just want to thank her for advocacy. Um, I, the RAND Corporation uh, document is going to reflect precisely what I've been saying all along to the detox beds, residential treatment, and THU deficiency. Um, we relied on the prison system in order to just lock up people. That's how we're going to deal with it. We're going to send them to prison, and then they're going to acquire mental health issues that were latent but ignited as a result of putting a bunch of people with issues into one particular system. And then when they get released, when those symptoms start to surface within the context of their relationships or their attempts to integrate back into the community, we're going to slam them again for that. And so you're going to see this in this brand region uh, uh, document. You're also going to 17 detox beds for a population of 0.8 million in Santa Clara County. That is disgusting. That is, that is an, for men. How many for women? The issue. It, it has to be addressed. So thank you, Supervisor um, Chavez, for just like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm disappointed that you're gone. You need to be Mayor of San Jose. I mean, I'm serious that uh, 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 Mayor Mahan is just thinking, well, we're just going to create these facilities and lock all these people up, and, and, and that's good, and, and the county better support us on that. And so you guys are taking a very measured approach, but you can do something now with those detox quadruples, those, uh, those numbers. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deborah St. Julian. We've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. Uh, hello, my name is Deborah St. Julian. I live in District 2. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. I volunteer at Recovery Cafe San Jose, and I'm a member of the Urban Sanctuary San Jose Faith Community. I deeply care about adequate behavior health services because my friends at church who deal with mental health issues have to work so hard, and they wait so long and they persist so long. I mean, it's, it's a Herculean of thing. I don't know if I could do it, to access adequate mental health care. These are real people I care about who are suffering. I appreciate um, Supervisor Arenas' comments as a family practice and women's health care nurse practitioner about priori prioritizing women and children and disrupting the school to jail pipeline um, and for our youth, I appreciate Susan Supervisor Ellenberg commenting that there is just so much need, and I appreciate that you supervisors just keep going, even and not getting overwhelmed. I appreciate Supervisor Chavez saying we need to prioritize substance use services. A budget is a moral document, and we at Surge support funding community-based mental health as robustly as we support law enforcement. We support the recommendation for trust expansion and we ask the next field teams be established in the areas of the county where call volume is highest, like Gilroy. We support uh, the recommendation for funding um, the birdhouse and other 
and, and increase that funding. And we also ask for a radical expansion like Chavez asked for of substance abuse services and same day detox. Thank you for all your valiant work. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Sweeney. Please accept the unmute. Dear President Ellenberg, County Supervisors and staff, my name is John Sweeney and I am the Senior Legislative and Policy Analyst at the Santa Clara County Office of Education. On behalf of the County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Mary Ann Dewan, I want to thank the board for including funding to address the student mental health crisis. The Santa Clara County Office of Education is proud to be a partner in a countywide student mental health consortium and is thankful for the ongoing collaboration with the school districts in our county. As the RFA for Student Wellness Center funding is developed, we strongly encourage the board to include technical assistance funding and allow consortiums of schools to apply. As we know from firsthand experience, launching a student wellness center that complies with education code can be very complicated and building out Medi-Cal billing and fiscal sustainability plans for each school requires unique expertise in both school-based and managed care billing systems. The county office remains committed to partnering in this work and is happy to partner with the board to identify ways to ensure that schools who receive this funding can successfully and quickly launch student wellness centers that meet the crisis needs of students. Thank you for your leadership, partnership, and commitment to expansion of school-based behavioral health services and wellness centers on school campuses. Thank you. Our next speaker is Edith Mortos. We've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Hi, my name is Edith Mortos, Superintendent of Luther Burbank School District, and I am calling in support of the proposed allocation for student wellness centers. I want to thank the board for including funding to address the student mental health crisis. We are proud to be part of the Countywide Student Mental Health Consortium in partnership with Santa Clara County Office of Education and want to ensure that our consortium is eligible to apply for this funding when it becomes available. Setting up a student wellness center can be complicated and the support and the technical assistance provided through the consortium model was critical to helping us open our wellness center quickly so we could meet the immediate needs of our students. Thank you for your important work on this issue and I look forward to continuing to collaborate with the board as we work to expand student wellness centers together. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Rogers. We've um, asked you to unmute. Good afternoon. I'm going to try and tangibilify uh, the topic of functional medicine and integrative medicine in a few seconds. I'm following on to Ken Horowitz's uh, previous comments and the two attachments that we sent in the public comments that have a little more detail. I love the discussion earlier about trying to figure out how to get um, medicine more proactive, more uh, preventative, and functional and integrative medicine uniquely uh, address the root causes of chronic diseases, which threaten to overwhelm uh, the health of our citizens, as well as the finances of our health systems, not just in the county, but nationwide. Uh, 75 to 85 percent of our costs across the U.S. are tied up with these conditions, um, which are growing faster than we can forecast them. Um, these types of services uniquely address the root causes of non-communicable diseases by addressing the metabolic uh, underlying causes uh, in, with individualized patient approaches. Um, when we look at the cost of this, and in our discussions with these people about defining the pilot, we've talked about actually using existing staff and adding the training necessary so that the bodies that start this new pilot would uh, come from within the system, have blood in the system for the residents that suffer uh, because of their uh, less affluent and the wider ethnic diversity suffer these chronic diseases at higher rates. Um, and um, when you look at it, $50,000 is a meager amount, but 
starting the training earlier would shorten the timeline to providing services for the most needing uh, citizens of the county um, um, that services that are supplied by most of the other major systems in the county that provide health care. Thanks for your time and attention. Thank you. And our final speaker for this item is Diane Guinta. We've asked you to unmute. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all of the board and supervisors for this really thoughtful discussion. I appreciate the detail and I appreciate being able to hear uh, what your thoughts and the presentations are. I am addressing you um, as a person who lives and works in District 5. I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice Sacred Heart. I'm a member and parishioner at St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Palo Alto where I'm the coordinator for Hotel de Zinc, a life, a life moves church-based shelter for 20 unhoused folks who sleep and eat at our church in the, um, every day in the month of August. I'm also the daughter and a sibling of people who have bipolar disorder and substance use disorder, and I'm a volunteer chaplain with the chaplaincy organization in the Santa Clara County Jail. Um, I'm saying all that because I want you to know that I not only care about the dignity and autonomy of people who are unhoused and people who are in the criminal justice system, but I work with them um, on a regular basis. So I would like to support the things that Surge uh, Sacred Heart supports. I support the recommendation for the $4.4 million increase in the trust program. Um, the Blackbird House program, and I would, I would suggest that we have more programs like that, fund more programs like that. And of course, I support a much larger expansion of the same-day detox facilities in Santa Clara County. But part of why I want to address you is because there is such a disproportionate number of people of color in both the criminal justice system and among the unhoused. And in many, many cases, if we could help people before they wind up in the criminal justice system and before they wind up unhoused, they wouldn't be in those situations. So the work that you are doing, the commitments that you make here, um, I feel you have, there's a moral imperative. That was our final speaker. Thank you very much. We are going to vote on item 14, and then we are going to recess briefly. Um, for 30 minutes, so we'll come back at 6.15. The agenda says um, 6.30, but I'm assured by county council that we don't have to wait until 6.30. Is that correct to resume? That's correct, as long as we just clear right now about how long the recess will be. Okay. The recess will be 30 minutes, so if I stop talking and we vote, we'll be back at 6.15. This is the uh, motion by Arenas, second by Chavez. All right, Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Sumidian. Aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. We will be back in 30.
Testing, testing.
It is 6.15. We are set to resume right now, but there are some Wi-Fi issues with the Zoom, so bear with us for a few minutes to see if we can get that straightened out. I believe that we are back online. All right, then I am going to uh, call us back to order following the dinner recess and welcome our new clerk. And Curtis, will you take roll to establish the continued presence of a quorum, please? Supervisor Arenas? Here. Supervisor Chavez? Here. Supervisor Simidian? Here. Vice President Lee? Still present. President Ellenberg. I am here. You have a quorum. So we're going to resume with item 15, which is the first of three items in our special uh, session on behavioral health, um, treatment, and housing. And what I'm going to do in terms of choreography so everybody knows where we're going is that um, we will have uh, staff please present the entire presentation. Um, we won't stop that for, for questions. We will then go um, to supervisors for questions. And given the interest and the time um, and really the engagement around 14D, what I'd like to do is, is put us in 10-minute time incre increments, obviously as many rounds as anybody needs, but that will enable us all to, um, to make sure that we have some time up front, and then we will go to public comment on item 15. So if that is all clear, Sherry, Key, whoever's starting, um, Can go I right ahead. Jump oh, in? Oh, okay. Dr. Smith, yes, you did ask me, my apologies. <clears throat> Just wanna correct something I said erroneously earlier. The question was how many vacant filled positions, unfilled, funded, vacant funded positions we had which were um, psychiatric social worker positions. The board might remember that back in April, you took action to do an add delete and to reclassify um, those positions as alternately filled with rehab specialists. When that happened, uh, PeopleSoft did the add, but they didn't do the delete. So the reality is not 276, but 81 vacant funded positions, still significantly higher than the amount that's being cut. 54 in behavioral health, the remainder in VHP, or VMC. So just to clarify that. Sounded like a high number when I looked it up. Thank you very much. All right, let's begin. Sounds great. Do we have the presentation? Wonderful. Okay, you can go ahead and advance to the next slide.
Um, good evening, uh, Board of Supervisors, Sherry Terrell, Director with our Behavioral Health Services Department. Um, we will be providing an overview uh, this evening of our Behavioral Health Services Department um, County Executive recommended budget. I uh, will provide an overview, um, highlight some uh, behavioral health achievements and investments by strategic goal, and then we'll be open for questions. And um, there's also a series of appendices that were part of the presentation. So next slide, please. Um, so during the current fiscal year, the Board of Supervisors has approved significant increases in funding for treatment, services, and other supports to assist children, youth, and adults with serious behavioral health conditions. If the county executive's recommended budget for fiscal year 24 is approved, the county will have increased the behavioral health operating budget by $72.2 million. The county executive's recommended budget also includes $34.7 million for behavioral health capital related projects. And these recommendations are in addition to the $627 million for construction for the Child and Adolescent Psychiatric and Behavioral Health Services Center. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, thanks. The Behavioral Health Services Department uh, shared five strategic goals with the Board of Supervisors during our most recent presentation on April 4th of 2023. And the county executives recommended fiscal year 24 budget for behavioral health is framed around these five strategic goals. So for this particular goal related to ensuring um, our Medi-Cal beneficiaries are provided timely access to high quality mental health and substance use treatment services, we provided a series of highlights of support um, and um, services that were provided uh, during our fiscal year 23 um, year. Um, namely, just some of the highlights, um, investments of $1.6 million um, in launching our 988 call center and public awareness campaign, a launching of our behavioral health navigator program, um, adding additional staffing to support the navigator program, as well as support for our behavioral health urgent care. Um, those uh, supports continue into fiscal year 24, along with some additional um, recommendations. Um, we. We propose to um, expand and improve language interpret interpreter services. Um, we want to continue to be able to expand um, 988 public awareness campaign and to improve after hours weekend and holiday coverage for the call center, as well as um, increase our clinical oversight and leadership for our county operated clinics to improve and expedite access to services, improve quality of services and increase services to our clients. Next slide, please. The next goal focuses on increasing availability of treatment beds, temporary shelter, and housing. Um, in fiscal year 23, the Board of Supervisors uh, devoted approximately $102.3 million to inpatient acute, subacute, and residential treatment services. And that does not include our Barbara Ahrens Pavilion. There was an increase in treatment beds across our systems of care um, in the amount of $9 million to increase access to psychiatric and substance use treatment beds. Temporary sh shelter was increased by 1.8 million, adding 35 temporary shelter units and 3.5 million for housing programs. We look to continue that work by um, increasing temporary shelter beds um, by 1.3 million to increase access. Um, to the clients in our intensive programs, and also um, increasing permanent supportive housing programs, um, increasing those services for 315 households, and expanding the programs to serve an additional 450 clients at several uh, different permanent supportive housing programs. Next slide. Uh, this slide um, highlights some of the other investments that we have uh, continued to support and the board has continued to support. Um, our construction is underway um, for our child and adolescent psychiatric facility uh, with an investment of $627 million. We're really excited to be nearing completion of 650 South Bascom, which would add 28 adult residential treatment beds. Uh, we're supporting Pathway Society to add 14 social detox and 16 residential treatment beds and continuing to do the good work to expand temporary shelter programs, including three interim housing sites in Palo Alto, San Jose, and Santa Clara, which will be partially funded by the county's challenge grants. 
Also related to goal two, which continues to be a focus on increasing availability of treatment beds, we have accessed um, several different funding opportunities provided by the state throughout the year. Um, we've reported back to the board on our progress related to applications for the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program and have been awarded um, millions of dollars to be able to support various uh, programs. We've also um, received awards from the Community Care Expansion Program also through the Department of Healthcare Services, which awarded $8 million to preserve existing licensed senior and adult residential care facilities. Um, on April 28th, um, we submitted a grant for $51.6 million for the Behavioral Health Bridge Housing Grant, and that grant application ratification is scheduled to come back to the Board of Supervisors on May 16th. And more than $50 million um, through that Behavioral Health Bridge Housing Grant would provide shelter, housing assistance, and services. Finally, uh, the county applied for and, was, and received the California Health Facilities Finance Authority, or CHIFA grant, which awarded $2 million to support the purchase of transitional housing units for adults coming out of incarceration and returning to the community. Next slide. Um, moving on to goal three, um, goal three was related to proactively addressing ongoing and emerging needs for specific high needs populations. Some of the highlights from our current fiscal year include an $18.1 million expansion around community mobile crisis programs and 193000 to distribute Narcan and training uh, within the county. For the fiscal year 2024 uh, recommended budget, uh, we are looking to uh, budget $5.7 million to sustain and expand mobile crisis programs. Uh, one of those um, programs includes the $4.4 million to expand trust to West Valley cities and to West San Jose, and $1.3 million to sustain our PERT operations. Uh, we are looking to increase uh, capacity for our intensive outpatient programs, um, expand our homeless engagement and assessment team in order to reach an additional 250 unduplicated unhoused individuals per year, as well as $1 million for individual placement services programs to provide vocational and employment services to an additional 500 individuals with a serious mental illness, and then $14.6 million for children and youth including $10 million to establish school-based wellness centers, uh, $1.2 million to expand treatment of eating disorders, expanding universal prevention services to all school districts, and expanding services at all Cove Palo Alto. Next slide, please. Um, this slide uh, focuses um, on the continuation related to goal three. Um, just some of the highlights from fiscal year 23. Um, through the board support, we were able to add nine FTEs to our suicide uh, crisis and suicide prevention lifeline, um, increasing support to the medication addiction treatment program, um, adding uh, support for our suicide prevention program, as well as adding uh, FTEs to support the partnership with our collaborative courts, as well as support for our LGBTQ plus programming. In the Fiscal year 24, we are looking to, um, we're nearing completion again on the center, uh, the Child and Adolescent Center for Excellence. Uh, we're looking to increase supports uh, for the Behavioral Health Monterey Road facility, which is our adult outpatient program that would essentially um, increase uh, our efforts around our assisted outpatient treatment team. Uh, we're looking to increase um, the budget uh, around $3.2 million to establish a facility for all Cove San Jose, um, expansion of a larger clinic in South County um, to be able to provide additional services to adults um, with serious mental illness, supporting uh, San Mateo County to construct a new opioid treatment program clinic on the VA campus in Menlo Park. Uh, this project would double capacity and serve residents of both San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. And then we are also um, adding a contingency management program, which would uh, be an enhancement to our substance use treatment services. Um, though not highlighted on the slide, the contingency management program is an evidence-based treatment program that provides motivational incentives to treat individuals living with stimulant use disorder 
and support their path to recovery. So that was something else that we wanted to highlight. Next slide. Uh, moving on to goal four, this is related to developing innovative solutions to address professional workforce shortages. Um, as we have been um, sharing with the board uh, throughout the past year, um, we are putting forward a lot of effort around uh, developing career pathways and supporting the hiring and retention of clinical staff. Um, during fiscal year 23, um, we were able to increase workforce education and training funds for peer intern stipends, training, scholarships, and peer mentoring. Um, we look to alternatively staff our psychiatric social worker and marriage and family therapist positions with unclassified rehab counselor positions in order to help retain interns that are being trained in our um, county operated clinics. We awarded 37 sign-on bonuses for the hiring of psychiatric social workers and MFTs and have continued to initiate strategies um, and candidate focused recruitments for our PSW and MFT vacancies. In fiscal year 24, we look to continue this work um, through the provision of $1 million for hiring incentives and retention bonus programs for direct staff for, for both county and contracted providers, uh, looking to increase the budget to be able to add 13 student interns to engage and introduce students to behavioral health um, work through peer mentoring. And then finally, requesting um, an additional $172,000 for 16 additional scholarships for students that are pursuing a bachelor's level education in behavioral health related fields. Uh, finally, um, related to goal five, this is adapting to and helping to shape the rapidly shifting state policy landscape. Um, we have been sharing with the board many of the changes that are coming down from the state, um, one of which we spoke about earlier this evening, which is CalAIM payment reform. Um, so in fiscal year 23, we completed implementation of our NetSmart My Avatar Provider Connect Enterprise, which is um, supporting CalAIM payment reform to adjudicate claims via data exchange with My Avatar in the state. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we've contracted with Optimus, a healthcare reform consultant firm, to assist with changes to contracting with our network, um, and they also assisted with helping with our rate setting uh, for our contract providers. Uh, some of the highlights related to goal five for um, addressing policy and shifting policy is restructuring our quality management team to support integration and establishing a provider relations, utilization management, and care management team to ensure that behavioral health services department can meet business needs and future CalAIM requirements. Uh, we're also requesting to add three FTEs to enhance our utilization management, as well as our quality assurance teams adding five FTEs to support our behavioral health financial management group, um, adding two FTEs to support uh, compliance and privacy uh, to meet the new CalAIM and managed care final rules, and finally $200,000 to contract with a consultant to train behavioral health services to providers to adhere to the new CalAIM payment reform requirements, including how to transition and use new billing codes. And with that, I will pause for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. I just uh, wanted to note that uh, while we put in the appendix, um, there are three sort of um, slides that might be helpful. A is sort of a summary of the major funding sources for the Behavioral Health Services Department. And appendix B is a summary of the ARPA um, investments in our behavioral health services. And C is a summary of the capital improvement program. And I did want to note just one correction on appendix A. The, um, the dollar amounts uh, noted for substance abuse block grant and community mental health services block grant are um, reversed. So I just wanted to make sure we note that correction. Thanks. Thank you both very much. I really uh, appreciated the, <clears throat> the alignment of this presentation to the strategic priorities and, and want us to continue building toward alignment of our goals and our investments. I'm going to, um, I see Supervisor Lee's light on. I'm gonna start with him, work my way down, and we will do this initial round in 10 minute increments and see if anyone needs extra time after that. So Supervisor Lee, go right ahead. 
<clears throat> thank you, Madam President. Uh, first, I want to really thank Sherry and your team on the behavior health uh, for putting this presentation together by these five core strategies. Uh, this layout really helped everybody to understand how our investments and actions are truly lining up with the vision that, that we have set forth on addressing both mental health and substance abuse as a public health crisis. Um, I want to bring our attention to slide eight on leveraging other funds and opportunities. Uh, very grateful for our uh, administration for applying for these many grants, uh, some of which <clears throat> I believe the county has already received these awards. Uh, but for the other ones, such as the Community Care Expansion Program for 25 million and the Behavior Health Bridge Housing Grant for 51.6 million. Um, do you have any idea, um, A, how likely will we get them, B, is if we were to get it, when will we get those back to us? Uh, thank you, Supervisor Lee, for the question. Um, on the 35, uh, $34.5 million application for the um, skilled nursing facility, we expect to hear back uh, by the end of June. This is part of the BHCIP round five. Um, for the $25 million on the community care expansion program, the state has come back to us and asked us to provide uh, uh, refined cost estimates and sort of timelines. In order to do that, we have to um, uh, provide a sort of, um, you know, a, a, a more concrete concept and design. Um, and we're working with, um, we've engaged a few residential care facility operators um, to help us uh, develop those. And I, I think we can sort of submit um, a revised concept um, sort of around August or September. These organizations have experienced developing and operating residential care facilities, uh, so we have to um, engage with them to see if they have interest in partnering us to develop these three county-owned sites. On the behavioral health bridge housing, we should know um, pretty sh uh, shortly. Uh, this first um, allocation or funding round is are, are really allocations to uh, county behavioral health departments or counties. Um, so we should know uh, pretty soon, um, and we'll probably execute the contract, you know, in August or September. Uh, and these fund funds will be spent over the uh, next four fiscal years. Great, <clears throat> thank you. Um, you talked about the increasing the um, uh, pathways of 14 social detox uh, beds and 16 more residential treatment beds. That's in addition to the 15 that we've contracted previously, correct? Uh, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And um, so in terms of SUTs, I think this is an issue that we all have been talking about for so long. You know, Supervisor Chavez concerned earlier about you no know, lack of such services funding during the PHSD you know, budget discussion that this is a problem given our need for uh, substance use services on both the prevention and the treatment fronts. So um, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, if we are really trying to add more funding to it, we are looking at basic numbers, about $70.7 .7 million uh, for these type of services out of a total <clears throat> appropriation 737 million of the whole BHSD budget. Um, looks like we're only spending actually less than 10%. Uh, if this is something that we see as so important, do you think there's opportunity that you could think of maybe spending more uh, on the such services uh, moving forward? Um, um, I think, so, so first, uh, thank you for the question. And um, I think over the course of the presentation, these sort of monthly presentations to the board has become clear that we, um, as a county, um, need to put more emphasis and strategy around expanding um, access to substance use treatment services, both outpatient and sort of various residential types. Um, the, um, as, as Sherry noted, we've made um, some significant investments. I think one of the things that we need to do sort of moving forward um, for our own purposes and um, uh, for the board's information is to really try to summarize and encapsulate all the, the, the full investment in substance use treatment services um, in sort of uh, like its, its own category, at least for informational purposes. Um, so we'll try to do that moving forward. Um, and then, you know, um, there was a lot of um, conversation about 
um, the new payment reform, the new fee-for-service structure. I think that is a, an excellent opportunity for us to really expand substance use treatment services um, because it move us, moves us away from sort of the, the cost reimbursement model to this opportunity for organizations that have high productivity, low administrative costs to really expand services. So we're going to be working on that um, concurrently and you know, in the new cadence of, of meetings, we hope to bring forward to you how we are working to expand both outpatient and um, various residential substance use treatment services and how we're funding those. And I think key to that will be the new fee-for-service payment reform. Key, I was just gonna add one, one thing on that, um, just to, um, without getting too ahead of ourselves, just alert the board that we are in discussion about a number of additional um, opportunities that we see on the substance use side that are um, not ready to come out of the oven quite yet, but um, the board should expect a number of updates in the next few months around additional opportunities for investment and expansion of substance use treatment services that we're working on now. Well, thank you, Greta, for the update and key as well, because how <clears throat> important that we need to focus on uh, not just only residential, not just outpatient, not just social detox, not just medical detox. It really is all of the above, right? Thank you. Um, we talked about, uh, you mentioned the um, new opioid treatment program on the VA campus in Menlo Park there that would double the capacity, which is very exciting. Now, this program is really only for veterans, am I correct? Um, uh, Supervisor, it is a partnership between the VA Menlo Park or the local VA hospital and San Mateo County, but the, the facility will be open to sort of all residents or residents of both counties, not just veterans. But um, the specifics around that, um, we, we will have to sort of get back to you. But it is um, for non-veterans as well. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. And, and of course, we want to connect those to our veterans who might have those needs, like at the 10 Kirk, for example, there'll be one location where we have some unhoused veterans who are staying there. So let's make sure those services get uh, widely broadcasted. Thank you so much. Okay. Supervisor Simidian. Nope. Supervisor Chavez. Um, thank you very much um, for the report. And um, let, let me start with the, the appendix, and then I want to come back. So both, I'm going to look at A and B. And first, I, I really appreciate getting a chance to see the, the different buckets of money that we're competing to draw down. So thank you for including that, and that's in A. One, um, one question that I have for how we're uh, approaching grants, I know that um, Judge Manley has been concerned that we were not really being as aggressive as we could be relative to um, grant uh, opportunities at the state for behavioral across the board. And I wonder if you could talk for a moment about the strategy you have about under what terms and conditions we're applying for what buckets of money, you know, what drives that, and if, in fact, you have the support you need to, you know, to, to um, to be competitive in all these different areas, or if we if we don't have enough support to even be applying for grants. Yeah. Um, thank you, Supervisor Chavez, uh, for that question. Um, I believe, well, my opinion is that we are aggressively pursuing every or um, significant grant opportunity that the state is putting forward, um, and it is you know quite fortunate that over the last. 24 months or so, the state has actually put forward behavioral health infrastructure treatment facility t um, types of grants specifically um, with BHCIP and CCE, as you see here. Um, in, in addition to the behavioral, uh, what we've talked about here, we have also been actively uh, pursuing the um, state's home key funding. And then, as you know, we have quite a few projects underway, and we're working on applying to the state for uh, the state's home key program for the Santa Clara um, and uh, the Santa Clara site at Benton and Lawrence Expressway. So, um, uh, in, in addition to, to applying for all of the you know uh, previously existing grants like CHAFA, like Prop 47, um, so between behavioral health and the Office of Supportive Housing, with some support from the County Exec's Office, I feel that you know we are 
and, and some consultants, we use RDA sometimes mm -hmm. to put the applications together, but I, I feel like we have a good strategy guided by the direction of the board and, and Dr. Smith, and we have the resources in place to sort of apply, um, and then implementation and management is, is something that is a constant thing that we would have to work on, mm -hmm. but um, I, I think we have those resources. You know, one thing, and I, I don't know the right way to demonstrate this, but I would really like to be able to um, give both Judge Manley and I think our, our um, the, the surrounding cities, San Jose is one also that doesn't believe that we're applying for enough money or that we're leaving money on the table. And I, I don't know the appropriate communication tool to update our um, sister organizations about the body of work that you're doing. I have no idea the right way to do that because, but I, but I would just like to ask that that's something you give consideration to and that, that we come up with some sort of a one pager that says, Here's what was available this year. Here's what we applied for, and here's what we got. Like, kind of the go to the freezer, get the box version. Um, uh, thank you. I think we can sort of um, do something along those lines, you know, um, for our court partners and our other uh, sort of reentry partners with the city of San Jose, with their housing department. We obviously have a lot of. Um, collaboration and coordination, um, but um, more recently we've been you know, coordinating more with the city manager's office and we'll make sure that they're fully aware of you know, the state funds uh, that we're applying for and uh, receiving and how that's being implemented. Yeah, and I, I don't even think it's just them. It's something we even need to be able to give to elected officials and other communities and Judge Manley and the judges because they, they really Every time they hear about a grant, there's an assumption that we, we didn't apply for it. I don't know why that's become the default, but we, it's something we have to remedy. And if we don't, then we're going to keep being, you know, challenging you to give us a way to explain it. So I, so please let's just figure out how to explain it, because I, I, I appreciate the point you're raising. And I also appreciate that, you know, when necessary, you're getting the outside help you need if you feel like that's that's going to make a difference. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think the grant writing support through RDA, through a contract that our health system has, has been tremendously helpful because these applications come out fairly quickly. The turnaround time is very quick. And so we're just having to, you know, assemble our teams, gather the data, make sure the application is mm -hmm. put together properly and submit it. So certainly relying on the resources we have internally has been very helpful in that process. And I'm, I'm glad that you're doing that. Like, I, I think if, if that's what it takes to be competitive, let's, let's make it happen. So that's, that's very good news. Um, on the, uh, so I'm gonna move to, to B now, and this is the American Rescue Plan solely. I, am I, is that right, that these are only American Rescue Plan dollars as part of Appendix B? Yes. Okay. And is the, so one, um, one question that I have is, are we funding medical detox in any of our facilities now? And if so, what are the use of those, what are the sources of those funds? Um, medical detox currently, um as uh, I think you've been aware of the conversation, some of the medical det detox services are being provided in our acute care hospital. Um, and no, actually, uh, we know, let, and we let me stop you yeah. right there. They will be, a, they will be, or they are now. In so, what? In where? Some is being provided through our acute care hospitals, and um, we recognize that that is. Um, um, not necessarily meeting all of the needs. And so we have um, been working on trying to um, contract for a standalone medical detox facility that would accept Medi-Cal patients. Key, can I just expand on that a little bit? So we have medical detox being provided in not only our acute care hospitals, but other acute care hospitals in the community, but primarily to people who present with another medical need and start experiencing um, symptoms of detox and need for medical detox while they're in um, that inpatient acute medical facility. A big challenge um, statewide consistent with what Key just said is that 
Um, the number of standalone uh, detox facilities that will provide detox services um, to folks who don't have those uh, concurrent medical issues that require hospitalization are few and far between generally, and um, the numbers who currently take Medi-Cal are even fewer and farther between statewide. And so um, this is an example of what, one of the areas where we're pushing to try and see better state reimbursement for this function and an ability to expand access to care while at the same time really trying to see who in our community may be willing to get in a position to deliver those services under contract with the county for our patient population. We're also exploring um, alternative mechanisms through our own um, healthcare delivery system where we can uh, tap some of the expertise of our network of physicians who have um, addiction medicine training on top of their other training and, and kind of exploring those sorts of opportunities. So some of the um, different ways that we can um, really get our arms around the full set of options around folks who need medical support for detox are some of these items I referenced vaguely earlier that we're working on but aren't quite ready to come out of the oven. Um, but we're really looking at kind of where we have options to expand more on the pure set side, more on the medical side and, and in between, as well as looking at what have been some revenue challenges um, in terms of how these services are reimbursed that have just meant there's not enough access for Medi-Cal beneficiaries across California. So um, on this subject, I, I think it's very important that we're crystal clear about what services are available right now relative to medical detox and what is the plan moving forward. We have had this discussion here a number of times. I've even been to a press conference about some of it. And what's been hard for me to know is under what, to be honest with you, I've, I've even gotten different feedback as to whether or not we're actually providing medical detox. So I would like one or two sheets that says, this is where and, and under what circumstances we're providing medical detox at our um, acute care hospitals. And what we, and I'm not even concerned about what else is happening in the county. I just wanna know what we are doing. If, if we do have a, another partner somewhere that's helping us, that's great. What I want to make sure, the second part I want to make sure I understand is why we need the discrete standalone facility versus integrating it into facilities that we already have, whether that's financial or operational or um, any other kind of limit, just so I'm crystal clear on why we're making the decisions that we are. Um, the availability of those services in our facilities as well as with community partners is one of exactly the things that we're exploring for exactly the reason that you said. So we don't know yet. We don't, I mean, we, whatever we, we don't know, we know what we provide right now. We don't yet know what the best opportunities to fill the gaps are. So what I want to know is what are we providing right now? Why are we looking at standalone? And if that's going to come out of the RAND study as part of that body of work, important to understand that as well. But right now, I want to be able to answer the question with clarity and specificity. Okay, we can provide an off agenda Thank with you. that information. And I'll have to come back for my second 10 minutes. <laughs> Supervisor Arenas? No. Okay. Um, thank you. So I'll, I'll take. Uh, my round now. Uh, Supervisor Chavez first on communications. Uh, I want to second, third, and fourth that. And we need to think about, uh, we don't need anyone else, but I, I want us to be thinking about the different audiences. We absolutely need to be able to share easily with our constituents, whether it's a question that comes through email or a handout at an event. What are the services that we have? How can people access them? So th that's the services piece. In terms of what we are doing, um, I can only see 10 feet, so I have no idea if David Campos is still in here. But we've been talking about how we let our legislators know, not just in our delegation, but across the state, some of the phenomenal leadership work that Santa Clara County is doing 
particularly around housing, around behavioral health. So we need to be able to tell the story to that audience in no more than a one or two pager. And then the, the third audience is other local electeds who were really trying to both educate and, and reassure that we are on top of this work, this is what we're doing. So maybe that is more of a newsletter format or information that you send to each of the five of us and we can disseminate it to the, the cities in our district. But really thinking always about how we let people know what work we're doing, where we are impactful, and you know, frankly, it will then be clear also where our gaps are and where we need to go. So communication, communication, communication is really, really important. Um, and I think you've heard that from a number of us around, around different issues. So there's a piece that I'm looking at James and Greta for that really is an overall county comms issue of how do we tell our story? How do we let people know what we're doing. Um, I'm gonna agree, of course, that we need um, to be more specific and more directive around um, expansion of an investment in substance use uh, treatments. And what I wanna make sure of, we've talked about the, the RAND study a number of times, I wanna know that there are going to be funds available to act on the findings from the RAND study when the board receives the report on June 6th. The 15.6 million here is, is definitely a start. Um, I am anticipating that the RAND report hopefully will not just be um, a, a list of bed gaps, but will have an analysis and some actionable recommendations to, to close those gaps. So I don't know if I'm looking at Key or Sherry or Greta, but tell me what you envision, you turned your light on so it'll be you, um, what you envision as next steps when we have the RAND results in our hands. So, you know, none of us have yet seen the final results of the RAND study. So with that caveat, um, the money allocated in the CIP was designed to be a pot of money that we're setting aside so that it's um, envisioned to be allocated to invest where we need to invest based on the analysis that we get from RAND merging that, of course, with our own understanding of, of where we know there are service gaps and needs and, and um, existing efforts afoot. Um, but the RAND report will provide us with, an with a kind of robust assessment of what is available in our county right now, mm -hmm. and based on their um, analysis of the need, where the gaps are, okay. we will then um, as staff come back to the board with recommendations on what the best paths are to fill those gaps. So the um, recommendations will come from from you all, not from Rand. They'll That's identify not part of their they'll identify their assessment of the need that needs to be met, and then it will be on us to make recommendations okay. to the board okay. um, what the best means are to meet that need. So, for example, if they say we have an X number of bed um, subacute gap particularly for patients who need subacute mental health services but also have medical needs. We would then um, start trying to put together a plan on how do we meet the specific gap that they've identified. Would that be best met by partnering with one of our community providers? Would that be met by us building our own capacity? What are the trade-offs there? And how can we best leverage the resources that we have available to close those gaps? And when we receive the report um, on June 6th, I assume that that doesn't give you time before that date to to come up with recommendations. So the report, and tell me if I'm wrong, will the, will the report on the 6th be, this is what Rand found, and now we're going to go back and come back to you in a month or three months or whatever it is with I, recommendations? Yeah, I would say some of it will depend on what they find. I mean, we, as, as the board knows, have a number of, of um, plans in the works to close what we already know are likely to be some of the gaps. So the question will really be, um, if we continue to be successful moving forward, what would the remaining gaps be? So I think we'll be able to identify, for example, um, you know, if there's a 28 bed gap and we know we have 20 beds in the pipeline that would, of that particular type mm -hmm. of service that are hopefully going to come online near term. 
um, what would be the remaining gap, and, and we may need um, more time to come back with what would be the plan to close that additional gap, or we may say, although they, they, we think the need is actually a little greater than they identified or, or what the caveats might be, um, but I do anticipate that although we'll have some um, preliminary information to share on how we would see a path forward to close those gaps, that there'll be more time needed to, to assess what we learn from RAND in real time alongside the board. Thank you. And Dr. Yeah. Smith, you want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, talking about money, um, the money that's currently set aside <clears throat> certainly won't pay for building any significant number of buildings. Um, depending on what the RAND study shows, we will have to not only make recommendations, but also hire consultants and construction RFPs in order to come up with a plan to actually fund the recommendations that the board supports. So it won't be in this budget year. And hopefully there'll be options other than new construction. I, ideally there will be right. other beds we can contract for or, or ready-made yeah. uh, solutions. Contracting out, we can, we can um, I'm sure come up with options there. Um, I'm just saying if they recommend building new beds, mm -hmm. that's not going to be something that we can pull off this year. Right, of course. And that will very likely also require a new conversation and, and reprioritization, perhaps, of the capital investment plan. Right. Where we're going. All right. I think that answers all of my questions. Does anyone need a second round? Supervisor Lee? It really is a follow-up of what you just talked about in terms of building new beds and what's the fastest way to get them built. Uh, what do you subcontract it out? And I think we mentioned this before, is given the fact that the commercial real estate um, is certainly ch very challenging right now in terms of high vacancies and all the <clears throat> issues we are seeing due to, you know, post-COVID people not going back to work, um, that we should not leave no stone unturned. We know a lot of proposals now are converting commercial real estates into housing, for example. That's one of those ideas we've been putting in. And I'm just going to say that whether <clears throat> there's maybe an opportunity that that would be another idea to add some beds potentially using existing building because, as we all know, trying to build something from ground up, the perfect design and all that, would take years. Yeah. We don't have to go back and talk about that adolescent <laughs> uh, a facility that we've been talking about. But if there are actually, you know, built out buildings uh, with fairly little TI, you know, in the, in the footprint, and we could actually design it that way. I'm just trying to throw it out as an idea that it'll be far quicker, kind of like using 650 self basket idea. It was the TI that we were doing you know, to get those 28 bits ready. Uh, to look into that potentially some some of those to uh, potentially add some bets uh, in. Well, as the board remembers, there are basically four levels of <clears throat> care that um, need facilities. Uh, one is a PUF or psychiatric health facility, which mm -hmm. is somewhat of a step down from an inpatient acute building. Mm -hmm. One is uh, MHRC, mm -hmm. which is what used to be called an IMD. Mm -hmm. One is board and cares, and I forgot the last one. Crisis residential. Crisis residential, Jeez. that's it. Um, all of those are really hard to build individually, so it's the easiest way to get a puff is to buy a building that already is suitable for a puff. Mm -hmm. um, if you try to get somebody to build one, um, that's really a long-term effort and there aren't any buildings in our facilities or any puffs in our county at this point. So it'd be starting from the beginning. So it'd be better to buy a building that can be renovated into mm -hmm. a puff. Right. And Thank then you. for the, you know, IMDs the same way or contracting with IMDs is probably the best residential care is easiest to do. Bye Board and care is easiest to do. So if you want to puff, I don't know what Rand is going to say, but if we want to puff, we have to buy a building. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez or, okay. 
So um, just to make sure I understand something, first of all, I, I do want to say every single time you do a presentation, the information gets better and clearer, so thank you. And um, in particular, I, I really wanted to just lift up the page that shows all the different um, um, funding sources. I thought this was really helpful. And it left me wondering something relative to the changes at the state level in terms of uh, how, how nonprofits are going to be reimbursed and, and frankly, how the county will re be reimbursed for services. Um, does, the, does the budget reflect the, um, the insurance monies that are generated now, like even that the county will receive? And if so, what part of the budget is that in? Um, thank you, Supervisor. I, I think, um, I, I believe the question you're asking is, does the fiscal 24 budget reflect the uh, revenue generated by sort of outpatient and residential and other behavioral health services. Is, correct. is that correct? Um, it, it does. Um, and um, so just sort of generally speaking, it's sort of in that FFP um, box or the color. That's the FFP is the, the, um, the federal portion for Medi-Cal reimbursable services. And that's the only external uh, insurance pot that's reflected or re external revenue that is generated through service provision? That's our, our primary um, revenue, source of revenue for Greg can services. give you an answer. Yeah. Also, for, for a lot of the uh, services that are provided through our medical professionals, uh, we have insurance reimbursement in through the enterprise system as well, through the hospital system. That's where a lot of it is. And for the uh, primary um, behavioral health uh, clients, the medical clients, you know, that insurance reimbursements comes in two kind of two packages the federal uh, participation and then the state funds the state share of it through realignment funds so the reason i'm asking the question and i really uh, thank you uh, greg for filling that out is that i think that um the amount the total amount of investment that comes through the county's portals to provide mental health services and such services is actually because it's broader than this, I, I again think this goes in the category of what we want to be able to tell the public, which is that we're um, investing, uh, you know, this amount of resources in these different ways. And and the reason I say that is that there's a general, I think, misunderstanding about who the county is responsible for covering, and there are a lot of people that we provide services to that may or may not have access, well, I mean, we try to make sure they have access to, to Medi-Cal or some other service, but that actually is quite a lot of resources that are coming through the systems relative to um, the work that's being done. As an example, I mean, I can think of one nonprofit off the top of my head that I think is a, is a $40 million partner with us that is being funded some through, uh, you know, through uh, insurance and some through general fund investment. But that's a, that's a lot of money that we have out in the world and that we also want to be able to say, this is how much we're investing and this is what we're getting for that investment in terms of service provision. So just something to think about. This was so helpful, but it made me think, you know, are we bringing down all the insurance we should? And it's actually been one of the challenges in my mind with having the medical services umbrella and then having behavioral health sort of stuck in it um, because it's not super accurate in terms of the role that um, we're playing as a county in terms of behavioral health and mental health. Um, so I just oh. wanted to say that, um, you know, this is the department's budget, not, not the CBO's budget. So the CBOs are the ones who get reimbursed from Medi-Cal, Medicare. We only get reimbursed for our inpatient services and our mental health clinic services. The rest is money that goes basically from the state to the to this CBO. So it is captured here as you know um, lump sums in realignment. 
um, FFP and general fund, which all contribute to the paying the upfront costs and then the F CBO gets reimbursed. Right, I guess the, the point that I'm trying to raise is that they, they still have contracts with us to provide services, right? Right, and so my, it, my, we're a pass through though. I totally get it, but it's, it's a bigger, these are relatively big investments that are being made in our community on behalf of these particular services. Again, this goes back to the point that Susan raised about like how are we educating our partners about the role that we're playing. And I think particularly because most folks outside of this building don't understand the difference between what, what VMC does and what our clinics do versus what our nonprofit partners do that primarily do behavioral health and some do both. I mean, it's, it's really a patchwork, but that's really helpful. Thank you. I, I didn't want to make it more complicated. I was just trying to understand what I was looking at. Um, the other question I have is, if, as we're looking at um, Care Court coming on board, does, does Care Court, I know, well, do, does Care Court have an investment pool that we're also looking at drawing down as we're preparing for it? at the state level, and I'm really thinking both about the service side, but also the housing needs? Uh, there was a one-time allocation of funds that the county received um, that is intended to be used for care court. Um, that was are, a planning grant, though? It was um, initial um, one-time funds for s startup funds for care court, and so um, those are, you know, on hold until we're ready to implement, and we're not part of the first cohort so our responsibility is to implement by December of 24. So we'll be following very closely the other counties that are moving into implementation in this first, first cohort. Thank you. Supervisor, I, I just add the, that, um, you, you know, while the, the official planning and implementation has yet to be, begin, we are looking at how other counties are approaching it and the needs of the individuals who might come through care court. So our behavioral health bridge housing grant application expands our AOT team. It expands their access to various temporary shelter and temporary housing options so that we can, you know, have some um, be on relatively good footing, uh, footing as we sort of implement. So looking at the AOT expansion, that's really connected to what we anticipate happening with Care Court. Is it also in, in part because of the number of people you've been able to engage and success with that program, or primarily we anticipate the growth through Care Court? Um, our initial uh, AOT program um, included services for 50 individuals, and we you know, filled those um, spots with um, by serving AOT, and so we in this um, current budget had asked uh, to increase the, that number by another 50 clients. So to get to 100? Yes. And our initial anticipation was that we would be in the 25 range, if I'm remembering. Not, that, Sherry, this wasn't you, that uh, this was actually Tony before you, but I remember that's, that's actually really interesting that it's that many people, and it's gonna be good to know that it's, if it's been effective in terms of really providing support to folks. Yeah, I think um, on May 16th, there is a report um, on AOT, the annual report on AOT, um, and that will provide more detail. I think a um, couple of things to note about the AOT program is it sort of has two components. One is sort of the the assessment team, the outreach team, which is all county staff, um, and then these intensive outpatient providers that, get, um, that um, uh, the team refers to. And the AOT team, of course, helps individuals, and there are a number of individuals who actually get petitioned, and there's sort of that process. And then other individuals who, you know, actually, when engaged, actually uh, voluntarily accept services, and some of those individuals get referred to the intensive services. So the AOT expansion is both the outreach and assessment team and the intensive services, but not necessarily all hundred have gone in front of a judge. Sure, and, you know, no, that makes that makes a ton of sense. I'll look forward to the report. That's going to be very very informative, and I think especially as it lays out what what steps we need to take to be more prepared for care court and whatever else, you know, whatever new ideas are emerging. And I know that Supervisor Ellenberg has been playing a leadership role at a state level in terms of what kind of new legislation is coming our way. So that's really important. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have public speakers on this item? 
We have uh, two public speakers in Zoom and uh, none in Chambers. So let me remind folks on Zoom that if you are intending to speak on item 15, now is the time to have your virtual hand raised. As always, we close the queue when the first speaker begins speaking for meeting management purposes. Are we still holding, holding firm at two? We are still holding firm at two. All right, then let's uh, provide two minutes for each speaker, please. All right, our first speaker is RNPA. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. We can't hear the speaker. Oh. Good evening, Board of Supervisors. Uh, this is Alan Kamara from RNPA. Uh, I was wondering, my comment was supposed to be for 14, well, since behavioral health also encompasses uh, our staffing, I would like to just make a few comments on that. We want to first and foremost thank you all for everything you do on behalf of our nurses. Uh, this is Nurses Week, and our nurses will always continue to thank you for all your support during our short staffing. Um, Dr. Smith, thank you also. I've never heard you speak any ill of nurses. You've always uh, spoke eloquently in support of our nurses. So I know you're leaving. I want to preference preference my statement by saying our nurses absolutely appreciate all your effort. Uh, what I would like to talk about today is, I think every time we've met with all of you, in all of our agenda, we have short staffing. I feel like nurses is almost, within this county, is synonymous with short staffing. And with, uh, for today, to see that the county is proposing the deletion of uh, clinical nurses' position concerns us greatly. In the budget, it talks about 75% increase of professional service contract for staffing alone. And Dr. Smith, you talked about how some of the managers held on to position without posting them. And you know how difficult it is to hire in this county. The, the, hiring, the, practice, the hiring practice is so difficult. And we talked about custody health deleting positions for LVNs, and we've sent you our position on that. We may not have control of how you all vote, but we surely will know that you will remember when our pleas to you all that short staffing is not a good patient care so for the community. So we thank you all for the opportunity for me to make this comment on behalf of our nurses. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Thank you, thank you, thank you. These numbers look encouraging. With that, minute, with that kind of increase in capacity of with pathways is very, very encouraging and just across the board. But how do we translate those dollars into actual materialized in the community to where the community benefits? And that's really the key. I would very much encourage a visit to the Muriel Wright Center. It's up on the hill. It used to be the old girls' ranch. Okay, they have two medical uh, detox there, only two. That can be increased exponentially. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jennifer Briscoe and Dr. Michael Ibarra are excellent, excellent at what they do. It's a beautiful facility. The men's side is capacity is 30. They have room. Uh, uh, Supervisor uh, Lee was talking about something that's already built. There is room on the other side of that building. And there can be a, a consideration of increase in for women. Because Dr. Michael Ibarra has a degree. His doctorate is a very specialized doctorate. And it specializes in, he, there's, put it this way, there's only 1% of people that have doctorates in, so, in sociology in the state that have this particular doctorate, only 1%. And it's specifically designed for women integrating, women incarcerated that are integrating into the communities. It's a specialized uh, degree. He has it. He just recently got it. 
And so I, I would very much encourage a visit to the Muriel Wright Center. It's up there on Bernal Road. It used to be the old girls' ranch. And look at the work that they're doing and compare it to what Pathways is doing. You will want to invest there and expand there rather than investing in Pathways, or at least both of them, because they're doing excellent work. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. I don't believe we had, did we have a motion on that? I don't think so. So we have two items remaining. Um, item 16 uh, of our special session is screening for students. And then we will wrap up with our last item, collaboration with Chalk for mental health services. So who is presenting on screenings for students? Madam President. Um, yes, sir. Sherry's team is going to present what's in the agenda. After that, I have a follow up on a different screening type that I know the board knows about. So if I could have some time after that. Of course. And is this in response to a referral? Okay. <clears throat> so your referral. Okay. So we are going to have the presentation first and then the comments. You got it. Thank you. Sorry, we'll, we'll start with the presentation and then go to Supervisor Chavez as this was her referral. Good evening, I'm Eric Riera. I'm the Deputy Director of Service Delivery for the department and I'm here with two of my colleagues who are gonna do the presentation this evening. Good evening, board members. Good evening, board members. I'm Zelia Faria Costa, Director of the Children, Youth, and Family System of Care for Behavioral Health. And with me, we have um, Catherine Aspiris, who will be leading us in the presentation for this item. Good evening, Board of Supervisors. My name is Catherine Aspiris. I'm the Division Director for School Based Services at Behavioral Health Services Department. Um, next slide, please. We have a short presentation today to discuss the screenings that are happening at, um, at schools for students. Um, the county in general has um, done physical screenings such as dental, vision, hearing, and screenings are occurring um, based on at school districts. Funding is available through social services agency, the office of the county executive, county office of education, public health department, managed care plans are all funding um, dental, vision, and hearing. Next slide. The Behavioral Health Services Department is focusing on expanding the, P, the prevention and early intervention program to in, that's already integrated in schools. This program will um, provide behavioral health services such as mental health screening, parenting workshops, skills groups, and um, skill streaming curriculum. We currently are at 16 of the 32 school districts. And as part of our MHSA three-year plan, we included um, looking at expanding to school districts, the remaining 16 school districts, to provide these um, services. And the PEI program encompasses a multi-tiered system of supports that includes um, all the way from prevention and to early intervention and in providing services for um, intensive services for students. The team at, P, at the PI program is comprised of paraprofessionals and professionals that deliver the continuity, continuity of care from prevention all the way to early intervention, such as therapy. And the PI program demonstrates overall uh, quality, improved quality of care and outcomes. We receive feedback from teachers, students, and from parents uh, throughout um, the services that are provided through the PI program. And we also hear back from um, the through the teachers' comments, we provide county, um, the county provides support with improving the continuous quality improvement with this program. Next slide, please. The prevention and early intervention program team, as shared, consists of professionals and paraprofessionals. The family partner is a person that has um, professional or personal life experiences to provide peer support to parents and caregivers. As part of the screening process, the parent family partner can provide presentations to the parents regarding psychoeducation around mental health awareness and the screening process. They also could provide follow-up um, with the students' parents regarding the mental health screening, refer for services and do case management linkage, and they also can provide uh, the Triple P program to the parents. 
The family specialist, which is another paraprofessional, provides, can provide the, um, and administer the standardized and validated mental health screening tool to the third grade students. They can provide the skill streaming curriculum following the screening, and they can identify if there's students that have additional needs of support. They can provide tier two supports such as skills groups and um, behavioral supports, and they can also provide case management. Lastly is professional uh, part of the team. We have a clinician that, provide, that can provide support to the mental health screening process. If students screen at or above the clinical cutoff score, a clinician can provide additional um, screening and if assessment is needed to determine what level of care their uh, services they're needing. The clinician can provide early intervention such as tier three supports. Um, that includes individual, group, and family clinical therapy. They again can also provide case management. And that concludes our presentation for the screens at schools. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Chavez. I'm going to let Dr. Smith um, go first, and then I will chime in. Thank you. Twice. I'm so sorry. Madam President, members of the board, um, I wanted to also uh, respond a little bit to this referral. I know that um, the PEI program is a very great program and we should expand it. Um, it's both a screening and a treatment program. Um, there are other programs that have been, we as a county have been connected with, particularly with the Healthy Kids Foundation. They've been doing dental screening, um, health screening, vision screening, and now they're moving into screening that's consistent with SAMHSA's Ready, Set, Go review, which is a different screening mechanism. It's not a therapeutic intervention. It's really just a broad mental health screening approach. So when the board comes back to the June revised recommendations, we will have the option for the board to uh, additionally fund that program so that we have dual programs that do slightly different things, but both are focused on evaluating kids. The Healthy Kids program we've had contracts with and we still have a contract with as of now through behavioral health and through public health because they don't focus exclusively on either one of those fields. So um, it's hard to fit it into the county bureaucratic organization, but it's an important service. So what we'll be recommending in the, Jan in the June revision is additional funding for um, that program that will come out of another pot. Thank you. I, I, um, let me just say there are two um, issues that I just want to lift up and happy to have um, Dr. Smith, you or, or the staff either respond or just give feedback at an appropriate time. And, and here's what it is. One of the points that you made with us some time ago was that as we thought about our health and hospital system, that one of the things we needed to be thinking about was making sure that, um, that we were getting um, families into our primary care facilities and into our clinics and, and connected to our network. And I know that's not our only job, but when I look at this program, I see it as an opportunity both to flag a child that needs help and then to get that child connected directly into um, our system or the most appropriate system for that child. And what I'm concerned about is the structure of the program um, may not be designed in a way that allows us with the resources we're using to capture the most children who are in need. And I am also concerned about a written evaluation from, from a child. Is, that's how I understand the program. Am I right about that? Does a child fill out the survey? Yes, the student will complete the validated standardized tool. Yeah, and but what my concern there is that we also know that high need um, children have a harder time with comprehension, and so it 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 feels to me like um, I mean what I'm what I'm going to be very interested in is an assessment of access. So I'd, I'd be interested in the outcomes of the pilot, you know, and and 
what we learn about making sure that children have the opportunity um, to both, you know, take the survey, knowing what children we miss, you know, who's not taking the survey, and then understanding how reading comprehension impacts that survey. And especially because, you know, one thing about a lot of these tools is that they're, they were designed in areas that are not quite as complicated and diverse is where we live. I mean, now I know you're, we're gonna, you guys always do a phenomenal job of trying to break down those barriers, but those are the concerns that I have that I would love when, the, when we're looking at the evaluation that we understand that. And then the last thing is, whether it's this program or the Healthier Kids Foundation, the sustainability of these programs is critical. And so again, part of my thinking about when it makes sense for us to invest is not only because we want the child to be healthy, but that we built in a, a virtuous loop of sustainability. And, and that's what I'm also concerned about with the approach. Um, the other kind of exciting thing, I think, is that the fact that you have so many other providers that are gonna be able to give you input. I hope that when we do the evaluation, we're talking to those providers about what they've, um, what they've learned. And then one last issue, and that's under what circumstances are we using um, social workers or other therapists or other um, work classifications that are difficult to access. Because I feel like we have such a shortage of social workers that when I looked at this, I thought, oh goodness, like are we gonna be slow in some areas because we just don't have that, that particular person that we can hire. I know that's a lot. If you wanna respond, go ahead. That, I know that's a lot of information. Thank you for your comments, Supervisor Chavez. Um, the screening that's had taken place in um, one of the school districts as a part of our pilot was conducted um, as a pilot and will be utilized by paraprofessionals. So the non-clinical staff, the non Are the ones sit, And do they sit with the children and fill them out with them? They would be pulling the students out, sitting with them, and monitoring the, um, the screening process. We'll utilize the clinicians, the master's level clinicians, to provide additional screening and assessment and provide the therapeutic services if there is identified needs there. But primarily with the recent pilot that we had, a lot of the um, majority of the students received a follow up from the um, provider and the parents had requested more of the parenting workshops and parenting services. Um, and then what we looked at also was that the uh, students who um, needed kind of that one-on-one -on -one support to understand the comprehension or the questions that were related to the, the screen tool, they, were, they received that one-on-one -on -one support from the um, paraprofessional. So how many, how many uh, there's no numbers in here, which is the other thing I would just beg you, like how many people, how many schools, what was the rate of response? And so I'm curious, do you, do you know that? Yes, so the, um, we just completed the first screening process, uh, pilot. So there was um, in one school, and it had three third grade classes, and we selected third grade because there was um, a study that showed that we are needing to screen early Earlier, for anxiety, yeah. um, starting at eight years old and older. And so the third graders um, were three classrooms. There was a total of 69 third graders. Um, at the school district's discretion, they did do a consent form, so 40, six students did um, participate in the screening where the others did not, but they did receive, all students received a skill streaming curriculum. So during the classroom after the screening, all students received by the paraprofessionals skill streaming building of skills, and they received that for four to six weeks after the screening. So this, out of the 46 students that did screen, 16 of them screened with a significant clinical score. All 16 families were connected uh, or contacted by the next day. 10 out of the 16 accepted services related, and majority of them were related to parenting workshops, such as their interest in the triple P level two, which was parenting seminars. And then one student is being um, further screened and assessed um, to determine the level of care. And that one student is being screened by the um, clinician and is being um, and the parent is involved with the screening process and assessment. That's very helpful. And Catherine, what, one thing that would be great to know is um, if, if we could, if we could take a sample of three classes that are, that are already being done by healthier kids. Here's really what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the number of children that, you know, that respond and the number, yeah, and then it's great news about connecting them to services. That's a, because you said 100, essentially 100% of everybody who needed a service got it. 
they were all students received. Um, no, but what I mean is for children you thought were at risk, oh, yeah. every single one of them got connected to it's and services. followed up with a service. Yes. And that, that number is the one that I'm looking for. Like I, I want to understand when we see a kid that's in need that they get connected to the service and then what that follow-up is. Because one of the reasons I was so excited, honestly, about Healthier Kids was the aggressive nature, whether it's dental, mental health, whatever, that they, they have somebody who's an advocate that gets right in there. It's part of the reason that the Child Advocacy Center is so interesting to me because we're advocating right away with the parent, with the family, and not having that gap. Yeah. Um, and so that's really helpful. Thank you. And the PEI um, team is the same team that provides both the screening, the psychoeducation to parents, the actual skill streaming, and then the therapy. Yeah, that's that's really, and I appreciated the report too. I, this clarifies some of what I read because I, I didn't digest it the way you just explained it. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor uh, Chavez, I just wanted to add something else here because the, the really exciting part about what we're doing with this program is really the approach that we're taking, utilizing the family partner, the family specialist, the clinician, and then the complete wrap of the family. So it's not only the student who is being screened for behavioral health issues, but it's also the participation in the curriculum that um, Catherine just alluded to, the skill streaming, they're getting a full array of skill building in the classroom and then the offer of the services to the parents and the, the mental health awareness services that we're providing to them as well. Mm -hmm. So that's what sets this approach What's apart different, from yeah. Healthier Kids Foundation. Both are valuable, uh, but we feel like this one really fits so well into our PI program because it's the entire continuum of the services um, from screening to treatment if needed. Well, and I, I think that is part of Healthier Kids as well. So I, I don't want to, I, I think the difference is that th there's an, an interim step that you have as well. But let me, let me just add, so I'm really glad, Zelika, you just explained that too, because just let me add one other point that's so important about what you just said, is that I think we also have to find a mechanism that the opt-out number is not as high as this one. So working with schools that are interested in creating opt-in for, you know, opting out instead of the opt-in, um, I think that is really, really, really important, and I want to better understand how we get there. And I, I totally agree. Like, the thing that's most exciting to me about this program is the age. Um, that all said, you know, that we want to get as close to that 100% as we can because the other problem we have is that we, we don't know who we missed. Right. But yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. Supervisor Arenas. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering what, what are the schools that, um, that you're connecting with? I know that the target is at risk, vulnerable students. Um, but what are those school districts that you're targeting? Um, are you, is the question related to the screenings that, that's going to be the, provided? Yes. Uh, so thank you for the question, Supervisor Reyes. Um For now, we are looking at all of the school sites and school districts that have PEI, the program. And as we expand the PEI program, we will be able to add additional um, screening at screening at those school sites and school districts. So right now, we are at 16 of the 32 school districts. Um, that we have PEI at, and we have also um, some other services in some of those school districts if needed. Um, do you have any plans to target, um, I, I, I've mentioned this before, there is a lot of school districts that have a number of services already on site. Um, my daughter went because I wanted to have a dual immersion, and at that time, Franklin McKinley School District was the only one that was offering uh, for new students, um, and this was during the pandemic. Um, and so uh, we registered with, with Franklin McKinley School District. Now, my daughter went through some issues but of being isolated, just like a lot of other kids. And there were services that were rendered that were just offered because the teacher noticed a difference in her attitude, um, and uh, it, which was really wonderful. Now that we moved back to Evergreen School District, none of those programs services exist for Evergreen School District. Even though there is a significant number of um, Title I schools 
in that district. And I'm concerned that children like, maybe not necessarily my child, like I said, I could pursue therapy um, out of pocket or through insurance, but there's a lot of people in the middle and there's school districts in the middle. How are we capturing that population? That's a great question. Um, with our PEI program, and we do have some services at Evergreen, which is primarily for the Medi-Cal beneficiaries and looking at wanting to expand the PI program. The PI program has the most flexible funding utilizing MHSA dollars. And so there is um, services that can be provided to all students regardless of their health plan. So anything related to screening, behavior supports, and even early intervention can be provided. Some therapy can be provided to all students regardless of their health plan. And then based on the need, if they're needing additional or more intense services, the family partner or the behavior specialist or the clinician from the PI team can help support with linkage to the appropriate level of care, whether it's their managed care plan or specialty mental health with the behavioral health services department. And what are the schools um, off the top of your head? Do you know of the schools in Evergreen School District? This, this is news to me. There's uh, four schools that mm -hmm. are receiving schooling services behavioral health, which is our outpatient oh, this, program. Okay, the schooling services. Yes. Okay, and then um, with the plans to have the PI program also at that school district. Sorry, you know what? I forgot that this is linked back to the schooling services. Um, thank you for making that connection. Um, great. I love that this is this is uh, um, so comprehensive, and an offering a variety of ways of families to engage and for the student to engage just as well. I mean, I think that there's some some issues with having a student answer themselves an assessment um, because because of comprehension issue, issues, like uh, Supervisor Travis was saying. But uh, there's also issues with having somebody else conduct that assessment and then um, not answering completely completely honest, right? Um, and, and wanting to, to maybe view yourself in a more favorable light. Um, and so I, I love that there's, there's a couple of ways to, to approach this, either through the parent, maybe the parent's concerns or, or potentially the the teacher that can that knows those students, right? Um, I really like this, and I wonder if there's an opportunity really to marry some of these um, these screenings that are happening, like uh, with our uh, Healthier Kids uh, Foundation. And I know um, pers personally from working with with First Five for ten years how involved a screening program can be. It, it, and the, the amount of um, bureaucracy that a parent has to, um, the, just the hoops that they have to jump through to get services. And it's one of the main reasons, it's the, 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 the main reason that I actually got into this business is because my child just, wouldn't my child wasn't being uh, provided the services that he needed, even though I knew what to say, I knew the letter to write, I knew who to um, send it to, and yet I still he still wasn't getting those services. So I know personally, and I know um, uh, programmatically how much it involves. And so for me, I feel like there's an opportunity to maybe bring these two things together. Now I know Healthier Kids does um, you know, dental and, and um, eye and a, a couple of other uh, screenings, but I wonder if there's some value to having somebody just do a bit of a red flag and then having uh, a more comprehensive program like um, uh, the PEI team come in to actually do some of, some of the long-term work not only in the classroom, but with, with the students. Is there any opportunity to bring these two things together? Thank you so much for the question. Um, the, currently, the Healthier Kids Foundation does screen at school sites and school mm -hmm. districts where we do have PEI. And so following the screening and follow the parent advocacy work that they do, they are connected to the SLS coordinator, um, 
to refer the student to services. So they have been utilizing or referring to the schooling services programs, including the prevention and early intervention program following the screening. What this, the PI program, what it in entails is that the PI provider is doing it from start to finish. Um, and again, with um, although they may not have Cons there may not have been parent consent for the screening in the very beginning. They're still receiving skill streaming curriculum, so they could be also identified during the skill streaming role playing activities. The teacher may provide some feedback and check in with the parent. So they're still receiving some intervention with PEI. And then we still have opportunities to continuously engage the family and the student to services through the skill streaming curriculum and also through skills groups afterwards or again with the parenting workshops like Triple P. Got it. Okay, so it sounds like it's working independently of each other, even though uh, Healthier Kids does refer into um, the SSL um, program. I just, I would love to see an opportunity for us to um, create efficiency with some of the screenings that are happening already. Um, I know the city of San Jose, we funded um, Healthier Kids for 500,000 last year. I know they haven't spent the whole amount, and I know that you know they could be funded even more uh, um, than that, and still not finish all of you know. There's just a little bit of of, of work that um, gets focused on. Um, I just would love to see how we can take this to scale. What is your plans to actually grow the the PEI model? Um, as part of our MHSA three-year plan, we have um, plans for um, continued funding um, in FY24 and working with the county contracted providers to look at expanding, redesigning um, some of the programmatics pieces of the PI program. Again, also expanding schooling services, behavioral health for the Medi-Cal beneficiaries. Got it. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Lee. <clears throat> thank you. Just a very quick comment. I just want to say uh, thank you uh, for the good work. I'm truly excited and uh, grateful how 180K, you know, MHSA funding to the first 455th grade students. This pilot program has worked so well with the family that has proven to be such a success that we're now doing it again and expanding it to the other 18, uh, the 16 school districts. Uh, clearly, early screening so our kids' mental health from third grade and up, and in language is exactly what we need for early intervention to provide the clinical services early on and prevent prevention support. So just want to say thank you for all the great work of making it happen. As you can see, I am using your bottle. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. Do we have public commenters waiting to speak on this item? We have one speaker in queue. And no one in the no one in chambers. That is correct. All right. I'll offer a reminder notice to anyone on Zoom who wishes to speak on item 16. Now is the time to raise your virtual hand. Uh, I can't see the list, but I suspect I know who that first speaker is going to be. Um, let's give a second to see if anyone else joins, and if not, we'll give our speaker two minutes. Looks like that is what we've got. So our speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. <laughs> uh, Paul Soto for the horse street. Good one, good one, Supervisor Albert. Will you pause his time for a moment? I really should not be so casual on public access. Paul, I'm, I'm very sorry. I actually was, was thinking it would be <laughs> Kathleen. Funny. That was cool. My apologies, sir, and please uh, start your time again. Nah, that was cool, man. Sometimes you got to have some levity here. I'll joke at you, too. Um, so Paul Soto from the Horseshoe, the, the prison system, the mortgage companies, and the automobile companies, because a, a car and a and a home are the major purchases that a prison guard will make once he becomes a prison guard. They were monetizing the poverty inside the barrios and all the aces, and they were using aces. They didn't call it that back then, but that, that's basically what it is. They were using that as the metric, and they were monetizing that because they knew and understood that children that were experiencing mental health conditions and it, within that age group, 
they were scientifically able to predict how many beds that they were going to need within the prison systems. So this is the monetization of the neglect and the and the generational poverty that has occurred in these barrios, and they were monetizing it. I mean, that is just. I mean, when you really sit back and think about it, about how 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 insidious, how not insidious, but uh, how like uh, like just evil to plot on children, the politicians help them. It's when the, the, during the um, Say No on Drugs campaign, you had Duke Mason, then you had Pete Wilson. So what we're doing, we're doing the work of kind of like we, uh, kind of orienting ourselves, but I would caution we have to see that we're experiencing something that is a part of a larger system that is institutionalized and systemic racism. And we, we, we have to just talk about and be honest about that because to do, we're really to treat the problem all we're doing is working. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. That was to receive report. There is no motion, so we don't need to vote. Our final item of the evening is item 17, collaboration with CHAC, C-H-A-C, for mental health services. Madam President. Thank you all. This was a result of a referral from Supervisor Lee and uh, myself, and I'm going to try something a little unorthodox here at uh, 10 minutes to 8. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Move approval. Second. Do we have public speakers on this item? We do not have public speakers. Oh, I apologize. We have one hand was just raised, and I am getting... Um, and while that speaker comes forward, I might mention in passing, we have two dozen letters of support from a wide range of organizations, agencies, cities, school districts, and individuals. Thank you. <clears throat> I apologize, man. presence oh. of. them between us and the end of the meeting, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Smidian. I'm Ann Ayersman. I'm the Interim Executive Director of CHAC, um, and I want to thank Supervisor Lee and Supervisor Smidian for this referral and the commitment of everyone who's in this room still um, to behavioral health. When I put in my uh, card, I didn't really realize and process that I was going to get a seven-hour refresher class on all the good work that Santa Clara County does around behavioral health. So real quickly, CHAC was founded in 1973. We're up on the peninsula serving Mountain View, Los Altos, Los Altos Hills. First five resource centers from Mountain View all the way down into West San Jose. We do a lot of great partnerships with schools, connect in with school link services, the uh, wellness initiative of Santa Clara County Office of Education, and we run an in-house clinic. So that complete support for children, families, adults, seniors, uh, we've been providing it for 50 years. Um, we approached the supervisors once I got on board as the interim executive director and realized that during the pandemic, we had been focused on staying, um, staying open and had not stayed focused on our future. So um, finding our pathways to sustainability has been my focus over the last three months. And I welcome the county to be our partner in looking at solutions, as well as other mental health providers um, in our region. Um, I'll close with the number one song in 1973 was Tie a Yellow Ribbon Around the Old Oak Tree. And if I was, <laughs> I had to be a little bit corny. Um, and if I was more clever, I would have new lyrics around a green ribbon for Mental Health Awareness Month. But thank you all so much for your support. And vote yes. Thank you. Madam President, uh, just to, uh, wrap that uh, up in a package for a final vote here. Um, I, I do need to convey my thanks to uh, both uh, our County Council, James Supervisor Williams. Supervisor Samidian, we have more speakers on, ah, on Zoom. Would you me. like to hear them first? Yes, absolutely. My, right. my apologies. I thought we had just the one. And, and my apologies for getting mixed up. I think the late hour is getting to me. <laughs> uh, we have three speakers in Zoom. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, Let's remind anyone who is on Zoom who is intending to speak on this last item, please raise your virtual hand right now. When the first speaker begins speaking, we will close the queue. 
All right, our first speaker is Aiden Miller. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. Good evening, uh, President Ellenberg, County Supervisors, County Staff. My name is Dean Miller. I serve as the CEO of the Los Altos Mountain View Community Foundation, a found, uh, funder of CHAC in the community. I speak tonight in support of approving the referral um, to report to the board and supervisors in June on options to collaborate with CHAC. Losing CHAC would be detrimental to our community because it provides the means to overcome a fundamental barrier to receiving mental health and wellness support, namely access. Um, as Anne mentioned, since 1973, CHAC has believed in mental wellness as the foundation for a healthy, fulfilled life and has been determined to provide comprehensive services to individuals and families of all backgrounds. No one is turned away from CHAC because of an inability to pay. Wherever you turn in Mountain View, Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, the communities that the foundation supports, and even to Sunnyvale and Cupertino, CHAC is there to provide support. Um, we see their support in our schools, helping our K-12 students. We see their support of families with the family resource centers, providing assistance to parents and caregivers um, who care for their children. Um, CHAC provides emerging uh, training to emerging mental health practitioners and it provides culturally sensitive services in 11 languages, which uh, especially robust programs are available in Spanish to the Latino community locally. We are, as a foundation, very cognizant of the benefit of having CHAC and we support continuing and supporting its services locally. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Blair Beekman. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, I'm about to get on a trolley. My voice is a little strange sounding. Uh, what I was going to say, Mr. Diver, what I was going to say for this item is that uh, I, from the first report, from the first public comment, uh, that was very helpful and interesting. Uh, I, I, I had an interesting session in, with Santa, San Diego uh, City Council working on budget issues at this time and bringing up concepts of uh, how to talk about uh, the future of the unhoused and, and, and the concept of housing is a, there, there, there's, a, there's a middle housing that people who don't get arrested or forced into uh, services, uh, but yet who have serious pretty serious mental health condition issues. And uh, how, how do those people get housing in the future? How do, how do we bring housing to them? How do they want to receive housing? And so it was a very informative meeting of yourselves today and how you talked about issues. It was really helpful to myself and uh, I really appreciated it, thank you. And uh, I just wanted to think about uh, just mental health and uh, housing and, 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 the, and the flexibility in how to, uh, those sort of questions were asked today, interestingly. So I thank you for that. As always, uh, you're talking about good communication between yourselves. You're learning how to do that better. Um, what, uh, uh, the concept of, of being sure to talk to the person, the unhoused person themselves, uh, I, I think that's a real important point on my own end. If you guys learn to do that also and, and, and include them in all this dialogue, you're learning how to address our future of uh, housing issues. Uh, that's, that helps a lot. And uh, good luck how to do that, to really address the person themselves. Uh, simple things, just reminding ourselves of these good things. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, uh, with, I have a lot of issues with that side of town, that side of our county, because they, they have been the beneficiaries a lot of many of the racist policies that created our county. That says nothing to anybody here, but it's a fact. And so when we're talking about mental health, that is, that there's no, it's no issue with race there. There's no issue with racism or oppression with that. Because the person that is experiencing depression in Los Altos 
is in the same kind of depression that somebody is in a tent. So there's there's a kind of a there's a kind of an equilibrium that is maintained there in terms of the way that people suffer. It's just as easy to suffer in a mansion in Palo Alto as it is in a tent. But what does need to be realized is that when we're talking about racial equity with respect to issues, and what Dr. Cheryl Cody said was absolutely true, that race is a public health issue. We have to find some legally binding metric in order to determine how we allocate our resources. The example is this, if there's $100,000 and there's, okay, five districts, okay, thousand a piece, when you're using a, a, a racial equity metric, that would mean that because certain areas have more resources than others, that of that 20,000, that particular side of town wouldn't get it. Why? Because they do have more resources than the other parts of the city or the other parts of the county. And so that's why a legally binding metric for racial equity is so important, is so that we determine how do we allocate these resources and determine the, the most benefit that we'll get. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Let's take a vote, please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Elbert? Yes passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Supervisor Simidian, would you like the closing word? Thank you. I will take yes for an answer, colleagues. Um, that being said, because this is a direction to come back uh, at our June 13 meeting, I do want to just <clears throat> tee it up a little so folks know a little bit more about what might uh, be ahead of us. Um, fairly quietly, actually, some time ago, our North County Mayfield Health Clinics, which Supervisor Lee is also aware of because they, they have a presence in Sunnyvale, um, was floundering. And they were floundering quite candidly because while they had given magnificent service to the community over decades, they hadn't been able to transform their service model in a way that made them viable given 21st century funding and regulatory environments. Um, Dr. Smith, I owe you uh, and the rest of your team a thank you for uh, provide, uh, serving as the Sherpa, for lack of a better word, to help guide people to a better place, which ultimately, colleagues, is the reason that Ravenswood stepped in, absorbed May May Mayfield and, uh, Mayf excuse me, and um, uh, we ended up with uh, a sign that has two names on it, but most most importantly, a system that still works. Um, in this case, uh, when it became increasingly apparent that after 50 years of magnificent service, uh, CHAC, formerly the Community Health Awareness Council, that CHAC was um, not evolving rapidly enough to survive in this 21st century environment, uh, I reached out to Dr. Smith uh, and to Mr. Williams. Thank you to them both. We've had a couple of really, I think, instructive meetings. Some of the thinking from that is in the memo. Um, Supervisor Lee's been engaged because of the common interest in uh, his district as well as mine. And maybe it's about finding a way for Jack to be Medi-Cal eligible, because right now they're doing a lot of good work that's uncompensated or unreimbursed. Maybe it's about FQHC status, because as we heard earlier from Dr. Smith, that's where the outpatient economics really uh, kick in. Maybe it's about being part of the JPA, maybe it's not. Um, but the reason there's no dollar amount on this item, even though we're in a budget hearing, is because we don't know what the answer to all those maybes might be. But uh, I'm asking Dr. Smith and his team to come back in the budget process with options for our board's consideration uh, that make sure that CHAC continues to be there for the half dozen communities it has served so well for so long. And with that, I will say thank you again for your aye vote and um, stop talking before anybody wants to change their vote.
Thank you very much. Thank you to our clerks, to the Creativ team, to all of the county staff, to members of the public who hung on with, with bated breath and great interest, to all of our administrative staff. Have a good evening, everyone. We'll be back here tomorrow at 1.30. <laughs>